Hello, everyone. I'm Luke. I'm with my buddy Raphael. How you doing, Raph? Hi, guys. Hi, Luke. And we are going to talk about a book and its ideas. The book is called <laughs> Romance Did Not Begin in Rome, or in Spanish, No Venimos de Latin. No and it is written by Carmen, uh, Carmen, excuse me, Jimenez Huertas. And her notions are that the Romance languages don't come from Latin. Now, Raph and I, just to make sure everybody knows, we, we don't feel that way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean we don't feel that way? Well, I think the thumbnail kind of um, may have, <laughs> you know, clickbaitishly um, made people think that uh, we uh, actually intended that to be our interpretation. But no, we can accept that when people hear something like that, they might think of this. Um, <laughs> and, uh, because it's just it seems so ridiculous could it possibly be true and um i've uh i've also because we're not looking to attack um senora carmen jimenez huertas at all um because uh she's clearly very sincere about her opinions i i mean having you know read some of this book raft do you think that she means it absolutely yeah okay yeah i agree i think she really does too um, that being the case, since she's taking the idea seriously, we will as well. Um, kind of. Kind of. Uh, it's just, it's a little <laughs> bit like, um, kind of like, not quite as bad perhaps as a flat earther idea. It's just so, it's just a lot, it's similar because there's a lot of evidence which goes against it, but okay, let's take the idea seriously. Let's go through them right. logically. Let's go through. I mean, it's, it's very much the kind of thing that, um, so linguists would never pay attention to this. Um, uh, and the reason they would never pay attention to this is not because linguistics is is some kind of uh, sort of elitist uh, orthodoxy that refuses to acknowledge anything that's different from from what uh, its adherents believe in, um, which is sort of, so, so that's really the biggest thing that I take issue with on a personal level. Um, in terms of what Carme is saying, is this notion that uh, linguists just are blind and refuse to see outside of the orthodoxy, which is nonsense. If yeah. you're sort of at all in the field, it's incredibly polemic in terms of people with drastically different views of all sorts of wide ranging topics. Um, mm -hmm. You know, people believe linguists, academic linguists, believe fundamentally different things and are constantly arguing with each other about them. Yeah. Um, but, but this sort of fails to understand concepts that are so fundamental that it would just never even enter into the sphere of like what linguists tend to talk about. But um, to someone who's not sort of familiar with the field, you know, it can be sort of, you can encounter it and be like, well, is, is there any merit to this? Like, why isn't anyone addressing it? So I think it's sort of valuable then to actually seriously address uh, the ideas. Yeah. Right. I think it can start to incite a sense of uh, conspiracy. Oh, they're not talking about this, so it must be true, which is the same thing that flat earthers can deal with. And we don't, right. I don't talk, <laughs> for example, I don't talk about the curvature of the earth because I experience it as a pilot. There's a navigational system called VOR, um, uh, which is uh, VHF omnidirectional um, radio. And basically you can receive these navigational beacons. You can see where they are if you fly higher. So the curvature of the earth doesn't block the signal. So you go farther away from them, higher to receive them. And it's like that you just experience these things on a daily basis. Um, if you, you know, if you're a pilot or if you deal with that kind of thing or with, um, I don't know, anything after an article. Um, and whereas with language, people don't interact with languages in the way that you and I do on a regular basis with ancient languages, with modern languages, especially Latin and the Romance languages like you and I adore. Oh, I, um, pedimos a perdón. Porque no hablamos uh, en español, pero uh, si quieren ustedes um, preguntar en, en español, podemos uh, leer. Y sí, podéis, podéis preguntar en español. Los dos hablamos español bastante bien, entonces sí, sí. no hay problema. Oh, fantastic. Um, and, and I can read portugués, so if you uh, want to write in that too. And um, Shubisk, Limburumina. Uh, so, and of course, we both speak Italian, but I think most people know that about us. <laughs> uh, oh, French. You don't like French. I do. <laughs> but yeah, I, have no problem with French. I don't speak French, but... Uh... <laughs> 
Yes, we, we adore uh, fans. French speakers. French speakers usually complain about not being invited to the party um, when it comes to discussions of Latin. But they should have kept trust me, French speakers. This is not the party you want to be invited to. You you want to be invited to all the other parties. But <laughs> it's okay to be left out of this one. <laughs> you raison, mon ami. You're absolutely mm -hmm. right. Um, so as far as dealing with this, um, the like again, we're not looking to uh, attack this person. We seek to look at the ideas in detail, which we will take as seriously as we can. Um, so uh, how, what do you think of uh, the, we want to read the quote by Mahatma Gandhi in the foreword for us? Oh, I've, I've got to read it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. First, they ignore you. Then they laugh at you. Then they fight you. And then you win. Mahatma Gandhi. That's a good yeah. quote. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good. It's uh, <laughs> and then um, she begins saying, and one of the, there's three or four forwards to this, as I recall, to the various editions. And the first mm -hmm. one she says, um, "Dear readers of the open wide world, do you remember how you felt when you found out you were an adopted child?" <laughs> I assume most of you don't, for a simple reason: you know who your parents are, and that is the truth. Truth be told, I don't remember either. For in a literal sense, I am not an adopted child. In a literal sense, those of us who have nothing of this kind to remember are lucky. Wow, that made less sense aloud than it did when I read it silently. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, it's it's a little um, it, the uh, the forward here. Actually, it's not written by uh, Carmen Jimenez Huertas, but by um, an Australian, Gandhi. Christina Breskin. Mm. No, or at least right. she was in Melbourne when she wrote it in in twenty seventeen. Um, right. So the something else I think is important to acknowledge the foreword, and I think another recommendation um, somewhere in the back, and of course the author. Um, this this is a female writer, and other female male writers too. So um, you and I talked about this. Like this, it feels kind of like lousy. A couple of guys who are critiquing, um, you know, a, a, a woman who wants to express some ideas in the in this field, and I I do feel the the inherent political ramification of that and that's not not a good thing hmm. so we definitely uh acknowledge that like we're not we're really not trying to make make fun of um this person just uh critique the ideas mm -hmm. um but uh then there's a, a note of the first edition which follows and this this lovely quote from Catullus, which is uh oh dietamo quarid faciam fortasse requiris nescio sed fieri sentio ex et ex crucior translated here in english i hate and i love why do i do this perhaps you ask i do not know but i feel it happened and i am tortured i like how gaius is spelled though did you notice that <laughs> spelled oh wow the, i didn't uh, notice that i'll demonstrate Gai uh, gaius spelled the um uh, with a Y, is that? I guess that must be how it's spelled in Spanish, right? No, isn't it uh, Gaius? It, it's trisyllabic in Latin. It's Gai, G -A -I -U -S. Gaius. Yeah, but it's an U, right? Like a Greek. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, <laughs> Gaius. <laughs> ah, so you've, you've been silly. Very good. Uh, <laughs> um, so the the there's are some. I've noticed something here too, right in the second paragraph. There, the Romance languages, the result of a degeneration of Latin. So there's this kind of, um, already there, it's a very old idea that somehow the Romance languages are degenerate or corrupted or um, not mm. as good as, I mean, that's a really old idea. That's like 700 year old idea. Right. Um, well, and this is, this is precisely indicative of what I was talking about before um, in terms of just sort of a fundamental lack of um, familiarity with like basic notions that you become familiar with mm -hmm. um, in the field. So one of them is is this notion that language evolution is is some kind of de degeneration, right? That uh, tell us about that because a lot uh, of people believe that, especially not especially right. classes, but a lot of people wherever they are have this notion that uh, languages are degenerated or some somehow. Right. So so. Um, the the i guess maybe we should talk about the origins of of this so so the origins of this notion stem from sort of 
the placing on a pedestal of certain languages, um, mostly European classical languages, which were all related to each other, right? So Latin and, and Greek are um, both Indo-European, very conservative Indo-European languages. And they have a lot of shared features. Um, and one of those shared features is um, a very synthetic grammar. So lots of inflection. So lots of uh, noun and verb endings that communicate meaning. Um, and so because these languages have been sort of historically held up as, as the pinnacle of linguistic expression for centuries in Europe, and it's it's been observed that those particular features of the grammar, that synthetic grammar, in the living descendants of those languages that are spoken throughout Europe, um, that morphology, the sort of endings on all the nouns and, and verbs, has tended to simplify. Um, there's sort of this this common notion that uh, that languages universally degenerate over time because there's this notion that. Um, more analytic languages like English, which have less inflection, are somehow inferior, um, and languages with more inflection are superior. And of course, this notion doesn't exist in places like China, where the classical language of thousands of years has almost no inflection, right? So it's an entirely, um, uh, it, it's a notion that's born out of a very particular social context. And it's complete nonsense, right? Because um, inflection is just one way of communicating information. Mm. Um, and when one way of communicating information disappears from a language, then another way of communicating that same information appears, right? right. So uh, in the case of English, we use word order to communicate a lot of the same information that, uh, that endings communicate in a language like Latin. Mm. Exactly. Um, right. And then the other thing is that those endings can develop in a language like English uh, that's more analytic. Right, so languages, it's not exactly a, a perfect cycle, but languages can become less analytic over time. They can become uh, more analytic over time by gaining morphology or losing morphology. Mm. And um, yeah, there, there's really no, uh, there's no, no serious linguist who would ever believe in the notion that, uh, that languages have somehow degenerated or gotten worse over time. Yeah, I know it's still reasonably common in the classics because of, again, adoring Latin like, you know, I do. I'm super into Latin and the poetry and the things it can do, um, especially the poetry for all kinds of reasons like I usually talk about. Um, Latin happens to be that way because it's just in that period of a normal evolution that it ends up being so fantastic. Mm. And of course, uh, Ciao Davide, he uh, asked the very question. Yeah, that Davide. Excellent timing. <laughs> looks like it was you, you pre uh, a little precog there. That was good. Precognition right. on that one. Um, <laughs> got another uh, good question, which I think we can answer quickly. Where do you think mm -hmm. the Proto-Indo-European homeland is? Mm. Uh, probably the Central Asian steppe. Um, that seems like the most likely answer at the moment, sort of north of the Caucasus, uh, partially in Asia, partially in Europe. Yeah, that seems like the best, uh, the best bet at the moment. Which is an answer mostly... Um, um, I think derived from comparative linguistic uh, evidence, although in the archaeological and genetic evidence going. I saw um, uh, the wonderful uh, Jackson Crawford talking with uh, Proto-Indo-European specialists mm -hmm. about that, and they're trying to, you know, work together archaeologically. But yeah, somewhere in that in that region of the Caucasus, uh, which right. is interesting because another notion that's in this book, which we'll talk about, is um, the idea that languages have to be learned from a kind of genetic ancestry, not because you know it's in your genes or something to speak a language, but because you're descended from a family that speaks that way. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in um, one of her uh, interviews, uh, the author expressed this point as if it's a, just a known fact that you learn a language from the mother. Mm. Uh, what, what do you have to say to that, that you learn your language from your mother or- Yeah. Um... So that's just not what the research says. <laughs> uh, what what the research says um, is that you learn your you learn language from your peers, right? So anyone who's ever tried to raise a bilingual child uh, will probably be familiar with this problem, which is that um, you know you have a you have a kid and you're raising them, and for the first few years of their life, they're acquiring language from you, and then the moment they go to school. Um, if the language of the school is different from the language you speak at home, you might run into the problem of, of they start to actually lose the language you're speaking at home unless you really take measures to reinforce it. 
Um, and when you don't do that, you end up with a lot of people who have a very strong grasp of the language that they acquire in school from their peers, um, and maybe only a passive grasp of the language that's spoken at home by their parents. Um, and you can also observe this phenomenon even in, in when we're not talking about a bilingual family. So um, when uh, a child is acquiring their first language, even if it's the same language that their parents speak, their peers don't speak the same way that their parents do, right? Their peers will have all of these, these innovations, you know, new phrases, maybe even new grammatical structures that have arisen recently. Yeah, we had, I um, found, um, comparing my, um, my, my sister and I and how we say certain words and um, both of our parents, for example, the um, three-way contrast between um, Mary, um, Mary and Mary, which I don't have right. anyway. I can do it out of practice, but my dad has all three, my mother only has a two-way split and my sister and I have neither. Right. Or in my case, I have uh, the cot cot merger, C A U G H T C O T, which and I'm not smiling at loves to hate um, but neither of my parents no, it's, have this it's merger. It's very common. I know how common it is. Right. So so oh, there's these two uh, vowels in American when English. I San Diego. Mm -hmm. Oh, that drove me nuts. Hand me that pin. I'm like, what? I'm not wearing a pin. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but so you know, but there's these two good. vowels uh, in American English that have historically been separate phonemes. They're separate phonemes for both of my parents, but in my speech, they're merged, right? Right. Um, and that's because I naturally, without ever noticing, assimilated to the speech of my peers when I was a kid. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, we got a good uh, question here from Abnao. What arguments do you now is a lingua latina, latina, latina? Right. So uh, not, I guess we'll get to that, right? That's really, that's <laughs> well, not just Spanish, thing. yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, and not just Spanish, but in fact, we um, put Spanish up there because uh, the author is a native Catalan and Castilian speaker. Um, mm. So she's um, so I you know I kind of picked on on uh, on Spanish just to choose one, but really all she says all the Romance languages, and the reason is that it's impossible for the Romance languages to have changed so much from Latin. Is essentially that's her, basically her reasoning. Her reasoning so yeah. she believes that the Romance languages are related and that they descend from a common ancestor which was spoken during the classical period mm -hmm. but she believes that that common ancestor was not latin that there was a sort of proto-romance language spoken throughout the mediterranean but that there was no written attestation no mention of this language no direct evidence of it but that there was just intense diglossia even in the diglossia being a situation where um, you have a sort of high register language and a low register language. So, um, in Greece or in Arabic speaking countries, right? Examples of diglossia. Yeah, which is which basically, basically yeah. which is fantastic because, um, the one of uh, she has a, a number of uh, interviews. By the way, uh, obrigado, Abraão. Uh, very much appreciate the, the super chat. I didn't have to do that. Thanks. Um, the uh, one of the things she said actually in her interviews, um, which frankly they're difficult to watch because it's not tongue-in-cheek she is so serious about it so i respect that i also respect i also respect because i'm not in the linguistic field in any mm -hmm. kind of formal way um i do yeah. all this because i love it however at the same time if you read enough books you can actually just learn these things it, and it's <laughs> perfectly obvious it's also obvious too when you read um um, I call her Karame for the sake of simplicity. I don't mean to be informal, but uh, when I read uh, Karame's work, it, it just you can tell she just doesn't know Latin very well. She doesn't certainly mm -hmm. doesn't speak it like uh, you have practiced doing, like I do very frequently. She hasn't gotten to like the deep, you know, roots of the transformations in the language. Anyway, that all that said, like you just mentioned, one of the perfect quotes that she said, which I find entertaining, is she said, uh, "Las lenguas um, no cambian tan rápido." Por ejemplo, mm. el griego clásico, el griego moderno, se puede comprender. So he says, languages don't change that rapidly. For example, classical or ancient Greek and modern Greek um, have mutual intelligibility. They can be, they can you can understand one between the other. So no, uh, there's lots of fun videos which demonstrate that modern Greek speakers, even with you know a moderate to high level of education, if they're not really well read in ancient Greek, they can't understand it easily. They can see a lot of vocabulary in common, but one of the reasons and there's a great book, Horrocks, um, 
a book which is a 550 page <laughs> wonderful tome which is called uh, greek a history of um a language and its speakers fascinating and it demonstrates how the tradition in greece has been always to have this conservative version of the language um somewhat imposed by you know people in you know uh, in some kind of academic power normally such that the written language um called katarevusa the purified language as as it's called um was essentially very was in most ways more similar to ancient Greek than it was to any form of the Motiki, the Demotic or the um, common people's language that is only a few decades ago became an accepted version of the standard written form of Greek. So because of that, there's this generation, mm -hmm. even living, there's a living memory of writing essentially in a modernized form of ancient Greek instead of um, modern Greek, which allows, um, it gives Greeks um, today much more of a ready, like a, available connection to the depth of the ancient language, which gives an appearance that there is some kind of mutual intelligibility when there are really, if you line up all the differences, it's easily comparable to say Italian and Latin. Hmm. Maybe um, a bit more conservative overall, but, but yeah. and there's something similar, similar, similar order of, uh, yeah. Like the genitive yeah. plural, that's, that's part of like demotic of the Montiqui, but it was added like recently like a hundred years mm. ago like they didn't have don mm. as the as the gender plural they just, oh, really? yeah yeah i read that, mm. that that too recently that surprised me but mm. um, it's interesting how you can you know uh, and you're uh, i've always uh, taught me about how important it is to not be prescriptivist as um, a student of language because then you miss a lot of obvious things and i'm just so fascinated by how it's this weird and partially contrary thing where you have this constant forcible prescriptivized way of using language that um affects the um the common way that people are are speaking mm. there and the other part she was as you just said comparing uh, el arabe clásico el arabe moderno se puede comprender uh that you know but again that's because um modern arabic modern standard arabic fusha is um essentially classical arabic right well and it's it's nobody's native language right there are there, there is no region on the planet where someone speaks modern standard Arabic as a first language. Exactly. There are dozens and dozens of dialects, which, you know, are, are mutually intelligible to various degrees, but some of them are as different from one another as the Romance languages. And in fact, um, many of the differences between the modern Arabic dialects and classical Arabic are very similar to the differences between um, Latin and the Romance languages. Like for instance, the loss of case morphology. Mm -hmm. So the loss of case endings on on the nouns, yeah. um, which used to be a thing, uh, but is no longer a thing in, in modern vernacular Arabic. And so if you go to a village somewhere where people are not um, educated in modern standard Arabic, then it's unlikely that they're going to understand very well, you know, a verse of, uh, of the Quran, um, unless they're familiar with it, unless, uh, you know, because of course, through religion, they may have familiarity, but mm. yeah. Uh, it's a misguided comparison. Pulio Tour got asked. Uh, Luca, Catalaveni, Ceci, Ketonia Lenica, Ne, que, uh, or Ariel, Catalaveni, Ligo, 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 Ligo. I'm um, definitely better in ancient Greek, but uh, yeah, I love modern Greek as well. Um, so let's let's get into it. So we have the, the notes of the first edition, which I mean, it's just so many harsh uh, things. Let's go to chapter one. Um, Right. I'll, uh, well, well, so there's this uh, there's this bit about you know, Romance languages being a degeneration of Latin, mm -hmm. um, and it says, hence it is expected that they should resemble Latin as much as they do their sister tongues, since they would all have departed following different paths from the center of the original Latin grammar. Um, and this is another example of a, of something that sounds very intuitive. Um, but it's just complete nonsense. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, it doesn't do sound to intuitive to me. I mean, this is, well, fair this enough. is my reaction, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> well, you've, you've got your means at the ready, I see. I do. I learned um, the impact font, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Um, two languages stemming from a common ancestor should resemble that common ancestor, ancestor as much as they resemble one another? No. Um, and and there's sort of two dimensions in which this is just wrong. Um, so one is just at an observational level. If you like look across languages, 
Um, this is just obviously not true. There's so many examples of this obviously not being true. Um, so one example would be um, Swedish and Norwegian, right? So Swedish is a di is descended from old uh, East Norse, and Norwegian is descended from old West Norse. Um, meaning their common ancestor was, uh, you know, in a fairly early stage of Old Norse, not even the late Old Norse that we see in like the Icelandic sagas. Um, and yet, uh, modern Swedish and modern Danish are, or sorry, Norwegian, I'm talking about Norwegian, modern Swedish and modern Norwegian, and you can throw Danish in as well, They're all the same. are to a very high degree mutually intelligible, probably more so than even Spanish and, uh, and Portuguese. Um, and they're much, much further from uh, Old Norse. They've, they've together collectively lost many, 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 many features, um, both in terms of vocabulary and in terms of morphology. So the case system and the, the conjugation system of the verbs has all sort of largely collapsed much in the same way that it did in English. Um, so you only, you know, in Swedish, I believe you only have a genitive case, uh, just like English and the verbs don't even conjugate anymore. So in English, at least we have, you know, a difference between is, am, are, you know, et cetera, whereas that doesn't even exist in, in Swedish anymore. It's just are, got, got er, duer, it's beautiful. Right, <laughs> exactly. I is, you is, he is, we is, et cetera. Fantastic. As opposed to Icelandic, um, which preserves a lot of this stuff. Mm. So how conservative a language is to the parent language of a given period of time um, you can't just state a rule that, you know, it's necessarily these two related languages should be as similar to the parent language as they, as they are to each other. Right. Because languages, um, even as they separate, can continue to influence each other, especially if they're in pro close proximity. They can continue to share features. Um, and not only that, but completely unrelated languages can share features with each other. Um, like, um the um, Balkan languages, for example. The Balkan languages, yeah. So uh, yeah. a Sprachbund, Sprach, Sprach, you speak German, how do you pronounce that? Yes, I love, I love Sprach. <laughs> lovely um, Austro-Hungarian <laughs> empire term they put on the Balkans. Right. Yeah. So all of these, you know, Albanian, uh, Albanian, Romanian, and um, Bulgarian yeah. all have postponed articles, right? So all three of them have, have articles, so like the or a, well, really just the, actually it's a definite article mm -hmm. and you attach it to the end of the word, right? Yeah. This is the feature that all three languages have, but but they're distantly, you know, they're they're all Indo-European, but like Bulgarian is a Slavic language and Slavic languages don't usually have articles at all, right. but Bulgarian has articles and you stick it at the end of a noun, just like you do in Romanian and Albanian. Yeah, like, um, um, I don't know, do we have any Bulgarian speakers out there? I know, like Barbat is man, Barbatul, is uh, Romanian for the man, yeah, it's right. a positive, or limba, um, language limba, right. which is also cool because it's like Sardinian. It's so funny too, because in the book, how she talks about the the great similarities between say Romanian and uh, Galician and um, Galician, excuse me, and Portuguese, and says, but they had never had contact with each other. So how could that possibly have been? It's fascinating because she it's basically talks herself into the discovery of vulgar Latin. <laughs> um, and Angelo Nucci asks, Quando è stato scritto questo libro? Chiedo perché sembrano osservazioni abbastanza datate e biased. Yeah, these are, when was it written? 20... Pretty, pretty recently. 16, this one. The um, English version? Um, the, for the original Spanish title, and then the 2017 for the English translation. Right. Um, so yeah, these are, these, these, I thought, yeah, you would think these ideas, Angelo, would go out with like phrenology. Um, <laughs> Really, really old fashioned ideas that uh, no longer seem to apply, nevertheless. Um, nevertheless, anyway, yeah, that's uh, the very, yeah, very good point, man. That's mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and the other thing too, she said in one video I ended up looking at, uh, which is that people are critiquing my ideas, she said, because they haven't actually read the book, which is why, because this was my original idea was, all right, I'm gonna buy the book. I'm going to give it a fair swing. I'm going to actually, you know, look at it. Maybe there is something here and it could be really interesting and revelatory. But within the first few pages, you find things that are just like, we're not even into chapter one. And we've already had a great 30 minute discussion about the stuff that's not really correct. 
hmm. what you're presenting. So it's like, whoa. Um, so th that's why I, I couldn't bear making a proper constructed video about this. And I needed Raf's help to uh, to get through it all. So uh, I'm here for you, Luke. Thank you. Thank you my hmm. friend. Would you like to read some of chapter one? I would love to read some of chapter one. OK. Um, so uh, it is expected that they should resemble Latin as much as they do their sister tongues since they would have all departed following different paths from the center of the original Latin grammar. And yet that is not what we find. The opposite is true. Romance languages are too much like each other. Even those that seem to be far removed, such as Galician and Romanian, though this supposed degenerate, though through this supposed de degeneration have come to identical solutions. This is when we begin to ask ourselves whether traditional teachings provide an adequate explanation of the relationship between Romance languages and whether this relationship is really established by original, original reference to Latin. Um, yeah, so um, the, uh, well, uh, oh, sorry, are we, were we going to write, because this is still the note of the first comment on this, which is great. Were we, were we, were we, were we, were we supposed to, uh, that's great. The go ahead. chapter one? No, no, that, that, that's part of the, the rest of this note, which is the first edition, which is, um, yeah, I mean, I think it kind of speaks for itself, like we were just saying, it's like, no, um, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's not well, like, yeah. go ahead. I mean, maybe, maybe we should just briefly address the, the concept of vulgar Latin. I know you. Oh, that's a great idea. Also, by the way, mm. I just wanted to show, could you read this? Because you can actually read, pronounce it. La evolución diferente es literalmente imposible que el valencià vinga del musarab. Soc d'acord. Yeah, so, so um, Mosarabic was the um, Iberian uh, Romance language spoken in Andalusia. Um, under um, the rule of the Moors, right? Um, and it was quite distinct from uh, from Spanish and from other um, Iberian Romance languages, both in terms of some of its conservative features. Um, so it seems that, for instance, it had um, uh, it had pronunciations of uh, so what we would write as the letter C before I and E, like cento um, in Italian, like the word for a hundred which in Spanish is ciento, um, and uh, at that time would have been pronounced as something like uh, ciento in Old Spanish, um, but it was uh, it was more like Italian. It had a ch sound like Italian. Um, so yeah, it had a bunch of um, uh, conservative features that are distinct from other Iberian languages, and also a lot of uh, innovations that are totally distinct um, I, I believe this person is referring to because some some people in the comments were talking about uh, the notion that Valencian. Sorry, was I supposed to translate this? So, so this says uh, oh, we got it. Arabic has different uh, evolutions, literally like evolutionary features. Mm -hmm. It's literally impossible that Valencian could come from Arabic. And uh, most yeah, so Valencian is is widely considered to be a variety of Catalan, or depending on your perspective, maybe Catalan is a variety of Valencian, but they're the same language. Um, well, like, like I showed you this morning, Italian is a dialect of Sardinian. <laughs> right. There's a, a from, I think they're Sardinian. They're, 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 closer, they're closer than that, right? Like yeah. when I worked in, uh, when I worked in Barcelona, I knew a Valencian teacher who worked in a Catalan school and mm -hmm. they would speak Valencian with the Catalan students. And that was fine. Like they were allowed to, to do that. Mm. Um, yes, so so apparently there's this pseudoscientific theory that Valencian, people who want to pretend that Valencian and Catalan are different languages might say that Valencian comes from Mosarabic, which, yes, makes zero sense. It's, mm. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, the niente as this. Um, everybody knows that uh, <laughs> Catalan uh, is an extraterrestrial language. <laughs> Uh, great Catalan speakers, by uh, the way. Uh, <laughs> read it and understand it for the most part. And wrath. Si hola a todos los, los parlantes del catalán. Oh, that sounds so good. Oh, I love Catalan. Uh, <laughs> we're big fans of all the Romance languages, everyone. So I'm glad you're all here. And, and uh, les francophones aussi, j'ai vu. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. What? Uh, do you want to read the? Do you want to? Since I failed I, to read the first chapter, do you want to read the first? I'll, I'll the give it a shot. Let's see how far. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Chapter one: <laughs> the influence of Latin. 
My initial reflection in this chapter defends the importance of Latin. Oh, that's nice. Its widespread influence cannot be disregarded. For many centuries, Latin has been a, if not the scholarly language in half of Europe. What is the meaning of a scholarly language? It is a language used in the humanities for the study of linguistics while history, religion, and literature, Latin and Greek, were very important in the formation of neologisms in limited terms, as well as in the word composition and derivation processes. Both languages helped to create many new words and precise terminology. Need a drink. This is where if I were doing a Latin live stream, I would be describing what I'm doing in Latin. Bibo aquam. <laughs> you know, just keep up the comprehensible input while I'm taking a drink of water. Um, learned terms uh, to define the new concepts that came from the social and cultural changes as well as knowledge. For example, Latin is still the language used for designated things in biology, right? Throughout the Middle Ages, Latin's importance was a param of paramount importance of, was paramount, excuse me, because it functioned as the only written language. Its study gained new strength during the Renaissance and modernity. For example, it was uh, still used by Copernicus and Newton. Um, all right. Oh, the Vulgar Latin. That's what you wanted to talk about. Now she talks about Vulgar Latin, right? A contrast, classical Latin, a scholarly language contrasted with Vulgar Latin. While the former was a language of erudition to which common people had no access, which is not true, but we'll talk about that. The latter was the language of the masses, the vulgus, or the uneducated, the plebeians, the people, or third state, uh, those who were not uh, part of the gangs or privileged classes of the nobility and clergy and no access to culture and did not understand Latin. Oh boy, Latin there. Um, yeah, let's talk about vulgar Latin. Um, this mm. is of course fascinating, um, but I think there's a very good reason why it's called the Vulgate Bible. And yet it was written late fourth century, early fifth century. It was mm. comprehensible to everyone. You wouldn't, of course, why, in fact, it's, and it differed from, can someone out there remind me the name of the original um, I think somewhat non-official translation into Latin of the New Testament. Um, the Vetus Vetus oh, Latina. Vetus yeah. Latina. Wait, can, can continue. Is that Vetus Latina? Is it? Isn't that it? Well, I, I figure it has a longer name in Latin, but I don't remember. I think that's what it's called. Vetus Latina. Fantastic. Vetus. Great. Yeah, the old Latin. <laughs> um, the older one, though it's not actually old Latin. It's just the older version from the earlier empire. But uh, in any case, it's you know Jerome is. Uh, translating uh, from Greek into Latin. And uh, I mean, I just had a lot of fun making the audiobook for the Gospel of John, reading both the Greek and the Latin and seeing the, the, the there are significant differences from classical Latin. And one of the biggest ones, um, one of the biggest ones was the uh, usage of like quoniam, meaning uh, that, or something like quote, like um, in Latin, I think, um, um, I think you are speaking in classical Latin is, uh, puto te loqui, which is the dumbest mm. sentence I could have thought of, but there it is. Uh, <laughs> but it, in this later form of Latin, puto quoniam tu loqueris, I think mm. that you are. Because in English, if I say, I think you to be speaking, it sounds archaic, we can kind of do it, uh, but I know it to be true, I know that it is true. In English, we can do both in certain uh, certain expressions. Whereas in late Latin, for that accusative plus infinitive, in vulgar Latin, um, as of that period particularly, um, and therefore, of the written Latin of the Bible, it's gone, which is great because it demonstrates that, hey, we have a written form of the language that anybody can understand. It probably is, like all written language, more conservative than the spoken language of the late fourth century. But this is the kind of language that you could expect people to understand and to be able to speak in, um, right. said, spoken aloud. And that's a really um, important part of it because people have often asked me, especially after the getting to be on Norbert's wonderful Ecolinguist channel, as you have as well. Oh, by the way, check out the video in the description of Raf on um, Ecolinguist where he knows about 20 languages and demonstrates it and it's super cool. He's very shy and very humble about it, but it's super awesome. It's, it'll blow your mind. It's really cool. Um, and leave a comment. So you came from the team. Uh, <laughs> uh, but um, the uh, yeah the idea which is um, a little frustrating to hear but you know I don't blame people they ask me oh what Latin do you speak do you speak vulgar Latin or classical Latin or they ask hey do a video where you speak vulgar Latin but vulgar Latin sort of definition is anything other than the standardized written form of the language with the exception of I'd say the Vulgate Bible which I think coincides more plainly with with uh, vulgar Latin, because vulgar Latin simply means, as she writes correctly here, because you're not getting everything wrong, obviously, and she's got right. plenty of real facts in what she's saying, and then other things which are not factual. And she talks about the vulgus, meaning uh, the people, 
um, so it could be anyone, like um, to uh, divulge, divulgare, or vulgare in Latin means to publish. So, for example, uh, Carmen, which would be her Latin name, uh, Carmen vulgavit or divulgavit un librum. She published this book, right? She made it accessible to the people, um, which is why, of course, on the face of it, the idea that people didn't have access to classical Latin is incorrect. Um, vulgar Latin isn't actually um and like as far as the idiom which becomes the romance languages because those are two things because we could talk about the vulgar latin of say the second century bc and then you get the plays of plotus which are hilarious and that's just how people speak more or less with some poetic um stuff inserted in there right that's but vulgar. it's not that far but, from uh it's not that far from you know classical latin no, not at all. and i mean classical latin is is really just so I, I think this is why vulgar latin is such an unfortunate term i guess is because a lot of people, um, it's been so exaggerated in just sort of people's consciousness, I guess, that most people don't realize that in the period that Latin was standardized, which is the first century BC, the standardization was literally just taking a high register, we can say, of the vernacular speech of that period and establishing that as a standard that would be more or less respected from then on. Um, but that very much reflects an actual living speech variety of that time that was natively spoken. Right. And not only that, but even the lowest registers of the language in that period did not differ extensively from that high register standard. There was not a huge difference between the two. Um, you know, we can talk about a, a really tiny amount of, uh, of, of um, dialectic variation in that period, but fundamentally um, we're talking about um, not, you know, maybe when classical Latin was, uh, was standardized, which is only, you know, a couple centuries after Latin had been, had been spread over a wide area, um, the differences between different varieties of Latin were probably not that much more different than, uh, than varieties of English spoken in North America in the 19th century or That's something. That's a great comparison, which explains right. a lot um, too. And I have the uh, regional mm -hmm. variation in the Latin language by, um, uh, Jan Adams back there, which is a great read, which we've, of course, looked at extensively. And it dem he demonstrates this, that that the kind of disappointing thing is that when you're looking at, you know, Roman, Western Roman Empire Latin, um, it's all, there's very little variation. The variations that are there are really cool because you do see antecedents of like proto-romance in there. But for the most part, just as um, the, you know, Australian, New Zealand uh, varieties of English differ from American, Canadian, and um, varieties mm -hmm. written in Ireland, then, you know, we can, you know, they're all, they still have a great degree of uh, mutual intelligibility, you know, and, it's, and it is hundreds and, of years later. Right. And, and the other sort of fundamental issue is that uh, we have extensive reference to the speech of, of, uh, of ordinary people, right? So we have mention of, of how, uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, we have, you know, mention of, of uh, the differences that, that maybe higher class people like to make fun of in, in sort of certain regional ways of speaking. Um, and then we have graffiti in places like Pompeii, which, I mean, you know, you have to think if there was this other, you know, sort of proto-romance language float floating around at that point and people are running around writing graffiti on walls in Pompeii, like surely, Surely we should have at least one example in the thousands of examples of, of graffiti or of letters written by, um, you know, not very educated people or inscriptions that are filled with spelling errors because, uh, um, because they're written by not very educated people. Surely we should find some um, evidence of the vernacular in the way that we... And you're saying you a know, vernacular which differs tremendously from what we think of as normal exactly. Latin. If if such a thing existed, which it didn't, is is the point, right? Writing else in like beautiful poetic forms too, like with with vulgar right. terms about you know what they did in the brothel in hexameter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, which is it's it's right. interesting to uh, to see exactly, and you can find things that they're spelling. Um, mm. For example, as we know, which this is an interesting comparison too, uh, because we know how in say vulgar or in fact rustic speech is what it's called in the first century bc um sermo latinos rusticus where they um monophthongize to the diphthongs actually three of them so i as a e, oi is a e, and ao is all such that um that's but, but the people who spoke that way aren't 
the people who speak the vulgar Latin, which becomes Romance languages in almost every case. Um, and we know that, and you explained this beautifully uh, to me once, Raph, like why that's the case. One of them is oh, and that's a really obvious one. So you have um, like Cicero, for example, um, demonstrates this monophthongization of ow into o. For example, he describes, I think, his daughter Tulia's um, ears as auriculas instead of auriculas. Her little ears, you know, her little earlobes or something. And ow is o. Um, but if that had been a generalized phenomenon, then what would happen is every um, o in Italian from a u, from au, it would have to be a closed o sound. Like, mm -hmm. um, uh, what's a good, what's, what are some good ones? Like Roma, not Roma in standard, you know, Tuscan origin Italian, but not Roma, but Roma, it's closed because it's a long O. So if they had mm -hmm. merged completely, as it definitely was in the rustic non-urban Latin, in, uh, then that's what it had would have had to have been closed and act closed in all those varieties, but it wasn't. And that's true of mm -hmm. the other diphthongs. So we know that the diphthongs I, um, uh, always seem to become a eh, soonest probably for a lot of people first century bc it was uh, already become a normal monophon i later though um except in certain words though and they're demonstrated with words like um um like coda la coda it's not called but coda it's closed in italian because yeah, that word had which was from cauda in classical latin for a lot of classical latin urban speakers had already closed and that one ends up becoming the vulgar latin version which gets passed on hmm. so it's this interchange of, of like how people were speaking um with this with another with different registers a mix of registers and we'll say accent varieties or dialects which ultimately well, and we see we see prescription against it right so we see the appendix probi where people are saying you know don't say these things that sort of are demonstrative of, of processes that would eventually end up being the standard forms in, in romance. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, you know, the in this uh, prescriptive text, which is from, when is it from? Like the fourth century? Or the... Yes. <laughs> Some, <laughs> something like that. Um, okay. but, uh, but, you know, if, if you look at the, it's literally basically a list of just don't say this, say this, right? And all of the things that it's telling people not to say, for the most part, are forms that end up becoming standard in, in romance. For most of them. There are um, like, at least one. And that you. wouldn't make yeah. any sense if, if, if the only thing that was happening was, was there was diglossia such that there was a completely different language that was the romance language that had existed the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then there was classical Latin on top of it then we would have expected texts like this to have existed much earlier. And they wouldn't have been saying things like, don't say this form, say this form. They would have been saying, speak classical Latin, don't speak this other language. But of yeah. course, this other language is never mentioned because it doesn't exist. Exactly. Um, you know, and then uh, there's the council of, uh, of, of what's it called? The council of, you know, the thing in the seventh century where the church decided to, to stop using classical Latin and, uh, uh, when talking to the public, oh, oh, you mean um, in the seventh century? No, I'm I'm more familiar with the uh, the, eighth, the, eighth with the eighth century, century with uh, Charlemagne and Alcuin when they uh, basically uh, invented they invented Latin as a separate idea from Romance. They they made Latin an immortal language, as my immortal language video goes into. Look for that in Plymouth. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. But there's a the, there was a there was basically a. a decision made in, I believe, the 7th century, or the 8th century, I think, to stop using Latin um, in, like, preaching and to start using the uh, the vernacular languages because that was the point when people ceased to be able to understand when they were being preached at in Latin. Right. Yeah. Um, and so the church chose to make a shift. But the point is, prior to that, everybody was understanding. Uh, but yeah. Maybe, maybe we should maybe we should continue yeah, with. Uh, I actually want to ask uh, Italus Wikiano hmm. says how the patrician Claudius changed Claudius. He changed his name to Claudius in order hmm. to sound more like a rustic, you know, just one of the guys kind of kind of person. But Chioggia, which is a place in Italy, is it a closed? Is it Chioggia or Chioggia? I want to know that. So let me know if you uh, if you um, are Italian. Which is it Chioggia or Chioggia? And um, Davide, I think, is here, so he would know. Great. Yes. Let's read chapter one. Where was I? Yes. Vulgar Latin. So that's the, so this is yeah, the first part of it. And that the, the fact that vulgar Latin itself 
is not the language of let's not this um, stratified two layered society which is more common in the middle evil middle uh, medieval period it's more like three there's a, a middle class there's a significant middle class that is the latin speaker those are the speakers of the antecedents to romance because they have influence and power and there's a lot of them and they're the ones that end up spreading language there's an article on latinitium uh, dot com or france i think is i can't remember his last name i met him once great guy he wrote the article about this exact thing um uh, that it's it's that's what vulgar latin in the sense of the antecedent romance comes from not merely how you know greek slaves spoke in pompeii um that's probably isn't an antecedent to anything it could be but probably not um yeah i'll get, do a little bit more reading here um and how did a dead language become a scholarly language this is a good question. No sooner have we asked it than the answer arises almost automatically. There was an intention in adopting Latin as a written language when there were no longer any native speakers. Latin was neither spoken nor understood unless it was studied. The answer to this question is that Latin was the language of power. That's true and very much through all, almost all of Latin's history. Uh, the rest is less. Um, it was uh, the language used in the liturgy of the Catholic Church and the royal chancelleries. Latin was chosen to apply um, a three strata social structure that divided society into, cl into classes based upon economic criteria, priests and nobility, knights, peasants, and traders, right? Based upon the religious ideology of the Catholic church, social stratification was applied according to the criteria of feudalism and its ruling class. This choice was no accident and its success has been maintained to this day. Oh, <laughs> okay. Uh, hence, this situation was not the result of a, gener a degeneration of the Latin language into a vulgar language, a clearly derogatory term. Well, we agree, Carme. Um, there is, uh, at least in that sense, there is too much evidence indicating that vulgar Latin did not exist. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> uh, and, um, let's see. Kyoja uh, has an open O, says, said the Regina. Okay, grazie. Said that. So if Kyoja has an open O, that demonstrates that the Colonia Claudia, which is what its name was, right? The, the, the um, Claudian colony or uh, whatever its um, name was. It was Colonia Claudia. It must have been Au for a while until it became the monophthong O and remained open. Therefore, not mm -hmm. O. If it were Claudia became, before it became Chioggia, then it would be a closed O sound in uh, modern Italian. So that's where she says that vulgar Latin did not exist. What do you think of what well, we just said? Well, so, so what she says here... Um... Well, I mean, the, the, there's the obvious point at the very beginning, which is is that you're ascribing uh, the adoption of Latin as a language, uh, the language of power being intentionally adopted um, based upon the religious ideology of the Catholic Church. And yet you're saying that it's been sort of used as the language of power that nobody actually speaks since before the invention of Christianity or its adoption by the, the Roman Empire. Um, right. So that's just you know you've you've got a little bit of an an issue there with the chronology, but uh, but okay, the truly egregious thing actually is is what comes immediately after that, which is that Go ahead. Um, she writes had it had it existed that is vulgar Latin, so so she she takes vulgar Latin, she is taking vulgar Latin in the sort of colloquial mistaken notion that we were just mentioning is not actually what existed because during the classical period, everybody spoke classical Latin just in high or low registers. Right. But there wasn't that much difference, right? Mm -hmm. But so in that regard, she's actually correct that, that, that at that period, there basically wasn't such thing as vulgar Latin in the way that people often mean it, um, as opposed to later periods when the vernacular speech drifted significantly further. But so she says, um, had it existed, we should find many more intermediate links written in this degenerated Latin rather than in the Romance languages, and yet this is not so. Written Latin is always classical Latin. It does not evolve beyond the personal expertise of the person who uses a dead language. However, Romance languages appear to be quite well defined from the very first texts. So this is just nonsense. All and, of it. Um, which, and, which one do you want to start with? <laughs> Well, okay, I'll start with the, the central, with the, the the central piece of, of nonsense here. And if you guys are interested in this, you should check out the J.N. Adams book, um, all of the J.N. Adams books, actually, Social Variation and uh, over. Uh, what's the other one? Um, Social Variation and the Latin Language. Uh, and, oh, you've <laughs> three of them. 
These are wonderful. Yep. Uh, regional. The regional diversification, right? Uh huh. Anthology um, of formal Latin, 200 BC to 900 AD. Yes. Variation of Latin language. This is a personal favorite. So, so what Jay and Adams does, which is awesome, is he actually takes um, a sort of statistical approach to basically spelling errors um, or orthographic errors of any kind in different places at different times. And what he demonstrates is that certain kinds of mistakes. Um, in certain areas at, at, in the early periods are almost non-existent. Um, certain kinds of, of spelling mistakes that sort of precede developments that we observe in romance, right? So one example would be the conflation of e and e, or the conflation of u and o, or um, well, there's a whole bunch of sound shifts that happened. Uh, the conflation of, of b and v, right? Wa and ba. Um, these are all things that initially are very uncommon spelling errors. Um, in some places, they don't exist at all. But as time progresses, you can actually look at these huge uh, corpuses of material. And what we find is that, um, you know, there's a, there in certain places, at, after a certain period, um, certain error, errors will go from non existent to suddenly like ubiquitous, mm -hmm. where you'll find a text that is filled with errors, but only of this type, or it's filled with errors of only another type. So there are regions where B and V are not confused for very late, but the vowels are confused constantly after a certain period. And there's other regions like North Africa where there's all sorts of spelling errors. Um, th that corpus is filled with spelling errors, but it never ever confuses E and E or O and U, mm. um, which is part of the evidence to show, used to show that uh, North African Latin had a very conservative vowel system, at least in terms of vowel quality. Um, although Augustine, I think, mentions that they, they lost vowel length fairly early. Um, well, yeah, he does, um, he, it's, it's, it's like, did he did even, uh, uh, Augustine or Augustine, did he have uh, vowel length anymore in the fifth century is, is what I would then, then question. Right. That so well, he specifically mentions North Africans as as not right. distinguishing uh, uh, vowel length. Whatever right. long and short right. means to Augustine, it doesn't right. have any distinction. Like os, but, os and right. os, like mouth and bone sound the same in the language of North African. Uh, right. Romance. So, but so the is. so the point is, if what we are looking for is a language that's imposed over a wide area that then begins begins to diverge and slowly undergo sound shifts that spread throughout different areas at different rates, then what we observe is exactly what we expect to observe, right? Which is right. that the corpus shows, you know, um, at certain times in certain places, certain sound shifts suddenly spreading throughout the population. And so this notion that, that uh, you know, written Latin is always classical Latin. It does not evolve between the personal expertise of the person who uses it as a dead if you language. If you read the best authors, that's exactly what you'll find. Yeah. <laughs> but if you but read the guy who's the most yeah. good authors, by the way, then you find this exact fact. Right. Exactly. It's just and, of the knowledge of the language. And if these errors were just the result of diglossia, of people speaking a different language natively, then we would expect to find the same errors throughout the whole period. Mm -hmm. as opposed to a gradual increase until maybe, you know, around the fourth century when there's still tons and tons of material being written in Latin, you know, just sort of uh, uh, informal inscriptions and, and whatnot um, and letters and, and stuff of that sort. Um, there's tons of material being produced. And at that point, we see way more errors than in earlier periods because the speech has changed, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And um, Teresa Nelson asks uh, about, yeah, we're speaking of um, the North African Romance language, which I think it persisted at least through the reign of Justinian in the sixth century. And I think by the seventh century, it finally um, goes away with the uh, influence of um, significant Arab speaking populations in North Africa. But yeah, there was spoken romance in North Africa in the area of Tunisia, Carthage, appropriately. Yeah, uh, yeah, this should make us think. That's a very good sentence. <laughs> this should make us think this should make us think there aren't too many spelling errors but the ones that are in here that wasn't one of them but just some of the things in here I do find they make me laugh
It's a little mean, but they do. Um, <laughs> perhaps it is time we got rid of imposed assumptions that cannot be explained, which we just explained, or on purely linguistic grounds, which we explained um, on purely linguistic grounds, thus, and attested evidence as well, thus being detrimental to our fundamental understanding of the natural evolution of language. So I think her heart's in the right place in a sense of she wants to describe something real and not just go with some kind of superficial dogma, but the way she's doing it is only through superficial understanding of all of the languages in question. Hmm. Um, which is a shame too, because being a bilingual, two romance language bilingual native speaker, some, you know, this, she's come to a, a radically different conclusion with, than what I think would be obvious. But, um, Latin, a written language, not a spoken language. Let us reflect for a moment on an important point. Latin was a written language, not a spoken one. And she hammers on this point. And it's interesting, too, because this is how can, she constructs the arguments in the book. She makes these assumptions without citing almost anything, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. And then that's assumed to be no, true. No citations. No citations, anyway. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's show. Like, but no. I mean, it's. Like, like, I wrote. I wrote an introduction to the Gospel of, of John recording I did, and I have like three pages of bibliography. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, and I'm not. Um, I'm not trying to, you know, show off how much stuff I'm read, but I'm trying to show I'm not making this up. I'm getting this from stuff I've read, and you go ahead and make your own judgments based on the material. But she doesn't seem to be, um, doing hmm. that. And yes, I know. Not a spoken language. Uh, very well said, Gabriel. I, I do have a uh, response to that, um, which is essentially this. Um, this is my automatic reaction to. Oh, no, I lost it. <laughs> darn it! This this is what what I you know would have to say to that. My gut reaction <laughs> is what I actually think think about that. Um, however, apart, I still try. You know, you know, I want to be fair. This is. This is the, what the attitude, more or less, I'm trying to go for, um, <laughs> and Raph as well, you know, trying to not uh, complete, because that's what, as you said, Raph, in the beginning, that's what linguists would normally do with this, um, automatically is just um, not even deal with it. And a lot of people said that. Actually, some people were so angry just at the, the thumbnail that they thought we believed this. <laughs> they thought you believed it. <laughs> Raph, they said, Raphael, is, he said something in Spanish, like, Raphael, my case is stupid, though. I don't remember what it was, but it was <laughs> No, no, right. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, and that's the basis of the next bit. Let's keep building this. Okay. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. Let us reflect for a moment on an important point. Latin was not was a written language, not a spoken one. Speaking in one language and writing in another is very frequent. This situation is much more common than it may seem. It happened, for example, with Hieratic, Demotic, and Coptic Egyptian language. In ancient Egypt, three types of script were developed. The oldest form was the hieroglyphic script, or sacred characters, uh, from 3200 BC, re reserved for use and understanding by the higher castes for rituals, for rituals with religious purposes. Hieroglyphics were carved on tablets, temple walls, papyrus, and ostraca, or stone flakes. Over time, there emerged a hieratic script, a stylized form of hieroglyphic writing. Later, a demotic script was invented as a stylized form of the hieratic script and was used on stone or wood for commercial contracts and literary writings. Uh, between 650 and 400 BC, it was used in administrative, legal, and commercial texts, while hieroglyphic and, hier and hieratic writing continued to be used solely for ceremonial texts. So it's she's sort of conflating um, orthography with language, but but this is actually a legitimate uh, example of um, diglossia, which is what we were talking about before. Um, what she's really talking about is Middle Egyptian. Uh, which was written in hieroglyphic hieroglyphics and the hieratic script. Um, uh, apologies to Stefano if I get anything wrong, but you know he'll, 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 let, he'll let us know later. But uh, so Middle Egyptian was um, the, here, the language so. yeah. was the standardized language of around 2000 BC, and that was used as a sort of prestige uh, written language for a very long time. Um, whereas Demotic. Um, Right. Yeah, exactly. Whereas Demotic was, um, uh, you know, at one point the spoken language, although it later developed into Coptic. So, you know, basically at various points, 
the high register of the vernacular of one vernacular dialect would be established as a new written standard. And for a time, it would correspond very closely with the spoken language, but eventually the spoken language would move on and the written standard would remain the same. And so you had a similar thing with Demotic moving into Coptic and then Coptic now being replaced um, with Arabic, where Coptic is, of course, a liturgical language of, uh, of Egyptian Coptic Christians but um, they unfortunately all speak Arabic now and Coptic is no longer a natively spoken language as far as we know, so. Yeah. Um, there, are, there are Coptic, no, don't tell me that. There are Coptic speaker, speakers and <laughs> there are, oh, I was going, oh. Um, so into our, um, paleontology and I can't remember the name of them. Trilobites, there are trilobites, they still exist. We found the coelacanth. <laughs> we found the fish. We'll I will be ecstatic we'll find if we speakers. find if we find some if we find some village of uh, actual Coptic speakers. Uh, they're there, up in the somewhere in there. Um, so she uh, believes that they come from a Roman. So she's sort of a vague. Well, okay, actually, yes, she says, uh, "No venimos del Latin, venimos del Ibérico." Right. Um, Iberico, so, so, not all so this is in the interview, we haven't gotten, well, but she thinks that Iberico, is the Iberian, same language, sorry, that is, is the Iberian, same language. Which just happened to coincide geographically with the exact definition of the Roman Empire. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, yeah, because of course it's also spoken in Romania, according to her. Um, so we haven't gotten to that in this book yet, but I guess, I guess we can just address it now. Yeah, we'll go um, back into it. Yeah, so so in the interview, she talks about how Spanish is the descendant of the Iberian language, which was the language spoken. You know, maybe we should keep reading because I think I think we should talk about this. Go yeah, ahead. We'll, we'll get to this. Okay. Get on, sir. Um, in the later stages, well, you know, we don't need to keep reading about Egyptian because we already no. talked about uh, we already talked about diglossia. Uh, the division between spoken and written languages uh, did not only occur in remote times. Blah blah. blah. Chinese, Arabic, yes. Have you noticed how in Chinese markets, people often use a slate for negotiations before closing a deal? Is that actually true? Hmm. Um, I don't know if, if anyone's ever been to a Chinese market, let us know. Uh, <laughs> they're writing the characters in Mandarin Chinese. They share a common writing, although they do not understand each other when they speak. Okay, she sounds um, like talking about uh, uh, Cantonese and Mandarin Native yeah, speakers, speakers with various Chinese languages. Yeah, right. It's communicating through the written language, which is essential. Which the characters are fundamentally standardized, even though the syntax is different and other stuff. Like well, that. and and actually, interestingly, so a lot of people think that uh, when Cantonese speakers write, that they're just writing Cantonese, but in Chinese characters, and that that's enough to make Mandarin and Cantonese mutually intelligible. Um, that's actually not what's happening. It's it's more interesting than that. If you oh. ever talk to a Cantonese speaker, uh, they will regale you, or if you ask them, then, then they oh, might. Um, what Cantonese speakers are actually doing, the ones, so many of them actually speak Mandarin, like fluently, but the ones who don't know Mandarin in written form, in terms of the characters, but they have no phonological representation of it. So when they write Chinese, what they're basically writing is more or less you know, Mandarin, it's the same thing as standard written Mandarin, mm. but they pronounce it using the Cantonese readings of the same characters. Cool. But of course that's not actual spoken Cantonese. And you can, there is such thing as, as written Cantonese, which is not really intelligible to Mandarin speakers, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating. I wonder, could you, I know this may be a bad comparison, but comparing like um, how the traditional pronunciation of Latin in England, which hmm. uh, it's just uh, you know a couple hundred years ago. It's like I can't understand it spoken because it has all the vowel hmm. and consonant shifts of English, um, but it's applied to you know it, it just doesn't work at all. It doesn't except it can work. People, I'm sure Isaac Newton spoke probably Latin something similar to that manner, mm -hmm. and it would uh, you know it worked um, uh, for people right. using it who are used to it, but um, would not be intelligible normally to someone from say Italy. Right. Yeah, I mean exactly. It, it's it's like that or it would be like it would be like if in order to communicate in written form with English speakers, an Italian learned English fluently in written form, but they just pronounced every letter when they actually read it when the Japanese as if in, in the what? When the Japanese learn English. 
well, yeah, kind of. No, that's maybe slightly uncharitable, but but yes. <laughs> um, okay. Okay, this is where it gets good. Nihon I think. Uh, so uh, what writing did Latin replace? Yes, this is where we get to El Iberico. Uh, so in the Iberian Peninsula, Latin displaced Iberian as a written language. However, it is important to explain that this was not achieved by the ancient Romans, but by the church later on. Latin became the written language of the Western Catholic Church, while the Eastern Orthodox Church maintained the use of Greek. Why do we say Latin was not implemented by the Romans? Because under full Roman rule, not only did Iberian script not disappear, but it actually spread, expanding its area of influence. Why? We should ask ourselves this question. Imagine the situation for a moment. On the Iberian Peninsula, several scripts were used. We'll focus on the Northeastern Iberian script here, uh, hereafter called Iberian. Iberian writing is found on all kinds of supports and in, on all kinds of supports hmm. and contexts. Columns? I don't know what that means. Maybe on hmm? columns, like architectural supports? With all kinds of supports and contexts. That's very weird uh, phrasing. Anyway, um, uh, from pottery and household utensils to lead plaques, transport amphoras, loom weights, cultic containers found in funerary contexts, rock inscriptions, coins, mosaics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, therefore, um, it was not a skill restricted to an elite, but a knowledge with a broad social distribution, just like writing in the Roman Empire of Latin, maybe, but maybe not, according but, to... But as you know, of... only classical Latin is written down, and it's not the language, it's... <laughs> um, Your worldview is off, man. So the Iberian <laughs> script had been consolidated since the 7th century BC. Its writing was probably prior to this, as such a complex system does not just appear out of the blue. Well, I mean, maybe, but it was clearly adopted from other scripts. So, um, however, when the writing recipients were labile, labile? labile. <laughs> such as leather or parchment, they were not preserved. Uh, only non perishable they recipients, they such as stone, that. ceramic, or lead, survived. Fair enough. Um, the Iberian slip script is semi Slavic. Um, Okay, this, this is, but uh, the writing is around 300 years older than the arrival of the Romans. Before the Romans, the Greeks and Phoenicians also used their own scripts. Thus, we have the Phoenicians, Greeks, and Romans using alphabetic writings and yet never managed to displace the use of the Iberian syllabic writing, which spread to other geographic areas and against all odds remained alive until the first or second century AD. Um, the Iberian script was adopted by Celtic and Celt-Iberian peoples under Roman rule. Why? It is a good question. If there is a simplified alphabetical system, why use a more complex syllabic system that makes it difficult to transcribe consonant groups? The premises used in the mainstream inter interpretations of these phenomena have to be rethought and revised. Exclamation point. Uh, <laughs> um, if the bronze plaques from Botor Botorita, 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 where is that? I don't know. Go, Dating to the first go, century go. BC, found at the site of Contrevia Belaisca, mm. Botorica, Botor, Botorita, mm. Zaragoza. Zaragoza yeah. And the bronze from Luzaga, uh, among others, are written in Iberian script. This means that uh, it was a script that Celt Iberians understood. Well, wait, are we talking about Iberians or Celt Iberians? Well, Celt Iberians adopted the script, therefore, ah, they acquired those interesting right. and useful letters to pronounce their own languages. Right. Um, and so then it says, faced with the dilemma of writing in Latin or in Iberian, if it so happened that there was such a choice, the latter was chosen, and more importantly, the Romans accepted this naturally, the same as they had accepted that the Greeks and Phoenicians, albeit under Roman rule, would use their own scripts. The Iberian script was used until the time of Augustus in the first century AD. After that, the Iberian language ceased to be written, but did not cease to be spoken. So, okay, I noticed, I know I that. noticed that in, I in know that. <laughs> my cursory uh, flip through of this book before. So let's see if, if, if anyone caught this. The Iberian script was used until the time of Augustus, right? And two pages ago, it says, Latin displaced Iberian as a written language. However, it is important to explain that this was not achieved by the ancient Romans, but by the church later on. 
So, so which one? <laughs> so, which, so which was it? Did did it stop being written by the time of Augustus, or did the church replace it later on? Like you can't have it both ways. Uh, I mean, this is just. I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, you know, this is ridiculous to the point that it almost makes it tempting to doubt the sincerity of the person writing this because you have a direct contradiction of your own chronology within a page and a half. Yeah, and but, you, I mean, when you see her in an interview, she seems very sincere. Um, mm. Yeah, um, I don't know if anyone gets the. By the way, we're definitely don't so, recommend in this because at one point we're not one we don't want to slander a person or the writing mm. feel free to buy this our personal opinion recommendation is if you do buy this it should be to laugh at it at the ideas or to critique them uh uh heavily <laughs> yeah very very oh yeah there are i was actually meant a different person now yes yeah, very coherent um coherent <laughs> is that yeah is that the um good catch yep and that was one of my notes uh, that would fall out because oof. every page was filled with comments and notes. kyle i don't know about that one buddy let's uh let's not be sexist oh no yeah yeah no don't, we don't we don't feel that way there uh, are there are so many absolutely incredible um linguists who are women um yeah Carme, absolutely is not representative. She's not even part of the field, right? Keep that in mind, guys. Um, She's not so this is not, this is, this is not about gatekeeping women out of talking about linguistics. That's not what absolutely this is not. about at all. Bears repeat, um, thanks for, for mentioning that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is important because we, we talked about, who would I talk with some podcast? Maybe it was with Chris actually, in um, a podcast about uh, like this, where we, we talked about that uh, exact thing and that it's, um, the, it's not something I have experienced directly, but you know I've, I've heard this, that even today there is some gatekeeping in the classics, Latin and ancient Greek, kind of the idea. Uh, there are a few, very few, but they do apparently still exist, some uh, folks who believe that um, it's just something for men to do, which is just inher inherently absurd. Um, and uh, for you know all kinds of countless reasons, um, mm -hmm. and not least of which how many outstanding female linguists, teachers of Latin and ancient Greek, whom I know personally, you know, and who, from whom I've learned. I mean, uh, one of our uh, great friends, Irene Regini, Satura Lanx, from whom I've learned so much uh, Latin, mm -hmm. listening to her podcast over the years in Latin and her YouTube video. So, I mean, it's just like, yeah, so I'm, I'm glad we, we are repeating that because that is important. Um, good. Where do you want to continue from? Yeah, well, okay. I, I think yeah, these aren't her I think ideas can you... from other sources that are old and just packaging them all into a new book. And so it, it kind of right. seems. I mean, I think, I think the Iberian thing is, is her maybe because it's well, so let's, let's maybe see uh, because, because there's a section here. What, what language did the Roman speak? Right. So let's see what she has to say. Um, do you want to read it? Luke, or should I read it? Oh yeah. What language did the Roman speak? Sure. The yeah. soldiers of the Roman, because I do love this part. The soldiers of the Roman legions of Hispania did not speak Latin. I've, I've read some of their letters in Latin, by the way, just so you know. <laughs> um, oh, but they wrote, they didn't speak. I'm sorry. Mm. Uh, we should not find this surprising. I will explain why. First, the Italian peninsula was inhabited by different peoples, divided into three major linguistic groups. The Latino Faliscan languages. Faliscan was spoken north of the city of Rome, while Latin was spoken in the Lazio region in the center of Italy. This is correct, by the way. The Osco-Umbrian and Sibelian, Sibelian languages. Oscan was spoken in central and southern Italy. Due to their proximity, Marusinian, um, Pelinian, and Vestinian are considered its dialects. Umbrian was spoken in the central northern region and included the following dialects, Marcian, Sabine, um, Equian, uh, and so forth. So I'm not saying all of them here. South. Um, Piscine, Picene, was spoken in the central Adriatic region and is characterized by its inventory of seven vowels. A variant called North Piscine does not occur, uh, does not appear to be an Indo European language and is linked to Etruscan. The Tyrrhenian languages, Etruscan spoken in, in Tuscany. 
It's thought to have disappeared due to the decline of the Etruscan civilization into BC. It was absorbed by Latin, which maintained only a dozen of its words. Uh, Rishan and Lemnian also belong to the same Turanian family of languages. Follows the map. Secretur. Just, you know the language. You can find that easily googling it. Um, and it's interesting. She believes in the uh, in in Indo-European. Um, we'll get into why that's so interesting later. I think um, when we get to the meat of her sort of complaints about the notion of of the Romance language uh, coming from Latin. Um, yes, but but uh, keep that in mind. That absolutely. That, uh, yeah. And uh, by the way, all of you out there, um, loving the chat you're having with uh, each other. We're trying. We of course are interested in answering your uh, your questions. If we don't happen to answer, you know, just write the copy and paste. Write the same question a few minutes later. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, ten or fifteen minutes later, we'll be happy to try to get to all your questions today. <laughs> We're not going anywhere. We got a lot. How far we got? Yes. We go as yeah, far as, as Raphael can stay awake for. Um, <laughs> I got plenty of time, guys. Um, okay. okay. So, um, uh, should I read? Oh, there's always some poet. Yeah, uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, when, in the course of the 7th century BC, Rome's influence extended beyond the region of Lazio, it found two major flourishing cultures. Interesting that, did you already read this? Uh, from I didn't uh, begin reading below the map. You I'm didn't. Gonna... You didn't begin reading below the map. Correct. You begin. Okay. Reading. Both had a huge impact on Roman culture, and both were using their own writing, different from the Latin one, as we shall see when we speak about the Latin alphabet. Many authors question the existence of a common italic. Although different languages share grammatical or phonetic similarities, these could be caused by their geographic proximity or by a convergence development of languages belonging to different families. So it's fascinating that she brings up these concepts um, in this section of the book and then is able to claim things like the Romance languages are, are too similar to one another, mm -hmm. um, as if it's impossible for speech varieties to, to converge with one another over time after they had already split apart, right? Um, right. Which is what we know to happen, right? So there are features that, uh, that spread very slowly throughout the Romance world. Um, one example would be the loss of the case system, right? So, uh, We'll probably talk about this later, but just very briefly, um, the loss of the distinction between nominative and accusative cases was lost very early in Old Spanish, like as in it's a distinction between nominative and accusative is not even attested in the earliest forms of Spanish, but it still existed in the earliest forms of French. Um, and not only that, but there's actually a, a regional language spoken in France in which there's still a nominative accusative distinction on the masculine singular article and um, which, for example in, in standard French. right exactly so, that's so that's if you look at modern french it doesn't have a nominative accusative distinction just like all the rest of romance Except but if you look at well romanian doesn't have nominative accusative on, oh, on nouns yeah you're right and only pronouns yeah. my bad but uh yes Yes, it's your bad you right. romanian. <laughs> um but the point is a feature that is now present in all of the surviving Romance languages very clearly happened hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years earlier in some places than in other places. Um, and so, anyway, mm. uh, yes. Keep the map up for a little while for people um, to uh, enjoy. This is from Wikipedia, yes. by the way. Looking at the map, one can appreciate insignif uh, insignificant extension of the Latin Faliscan languages compared to the non-Indo-European languages. That's so that is so funny. Compared to the so non-Indo-European languages? Right. Etruscan okay. on the one hand oh. and Sibelian languages on the other. There's Because she has a map um, almost identical to, or very similar to the one that I have on the screen, which demonstrates the situation of linguistic variety as we tend to define it in you know, early Roman Republic times, um, you know, or, or late Roman kingdom times, actually is probably a better uh, comparison. But so, you know, the, before Latin literature begins, it looks like this. And she says, you see how little of an area? Well, if Latin couldn't possibly have taken over all of that, that's the logic behind it. Unless I miss something, right? Yeah, that's the logic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Continue. Well, it's also interesting that she says, uh, yeah. 
insignificant extension of the Latin Faliscan languages compared to the non-Indo-European languages, Etruscan on the on, on the one hand and Sabellian languages on the other. So Sabellian, that, that would be Umbrian, Oscan, um, those are Indo-European. Of course they are. <laughs> The the only one that's oh that's uh, what, she's saying it's Sibelian and the. I mean, this is just a this is just a silly mistake. It's you know, but it's just worth pointing out the, the sort of reading this text. Like, be careful not to just take at face value the things that are stated. You can't take anything in this at, at face value, and that's why it's so unfortunate that there's like no citations because. If you bothered to actually source your claims from things, then at least we'd know like where you're getting these ideas from, um, because it really seems like you're just making them up. Right. Me, if I can address you directly, um, and it's you know it's it's frustrating. It's like, why are you just making things up? If you want to make an argument, then don't just make things up like this. Like, right. that's what causes source your claims. Sincerity of don't um, make silly mistakes like this. Yeah, because it's. I mean, this is so easy to uh, look this up. At, you know, you can get a Wikipedia is great for a surface level understanding of commonly accepted knowledge. If you want to challenge the commonly accepted knowledge, oh, I'm interested. That's something Raf and I do to a small extent with her talking about, say, ancient Greek or Latin pronunciation, chronologies. We but get this is not um, how to do it. What's that? This is not how to do it. No, so now, you know, we, talk, <laughs> we, we try to present a case. Okay, here's what people think and why. And uh, and when we write about this or when we talk about this, we in our videos, we say, oh, but this is this is where we, we see this difference. So we acknowledge this generalized opinion. But, yeah, when you say things that are clearly not true, then why? You know, that's sort of, that's exactly the point. Yeah. So stylistically, there are problems with the book. So when she says, go read the book, I don't think it actually helps her case at all. Mm. Uh, let's let's go on, please. Where were you? Okay. I want to read the uh, poem there when we get to it. Well, yeah. Uh, Rome had subdued all the populations and used auxiliary Italian uh, Italic troops in its campaigns of conquest, consisting of soldiers from all regions of the empire. This explains why there were so many different languages in the Roman legionary. Therefore, the idea of an educated army speaking only Latin does not conform to reality. It does conform Another... to the letters they wrote, which were sometimes Greek and a lot of them Latin. <laughs> right. Well, and and we have uh, we have some authors who actually mention being bilingual in, say, Oscan and uh, and Latin. Yeah. Um, we still have inscriptions in these other languages. So this is another thing. Even when Latin becomes the language of power throughout these regions, mm -hmm. for significant periods of time, we continue to see inscriptions in the regional languages of the Italic Peninsula and of other areas that are conquered by Rome, um, and so. You can't, you can't acknowledge that and also be claiming that there was this pan proto romance language being spoken throughout the entire region that nobody was mentioning or writing or testing in any way, shape, or form. Right. Because even under Latin, you still had people writing inscriptions in Oscan and Umbrian and Etruscan and Greek and all sorts of other languages. We have Arabic inscriptions from Pompeii. Right, oh, cool. we have early yeah. Arabic inscriptions or graffiti, yeah, rather, we have Arabic graffiti in Pompeii. If you can have random like legionaries writing in Arabic in Pompeii, like super early Arabic, then how come if everybody's native language was this different language that's too different from Latin to have descended from Latin, why is nobody writing any of it? Like, oh, it's just, it's, oh my God. Okay. Yeah. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. But, right. uh, well, there's, of course, an easy answer to this. <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay. I love Rage Cat. This poor cat. <laughs> I've made so memes, so many memes of this cat, of its moment <laughs> of just pure, just hatred and rage. It's, it's for, forever. Poor kid. I remember it. Anyway, um, you're, you're reading. So another another issue to consider is that some sources indicate that Latin was a dead language in the third century BC. That is absolutely not correct. Um, uh, there's the following epitaph on the gravestone of the poet uh, Naius. 
who no, died in 201 BC. BC. Transcribed in uh, standard Latin. I think it's different in the inscription, but it's immortales, mortales, si foret, fla, foret fas flere, flerent diuai, uh, camenae naevium poetam, itaque, postquest, orci traditus tesauro, oblidi sunt romani loquier lingua latina. So, quote this, especially the last line that um, Jan Adams actually talks about the same great quote in uh, one of his books, if you remember. Uh, but um, it's a great, uh, like, look, so it, the last line there is that the Romans themselves forgot how to speak Latin. This is the common thing you hear from any person of an older generation, right? That, ah, you kids don't know how to speak, name your language anymore. Because, of course, language frequently undergoes some sort of change between generations, especially between grandparents or grandchildren. It's more perceptible than with just you know, two generations, right? So that's what he he's talking about, no? Right, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, there was absolutely no notion in this period of, um, of um, you know, accepting uh, of different ways of being accepting of different ways of speaking or of the validity of, of variation in, in different speech varieties, right? Every generation uh, sort of very much bought into this uh, notion of, you know, older is better, more conservative is better. Um, and we continue to see that in, in later periods when people are, are making fun of new ways of speaking that have developed in Latin, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, this just doesn't, you know, this is the kind of thing where if there was any actual evidence like that this could sort of fit into, um, you could maybe make the argument that this is like part of a framework that, that points towards your conclusion. If there was some reason to believe that this actual, that this other language that they're supposedly speaking actually existed. Um, right then then maybe this could sort of fit into a, a framework of evidence mm -hmm. but just by itself this means absolutely nothing um yeah. it's this like is just indicative of the news technology. complaining about kids these days you know get off my lawn with your right. whereas it's terrible just, go ahead, uh, my uh maybe is epic the bellum poinicum written in saturnian meter and evoking uh for the first time the legends of the founding of rome was the first manifestation of Latin epic poetry. His style was considered archaic. By the way, if you want to hear about this spoken in Latin, a literae simplices, a series by Statura Lang, she described this in Latin. It's super cool. Uh, and But uh, his style was considered archaic, vulgar, and not very elegant. A curious detail because although the authors of the next generations mentioned and praised the poem, it was not for its poetic value, but because it celebrated the national glories. Virgil, Ovid, Cicero, and even Horace who was the son of a freed slave, received a first-class education. Much has been debated about whether the refined style of Cicero's was the same language as that spoken by the Romans. Of course it was, but okay. It is said that as a writer, he gave Latin an abstract lexicon, which it lacked. No, he frequently critiqued people for speaking in too, like too Greekish a way, too uh, formally not, not, you know, um, I don't need to go into detail, but we'll continue. Um, and he transferred and translated many terms from Greek right into normal sounding Latin, thus transforming Latin into a scholarly language. It was already, but okay, suitable for expressing deeper thought. Cicero is wonderful. He did some of this, yeah. Cicero's prose was then the model that established, uh, that established as, that was established as, uh, I was just talking with an Italian friend today about this kind of, that, that established as, that was established as, I mean, who's going to translate this? It's not going to be a you know professional linguist. Um, was the scholarly Latin the same language? Was the scholarly Latin the same language as the one which uh, Nevius wrote? That is a language described as archaic and vulgar. Lastly, another question arises: How is it possible that during the classical period it was necessary to study Latin grammar and Latin rhetoric in the same way as Greek was studied? I'm sure she went to school and studied you know, standard Castilian and stand, whatever standardized form of uh, Catalan she must have learned in school, because I assume in school she was able to learn Catalan. I don't know about the how that works, though, um, uh, pedagogically in, in that part of Spain. But she learned standardized language, right? As we did, we went to school, we learned, oh, this is, you know, standardized form of language. Why would you have to do that? The same reason everybody does, right? <laughs> to learn to read and write. Am I wrong? All right. 
Yes, I, I, I definitely remember having uh, English teachers. Well, and and well, okay, but but what she's really saying is, why was it necessary to study Latin grammar and Latin rhetoric in the same way as Greek was studied? But this is interesting because, well, how did how did educated Romans learn Greek? I mean, I'm I'm not an expert on this, but but from what I've been told, basically the way that educated Romans were taught Greek is that a native Greek speaking tutor was brought to them and they would speak to them in Greek so that they would acquire it more or less as a native language, right? Because children are, are able to acquire languages if uh, if you give them enough input in that language. And so if you stick them with a Greek speaking tutor, they'll, they'll acquire the language. And then they were taught Greek as a sort of, um, you know, they were taught the prestige registers of, of Greek in the same way that they were taught the prestige registers of Latin. Um, but so the point is there's absolutely zero evidence that Latin was being taught to uh, Romans as a second language, basically, right? We do later see materials being produced um, for the purpose of learning Latin as a second language, like in the eastern part of the of the right, like in the in the eastern part of the empire. But there's absolutely no evidence of this stuff being like extensively used in uh, in Italy because they spoke Latin, right? So right, and there was this is just wrong version of it. Was just wrong there for sure. But mm. yeah, it's it's pretty uh it's pretty amazing. Mm. Um, I'll, so uh, uh, reading, I'll bring up some of the the Hermeneum meta because they're pretty cool. Okay. Uh, time and again, it has been shown that except for the patricians, the Romans had to study to speak Latin correctly. So you say time and again, it's been shown, but there's no citations. Uh, <laughs> um, and correctly, of course, this is in reference to a, a high register standard, right? So yes, that has to be taught because the high register standard is an arbitrary form of language where we're arbitrarily saying this way of speaking and writing is good and this way is bad. So that, of course, has to be taught to people, right. um, regardless of what their native language is. Mm -hmm. The reason can be found in the fact that given the mixture of Italic languages spoken, some unification and standardiza standardization were necessary, as with the dialectical dialectal variables of some modern languages. Classical Latin would be the written language resulting from this homogenization. However, for speaking, everyone would use their own mother tongue, a language they themselves refer to as Romana Lingua. Do you, do you know anything about this term? Romana, Romana lingua? lingua? The language of the Romans, which includes, which could be any Greek of Rome, any language of Romans, which could be Greek or Latin. Hence, hmm. Grites, which is the, the, our two wonderful, beautiful languages. Yeah. This example of the interpretamenta, which means translation or Herman, um, which is Greek for the same term. And it's really cool because you see word for pretty much word for word. And there's all kinds of studies that Eleanor Dickey has done great stuff on this, for example, and her books are great. Um, like Hedeos Seidon, literally word for word, um, with pleasure you I saw. I've seen you with pleasure. Um, it's like it's identical, and sometimes the syntax is a little bit different. But you see, some in some of these texts, you see a Greekified Latin, potentially, and sometimes you see a Latinized Greek in a way because there depends who this was for. We're not totally sure, but we can interpret like, oh, this is probably for Greek speakers to see the word for word translation of their native language, or vice versa, and vice versa, right? Yeah, yeah, depending on what the purpose was of them. But there's also indications that. You have a merging, um, a co-evolution of Latin and Greek into their Koine and Late Latin forms, which these both are, Late Koine and Late Latin, uh, into a more, you know, vulgarized way. They're really interesting, but I mean, uh, this is an example of how, you know, like it's very much very similar to how we try to re try to change the way we teach Latin and Greek today in a more natural hmm. way. And they were doing it back in, you know, the Roman Empire. Go figure. Right. Hmm. Where uh, you? Should I continue? Please. Okay. It seems increasingly evident that Latin was nobody's native language, but rather does it now? And that has not been established at all, but sure. Uh, but rather a language in which they could all understand each other. In a first stage, it was a planned and imposed language, enabling military leaders to address the troops and promote unity among armies of different origins, legislators and scholars to draft legal, historical, literary documents, to validate political agreements and commercial contracts in an intelligible way for all, and to spread knowledge. Later, this imposition continued with the, with the resurgence of Latin culture and arts directed by the Catholic Church, establishing a common identity under the Holy Roman Empire of Germany. 
of Germany. Hmm. Returning to the Iberian Peninsula. How do we the, jump to Germany? I yeah, I'm, 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 I got lost. Just keep reading. But don't so pay attention. Just keep going forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, though. Uh, if this was the language that everybody could understand one another in, then it would have, by necessity, been a spoken language, right? And would have, by necessity, been adopted by large numbers of people as, as a spoken language. And we shouldn't get into this too much, but you see this in places like uh, on page six. Um, you see this in places like Israel, right? So not to get into the political side of it, but um, uh, you had a whole bunch of Jewish people from many different places with a common liturgical language in the form of Hebrew. And it's a common misconception that that the revival of Hebrew was sort of a an intentional, um, an entirely intentional process that was artificially you know, imposed by the Israeli government. But the reality is actually modern Hebrew was sort of born um, in this community of, of speakers who came to Palestine, to mandatory Palestine or Ottoman Palestine, I guess, um, uh, and needed to communicate with one another. And so it just sort of resurged as a spoken language and then people started to speak it natively. So if even in this, uh, situation that she's describing, it's just incredibly, even if it were the case, it's incredibly improbable that Latin wouldn't be widely used as a spoken language and then by necessity used as a native language of a whole, of a whole bunch of people. Precisely. And so that's exactly how Latin probably became widespread throughout a huge area, not just because, you know, not necessarily because of intentional policies of, of linguistic genocide, not that the Romans were were saints uh, by any means in terms of their you know colonial policies or whatever, but um, but it just wasn't necessary because it was so practical for Latin to right. spread throughout the population. And the uh, article uh, Romanitas that we spoke about um, in the ten hour uh, spoken Latin live stream over on my other channel Scorpio Martianos, if you want to check out that towards the end there, in the description, there's even timestamps if you want to find where we talk about Romanitas. <laughs> But uh, the article also by J.N. Adams, the wonderful fellow, he um, demonstrates how just the interesting phenomenon of adoption of Romanism, of a Roman a Romanity, Romanitas, consciously and deliberately, because in a way it was the only show in town, except for, you know, Greek culture. It was this, it was the one building, you know, roads and aqueducts and bringing, you know, law, uh, bringing um, these uh, amazing, you know, technological things and prosperity. And I'm sure there were people like we see depicted in the Barbarians show. Um, as actually happened, of course, where the tribal German uh, leaders got together and um, refused Roman expansion, and they didn't want to take on Roman values, which is an interesting um, phenomenon. It was actually the exception rather than the rule, pretty much everywhere the Romans um, established a foothold. People just wanted to be Roman for the most part. And of course, again, we're not glossing over the, the cruelties and the horrors inflicted by Roman uh, soldiers or civilization as well. I mean, all that needs to be discussed in, on, you know, in our classrooms and in our open environments. Uh, like this one. Um, but the idea is just people uh, just describing what happened. They did adopt the language because of its um, potential. Because just like um, when you know a language that's used all everywhere in a very powerful and wealthy society, if you know that language, then you can get further in life. So people want to do it. They want to Romanize themselves. And we carry on that tradition today when we adopt our first names, at least when we speak Latin, into a declinable Latinized form. Like I call myself Lucius in Latin because, well, for, and just because it's more convenient for the language and it's what everybody else, whoever spoke Latin, has done up through the modern era. So it's an interesting. You know, phenomenon. You don't do that in other languages. I can't really pull off calling myself Luca or Lucino. Well, I mean, Lucino in Italian, but um, not especially because it's just, you know, like, nah, why would you do that? You know, but in whereas with the Latin language and the Roman, the Romanitas idea, um, it does happen. And similarly, there's a similar phenomenon. I think even I read about in the context of Chinese um, first uh, generation um, or even maybe zero uh, generation immigrants in, in Iberia, actually, Spain and Portugal taking on, as it happens also in the United States and other countries, taking on um, non-Chinese first names because it's easier to, for the, the people to pronounce and mm. also kind of willingly um, assimilate in that way into the culture. Very interesting, that kind of, um, yeah. um, it's not a new thing. Sure if, uh, one of my favorite things, one of my favorite examples of this is if any of you guys uh, go onto Wikipedia, go to, the, go to the page of any celebrity that you know where their name 
ends in a consonant, preferably a, a male celebrity, whose name ends in a consonant, and change the language to Latvian and see what happens to their name. It's quite Ooh. funny. Is it Us? Uh, like like put put Donald Trump in or something and, and change the name to uh, change change the language to Latvian. Cool. Fun game happens. for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, should we keep going? I uh, see. Where where did I I leave off here? Um, I got lost and in, in, in a mess. Of this. Um, um, timing image shown that except for the patricians, the Romans had to study to speak Latin correctly. The reason can be found in the fact that, given the mixture of Italic languages spoken, some unification and standardization were necessary as the dialectical variables of some modern languages. Classical Latin would be the written language resulting from this homogenization. Wait. I think I think actually we read this. I think we're at uh, I think we're at returning to the Iberian Peninsula. Let's return to the Iberian. You're right. You did read this. Thank you, my friend. The contingent uh, of colonizers came from the central and southern regions of the Italian Peninsula and spoke Sabellian languages from the Osco Umbrian family. Furthermore, it should be noted that since the Punic Wars, the Roman armies located in Hispania employed citizens from inland villages and the peninsula as auxiliaries to the Roman legions. Against is it capital, she capitalized peninsula. Is that now when I capitalize peninsula, I mean Italy, peninsula, like la peninsula. Does she mean Iberia though? Is that her capital? Which would make sense for her. Okay, sure. totally fine. Just... Oh. My phone, sorry, <laughs> continue. <laughs> um, against the Carthaginians and other peoples on the peninsula, only the senior officers learned Latin, Greek, and Phoenician which is why they cannot be considered as active agents of Romanization. So again, it's the same kind of like, it's an interesting idea. It's kind of a fan fiction of history, you right. know, like, okay, that's, I mean, it's not, you know, and I like an interesting novel idea, but I have enough knowledge of this region and this part of history and the languages involved to say, no, that's not true. Where's really like, you know, what, where's your amazing evidence? You know, extraordinary claims, extraordinary evidence. Therefore, if the soldiers of the Roman armies of Hispania, a mixed group of Italics and Hispanics, cannot be considered active agents of Romanization, where are the thousands of people who disseminated their language, devastating all languages from the big cities to the most remote mountain valleys? At that time, there was certainly no public or compulsory education. This is true. TV policies or language immersion. Well, there was language immersion, but how did the Roman legions manage to get illiterate peasants, fishermen, miners, artisans, and shepherds to cease speaking their mother tongues in favor of Cicero's Latin, a language Romans themselves needed years to master. Things may not have happened as we were led to believe, exclamation point. Right. So, okay. There's sort of a density here of ridiculousness that maybe we could just sort of rapid fire address. Go ahead. Um, so, okay. First, well, first, of course, is the fact that just no evidence is provided for why you're claiming that most of the soldiers were coming from X region or, or Y region. I'm, I'm not sure why she's claiming that they were mostly Sabellic speakers in this period. Because um, they were geographically um, distributed in, in Italy. <laughs> Nor is but, the Roman uh, prior to Hispania. But, mm, yeah. Right. But also in, in that case, you know, they would have needed a common language. So they would have been speaking Latin, of course, which is closely related to the Sabellic languages. That's the other thing is um, part of the reason why it was so easy for Latin to be adopted in, in this region is, is that these languages were incredibly closely related. They weren't quite mutually intelligible in the case of uh, Sabellic and Latin, it seems, but they were like close, you know, they were, they were very closely related. Um, so it's, it makes perfect sense that under a Roman administration, if these are Roman soldiers, they would be using Latin given that even if they, even if they were speakers of other uh, Italic languages, but then the other thing is, is basically, what this demonstrates to me, this this question of, well, how did how did Latin become imposed, but you know, before the advent of public education or television or or anything like that, um, it's sort of demonstrative to me of another sort of fatal flaw of uh, a work like this which is a complete lack of knowledge outside of um, the Mediterranean context, which is that this is the major example of that kind of thing happening in the Mediterranean. Um, and you're asking, how could this possibly be true? And you're just failing to look at um, 
all of world history, basically. So there's so, so, so many examples throughout the world of societies before the advent of uh, public education or television imposing their language over vast, vast swaths of land um, in which, you know, genetically, linguistically, culturally diverse people become assimilated linguistically. Right. Um, so one example would be um, uh, Hungarian, mm. right? So um, modern Hungarians genetically don't have that much in common with speakers of other Uralic languages that are spoken in like Siberia, mm. right? Um, but they speak Hungarian, which was above, a... I think, mercenaries or mercenary type uh, group, which was invited by mm. who was it to come in to help bring peace to the land, and then they ended up just saying, "Hey, we now um... are in control," <laughs> something like that, right? Right. Which a history. I mean, had... I... No, no, sure. Sorry. You know, uh, yeah. another example would be the Bantu expansion, right? Ooh, We're well, basically I have no knowledge of the Bantu expansion. Well, so Bantu languages are now spoken all across Sub-Saharan Africa. They used to be spoken in just a small area, maybe 3,000 years ago, um, mm -hmm. probably in West Africa, I believe. But they exploded across Africa, um, replacing many, many, many different, you know, and there's still remnants of the pre-Bantu languages that are spoken in different areas. Um, but there was a very clear rapid expansion that came with certain technological developments. Like I believe iron, iron working was a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So this has just happened over and over and over and over again right. throughout history. Well, and it's it's such an uh, interesting, important thing because I had um, I received uh, an email some months ago from uh, a um, native um, Romanian mathematician who now lives in uh, Milan, as I recall, speaks uh, perfect sounding Italian, wow. as far as I, I could tell. And I talked to her on the phone uh, too because she wanted to tell me about a similar idea because she had done research. That's I know there are some. Um, students of linguistics, um, that is to say students in the sense that we are students, the people who are studying, not like literal children, um, people who are uh, studying linguistics in Romania who are looking at, you know, non-Roman, non-Latin origins of at least some aspects of Romanian, which I think is a fascinating topic. Like, it's also fascinating to discuss this in general, how, like, because we can tell, like, you and I, we know Latin and Romance well enough to say that the answer to this question is Romance is from Latin from different kinds, different registers of Latin from different periods. And it's and it's it's like generically, you can just say that really simply. And it's true. Um, mm -hmm. And there are variations that happen along the way. There's transformations and dialectical var varieties. But we are also just inherently curious, you and I, in what non uh, Latin things got into uh, romance and into the modern uh, romance languages. Maybe they came from Greek, maybe they came from Iberian, maybe they came from Celtic, but what's so fascinating, or from, in the case of Romania, from Dacian um, or Thracian. And what's so fascinating uh, about this is just how little there is. And when people see that, they think that's impossible. How could, does that mean that the Romans had committed genocide in Dacia, for example, to bring, bring up the Romanian example? And it's not the case. No, I mean, they, I think they won quite a few battles, but they didn't, you know, kill most of the population to my knowledge but what happens invariably in these situations is when because we're because he brings up the question of power and and in my own research i cannot avoid this same conclusion that and power what does that mean economic power for you personally you can you learn the language you get far in life and you make sure your children learn that language which will help them you know everybody in the world now is learning english and we thank all of our non-native english speakers who are out there we see you italians and romanians and uh brazilians spaniards every uh kind of person's out there just great thank you so much for for listening to us speak in this world uh language that you've all had to learn um we appreciate that uh very much that all the effort that you had to go to because and why did you do that because you know that it brings um a certain value and, and importance um, and then when you have this kind of situation where the only, like I was kind of talking about it metaphorically, the only show in town, the only, you know, really incredibly advanced civilization is a Latin speaking one. Every merchant in that area is going to start to speak that language and probably make sure their children learn it. And then if there evaporates the need for the substrate language, it won't pass on hardly anything to the descendant uh, language. So there won't even be a Creole that occurs. Right. And this is what seems to happen with the case of Romanian 
where um, we're not sure if those were people who are north of the Danube or south who ended up populating what we think of as uh, what we know as the borders of Romania today. <clears throat> today, but um, the point is, and people like I was in, in disbelief too when I first started studying Romanian a few years ago and looking. Wow, this is so cool. How could it be so similar to Italian? You know, how could it be so much like every other Romance language? And she brings this up too. Now, her conclusion is that because this is this is for her, these are her for her facts, and they're of course not true. For her, it's fact that you must learn your language from your mother or your parent. Hence, madre lingua, you know, your mother tongue, which is not true as we discussed. It's predominantly the language we get. Um, after the first few years of life. And in fact, most of our language acquisition is from peers. So it's a mix, mm -hmm. technically, therefore, of all these other parents in the community and then television and so forth, whatever we have in, in the modern age. Mm -hmm. And so it, it just it shows the um, the importance and the mm -hmm. power, even through just a few hundred years of the Roman Empire's uh, influence north of the Danube, assuming that's where the Romanian language is from and not from somewhere south of the Danube. Yeah. Romans had an influence for much longer. Um, mm -hmm that uh, it just shows how people will readily adopt something, even though um, most Romanians show very little italic genetic um, ancestry. And, you know, for my part, genetically, I'm mostly Irish and Italian. How come I speak a Germanic language, which is, you know, and like, how does that, that happen? And for, you know, we could talk about obviously about those histories and that's, that's how that goes. Right. Well, and, you know, in, in the case of, uh, of my family, right. Uh, my great grandparents decided um, that uh, you know they didn't want to pass on Sicilian, which was their native language. Um, and so my my grandmother had a sort of passive knowledge of the language, but uh, my mother doesn't speak it at all. Um, and I don't speak Sicilian at all other than what little I've I've sort of gleaned um, from my own interest. And that had nothing to do with the television or the public schooling. It was a conscious decision um, to assimilate, right? To assimilate to the language of power. I personally think it was the wrong decision. I regret that decision. Okay. I wish that it hadn't been made. I, I would love to have been able to speak Sicilian as a native language. But uh, it was made by my uh, father's parents, my grandparents, not to teach their children uh, Italian. Um, and so right. I was able to pick it up later in Rome, and and I, however, um, was uh, as a as a child, I I had consciously decided, oh, I love hearing my dad speak Italian. I want to learn it too. Um, and that was a decision I made. It's a decision my sister didn't make, and that that worked uh, for her. She didn't want to. I but I had to really you know work at it. I'd really pursue it actively to get there. It couldn't it didn't just happen by being talked at me. Uh, um, you have to have to you know really just choose to immerse yourself and to pursue it. Especially when you're in a predominantly English uh, environment like like we are. Do Should we? Um, by the way, I'm I'm good, but uh, but I thought maybe before we go into the second chapter, if if maybe now would be a good time if anyone wants to ask questions or. I'll, I'll or... let you uh, take the the con here. I'll be back in about three minutes. Oh okay. okay. Um cool yeah okay I'll, I'll... oh god uh hi guys well if if anyone has any questions I've got. Uh, I've got the chat up, um, so we can we can talk about whatever, or we can just sit and wait for Luke to come back. I know I'm no replacement for uh, for him, so. <laughs> can you be on the next podcast, White Dragon? I don't know. You'll have to ask Luke. I'm not in charge of these things. <laughs> What's the topic of the next chapter? Um, well, the next chapter, yes. So the next chapter is uh, titled, well, the beginning of the next chapter is titled The Sluggishness of Linguistic Change. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about what it sounds like. Uh, do you, are you talking to me? Uh, I do have a YouTube channel. It's called Paleogloss. Here, I'll type something. But uh, there's not much stuff on it right now um, because um, mostly I just have some recordings of, of ancient uh, languages, short recordings. I plan to do more stuff in the future. Um, are Italian regional languages too endangered? Many Italian regional languages are endangered, yes. Mm. Uh, 
nada. Yes. No lo just say you awkwardly. Yeah. Are you a Spaniard? No, no soy español, soy estadounidense. Pero hace unos años viví en España, entonces por eso hablo español. Mm. Um, uh, did she talk about the Iberian verbal system? Oh, well, I think we get into that. Yeah, we will. It's fascinating. Um, uh, is Portuguese, Spanish, English, and dialects of the same language? Quick, well, that, that's a political discussion that I don't want to wade into. Yeah, I mean, I, you know. I made a video about that dialect versus language mm -hmm. and the, mm -hmm. the uh, definitions. It's according to what you define, uh, essentially. Yeah. And it's, it's not, it's according to what a group, like, like if you ascribe to, I don't know, the University of, uh, we'll just name one, Oxford or wherever. Valencia, I don't know, you name a, a university, they can write they can write a policy or something that says, this is what our definition is of a language or a dialect, and then you can choose to subscribe to that definition or not. Um, for practical purposes, people usually throw around the term language or dialect in order to promote or to reduce the influence of those language varieties. And uh, in my video there, I talked about um, um, by the way, with a lot of discussions with Raf privately, he helped me formulate a lot of those things that I said in that video. So he's 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 behind a lot of the stuff I, I do. Raf's fantastic. Super helpful for me. Um, as uh, like Scotts, for example, and Scotts is this great example. Had a great interview as well uh, with um, Colin Wilson too, which you should check out. Where we talk about this, you know, is Scots a language or a dialect? And the in the case of um, the UK and with Scotland, usually people end up calling Scots slang or dialect as a way to say, oh, it's not something worth studying or speaking. You should learn proper standard English, assuming that Scots is a bastardized version of standard English, which it's not. It's a co-evolved thing. So, you know, there's all kinds of motivations. And um, I, I love Scots and I seek to promote it as a lang language that people can actually study because I want to learn it and I need more content. So Scots out there, please make more. Um, so the question of dialect versus language is, um, Inherently political, um, but go ahead, Raf. What do you want to? What else? Uh, you're doing great with the question answering, questioning. Oh, should I? Should I? Uh, should I keep going? Um, yeah, please. You're doing great. Oh God. Okay. Uh, what are the? Okay. What are some of the most common features, positive and negative, of Latin pronunciation in Spanish-speaking countries? Oh, we think about that all the time. <laughs> well, I'm not retracted. S. I don't. I don't quite understand the the question. Well, oh, I think is that? that that's what I assume. Like, what, what native, uh, what what phonotactic, um, typical things of mm -hmm. people from Spain? What do they do that sounds good in Latin? For I assume for a reconstruct mm -hmm. ancient pronunciation of Latin. Well, that, that that's certainly an interesting question. If that's what you meant, uh, yeah. I mean, one thing that's certainly sort of authentically uh, ancient is the pronunciation of the S in Iberian uh, Spanish and also some uh, some Andean dialects of Spanish like in Peru I think some speakers okay. have this maybe yeah it's quite interesting so um so for instance uh, the way that uh, you know in Spanish you would say um, like todos todos los right this s sh sound that's almost halfway between a s like in English and a sh um, almost halfway between an English S and SH sound. Uh, this is almost certainly the sound that you would have heard in, in Latin. Um, obviously, it's not a very important distinction, but it's just kind of a cool feature that still exists in uh, Iberian Spanish and uh, Sardinian. And modern Greek, which... Uh, and modern Greek, aftos. <laughs> well, we're, of course, known as yeah. for our uh, duo in the sense of doing uh, the talking during video about the Lucian pronunciation mm -hmm. of ancient Greek, which is essentially... We didn't really inv we didn't invent anything. We're just saying, hey, here's what the phonology is during the transitional period of Greek between the classical, ancient, and the more modern or Byzantine language. And how do you know about retractive S being the Latin authentic one? So I should do a video about, or we should do a video about this. Uh, do it. That could be interesting. There it is. It's a video. Um, I can't give you any papers off the top of my head that specifically discuss this because it's sort of not a juicy enough topic that anyone has like written a whole bunch about it, but but there is material about it, particularly in the medieval context that sort of discusses um, 
uh, how that sound would have come from the Latin sound. Uh, I, I don't think we have time to get into all the evidence. I could rant about why we know that's true for our ages, but no. it's helpful. Uh, I think it's, yes, it adds authenticity uh, to a greater degree, in my opinion. I do it with increasing consistency through the years, but since you taught me about it, um, too much. yeah, I was, I was, I was exaggerating it a bit. Uh, kata what? But, uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. Look, were you saying something? Uh, no, no. I was. I was just talking. Talking about. I'm. Just, I'm uh, just preparing uh. my next cat meme. You know, gotta. <laughs> um, let's see. Is there anything else that we should? Uh, oh, maybe not uh, for right now. But uh, I'm so great to have the interaction from all you great people out there. Thanks so much. And if we don't, if you end up thinking of something later, feel free to ask it in the comments, and we'd be delighted to to uh, get back to and any of your. Mm comments or questions. We're always fascinated by by this. And yeah. as awful as this book is, which is, of course, our opinion uh, of it, in case you were wondering, um, it gives us an opportunity to talk a lot about these things and maybe give people uh, some stuff they might want to go into for their own personal research. So I think it's a very valuable, this is a valuable experience, which is what I was hoping for. So I'm happy. Yeah. Uh, shall we begin chapter two? Chapter two. Go ahead. Okay. Uh I'm reading. Okay. Uh, I keep dropping my phone. <laughs> the sluggishness of linguistic change. If the Romans did not speak Latin, how is it possible to assert that the inhabitants of our lands rep the replaced their mother tongue with a language they did not understand, or worse, that they began to speak it so badly that they lost their grammatical cases and genders along the way? That's not how that happens, guys. That's not how you lose cases. But uh, how could this new language have been so different from Latin? that it would not be understood. And for all these changes to occur in 400 years only, well, I don't know about that time frame. it's longer than that, but uh, there are too many unanswered questions. This is because the explanations given to justify the linguistic changes from Latin are not satisfactory. They are, you just are not aware of them. Uh, <laughs> in fact, they do not answer the questions raised here. Well, we'll, we'll see about that. We'll see if we can answer the questions. Um, let us first look at what has happened with other Mediterranean languages. For instance, if we compare ancient and modern Greek, or old and modern Turkish, or old and modern Arabic, there's not as much distance as between Latin and the so-called Romance languages. Well, if we look at vernacular, uh, if we look at vernacular Arabic, and uh, if we look at vernacular Arabic and Quranic Arabic, which, by the way, is from significantly later then there is actually a very significant difference even so. And if you look at the Arabic that we see in, in some limited inscriptions of like 2000 years ago, it's very, very different from the Arabic that is spoken today in you know, the Levant or Egypt or, or wherever, or Morocco. Um, so this is wrong. And, and you know, in the case of Greek, if you're comparing you know, classical Attic to Tsakonika, right? There's a huge difference. Um, it's only when we're talking about these sort of intentionally conservative forms like Gavarevusha and even um, Demotic Greek that's sort of been Gavarevusized. I, yeah, I, I would it. call it, uh, <laughs> I think, well, there's a term that Horrocks used, which is just um, common standard modern Greek, which is this the combination, because Gavarevusha wasn't eliminated suddenly. It, it kind of persists as this formalized echo and so people mix katharevus now and emotiki all the time. It's pretty cool. Well, and and even vernacular Greek, um, even like just everyday spoken Greek has been influenced by katharevusa. So I, I believe uh, like participles were completely reintroduced into the language. They had been totally lost, but were, yeah. you know, now they're totally part of, of standard spoken Greek. Um, so if the distance between modern and ancient languages is so small, <laughs> Uh, it means that the processes, linguistic transformations within the same language do not occur from one generation to the next by spontaneous mutation. Well, they do, but, uh, but okay. We were referring specifically to internal changes, that is, to the evolution of a language from within, using internal resources rather than external changes, that is, based on influences from outside. And this aspect is essential. Languages evolve internally at a slow or very slow pace, as we shall see immediately below. Only abrupt external changes justify a rapid change, such as a contact that compels two different cultures to communicate, that is, due to conquest or trade. 
As a result of the sum of two very distant languages, a new language can emerge that blends elements from both languages, as happened with Creole. I don't know what Creole you're talking about. There are many Creoles, but mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, that's a good question, especially as a Spanish speaker. I've, if you were an English speaker, we'd assume the Creole uh, and like um, the uh, French um, uh, in English Creole, partially French Creole, right? Of the of Louisiana, for example. So there's some English. Or Haitian Creole, which Haitian is French. 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 Yeah, yeah, is another yeah. good example. But there's many, there's many Creoles throughout history. Basque, Icelandic, Creole. Um, with, and since she doesn't actually define the terms, uh, I love how these are such interesting topics. What is a pigeon, sir, and what is a creole? Yes, okay. Um, a pigeon is a non-natively spoken form of communication that develops in a situation of linguistic contact. So two distinct groups of people come together. For instance, uh, Basque-speaking and Icelandic-speaking fishermen this is a real thing. Look up Basque Icelandic pigeon if, if you guys are curious. It's, it's hilarious. Um, uh, interact with each other, and a pigeon is formed, which is basically just sort of a, a mixture of elements of both languages that doesn't have the full complexity of normal human language. It's just used for basic communication by non native speakers. But once this becomes acquired by a generation of na native speakers, which happens in certain contexts where contact is prolonged over a very long period of time, as in Haiti. Um, oh, hey, hey, dude. <laughs> um, in that context, um, something interesting happens, which is that through the process of being natively acquired by a child, it gains all of the complexity that any other human language would have. And, and this is actually a big portion of evidence um, for the notion that language is an innate uh, capability of, of human brains, right? Um, which we won't get into, even though it's fascinating. But so basically, Haitian Creole, although a French speaker uh, might disdain it because maybe it sounds, uh, you know. Like bad French, right? Like bad French to them. Um, it's not, it's a completely functional human language that you can communicate any concept in just like you could in any other human language. Um, and it gained that complexity by being acquired as a native speaker by generations of children. Right. Um, I think it's so cool. Yeah. So pigeon, when people try so, to communicate, and, yeah. then, and then the Creole is a sentence of that mix of two linguistic varieties. Right. Yeah. Super cool. So it's, it's true that you so you can't exactly call this linguistic change, right? Because really what this is, is the creation of a new linguistic system or a new language, right? Um, however, it's true that this process sort of happens more quickly or can happen more quickly than internal change of a language tends to happen. Um, but that says nothing about whether or not the time frame that's proposed in the case of Latin is sort of absurdly quick. And the answer is it's really not, right? Um, it's actually very much standard. If you look across human language, there are examples that change slower over a given period of time, and there are examples that have changed more quickly. Um, right. Uh, so, so yeah, this is sort of a, a mix of, of slight misinformation and, and just total yeah. lies. My interpretation uh, through this chapter is she, she mixes ideas without actually sticking to them, like, oh, it's a Creole, hmm. that which is what becomes Spanish and Catalan. And then later she seems to go back on that and say, no, it's almost entirely from a different language called Iberian and so forth. Right. It seems, you know. Right. Um, anyway, I interrupted you. Uh, continue. Well, no. I mean, we should, we should uh, you know, stop to discuss whatever we want well, to discuss at any point. But... Uh, <laughs> so, uh, um, only abrupt external changes justify rapid change, not true, such as contact that compels blah, blah, blah. As a result of the sum of two very distant languages, a new language can emerge, right? It blends elements from both languages, as happened with Creole. Right? But even in such exceptional situations, we must specify what part of each language is present in the new language and how the transmission occurs between generations. Not necessarily because new features will develop completely spontaneously through the acquisition as a native language, right? Mm -hmm. So not every feature is straight from either of the parent languages in the, in the case of creolization. But linguists do not agree on this point. 
Although in Creole, there may be an important lexicon transfer, the syntax must clearly belong to one of the two languages. That's not true. It will be heavily influenced by probably one of the two languages, but um, yes. This is pretty much what we were just talking about. Yeah. Uh, and this is the thing about mother to child. So typically, language transmission occurs from mother to child in fully developed form. I wonder if this that was correct. literally at the page turn to make sure we didn't notice it because of its absurdity. Mm. But I noticed. <laughs> That's it really stood uh, out. Mother, yeah, mother to child. Yeah. yeah. Languages do not lose their form or become destructured syntactically. So this is back to the notion of, of degeneration, right? This notion that the loss of, of something like cases is destructuring, um, which is just, it's not, it's not how this works. It's not how anything works. Um, they maintain their rules and nobody stops conjugating verbs. <laughs> Languages do not lose their form or become destructive. They maintain their rules, and nobody stops conjugating verbs. Oh man! Okay. I know, right? Um. So, no, nobody just spontaneously stops conjugating verbs. Although it's funny that this is the example that's brought up because the Romance verb system is the most conservative uh, part of the morphology in regards to Latin. Right? Yeah. It's actually hugely corresponds with the Latin verb conjugation system. Extremely. Uh, extremely, especially when you look across romance. Yeah. But um, uh, so, but the, the point is that verb conjugation observably can disappear without any kind of external influence through usually sound shifts or a mixture of sound shifts and analogy. So we already gave the example of um, Norwegian versus Icelandic or Swedish versus Icelandic, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where in Icelandic you have um, uh, so so um, in Old Norse, right? Uh, uh, you have different forms of every single person and number for like the verb to be, right? So you have ek em, like I am, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thu ert, right? You are, um, han ert, like he is, right? Um, uh, and in Icelandic, almost all of these are preserved, except I believe uh, the first person singular. Uh, so in Icelandic, you would say yek ert, right? I is basically, but then all the other forms are preserved. So the only thing that got lost is is that form. And then, meanwhile, in uh, in the continental. Um, Scandinavian languages, they've replaced all of those forms with is, the equivalent of, of is, which is et, right? So is, 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 is. Um, and we literally observe this like happening gradually over time in the in the corpus through internal changes. Right. So which is so interesting too. And a lot of people have uh and the Horic book is really interesting too, because it discusses the phenomenon of changing of uh changes from ancient into Byzantine and modern Greek. And they say, oh, well, it was influenced from Latin or it was influenced from Greek, but maybe it wasn't. It could have been from language contact, a kind of giant Mediterranean Sprachbund, or it could have been not at all. It could have been just uh, because um, that was their internal variation. Because a lot of a lot of things, for example, in the uh, the Koine of the Bible are like blamed on being Semitic uh, because they were maybe not even uh, first generation speakers of Greek or they were somehow imitating Aramaic in some ways. And yet you see prior to contact um, or prior to there being you know significant speakers of also Aramaic writing in Greek that they're doing the same kinds of things that occur so um, there's a lot of so we, while it's possible there's an influence there it's not necessary while it's possible that Greek is the origin of the change of what to va ultimately in um, in romance it's not necessarily from Greek nor is it necessarily from Latin into Greek it could have both been spontaneously and done separately I mean, I tend to think there are those influences, but yeah. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, where were you? I should take over for you because you've been reading so much. I lost where we were. Though. Go for it. Um, Long paragraphs. It's like reading a Thanos. Eh? Anyone out there gets that joke? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> changes you occur internally. Um, here, I'll finish this paragraph, and then and then you start the next paragraph. Mm -hmm. um, 
In situations of, uh, nobody stops conjugating verbs. In situations of extreme diglossy, especially in adulthood, a speaker can transfer elements from the dominant language and even change one mother tongue for another due to the need to communicate with speakers of the other language. These changes usually occur externally by imposition of a dominant language and require support from a rapid process to be able to compete with mothers passing on language to their children. Just not just mothers, but anyway, uh, whatever it may be in a perfectly structured way. All this confirms the view of Jesus Tuson who states that a language only disappears when its speakers stop using it and replace it with that of the ruling class. There are no linguistic reasons for this, but only political, social, or cultural reasons. That is true, um, but we're not talking about a language disappearing. We're talking about a language evolving, right? Um, exactly, because Latin you know, it didn't disappear in any, in any of the various senses. It didn't disappear, for sure. Hmm. Contrary to external change, internal change is slow or very slow. Oh, oh, look, a citation. Uh, Mark, um, Agile, Pagel, Agile. A professor of evolutionary biology. Oh, how convenient. There's a link to a publication <laughs> and it's a long URL. I'm so looking forward to typing that in. <laughs> it literally says link to the publication. Oh, yeah. uh, a professor of evolutionary biology and his colleagues at the University of Reading, of Reading, University of Reading? Reading. Oh, Reading. I was like, whoa, I should know that because there's a Reading, Pennsylvania down the road. So, oops. University of Re like it sounded like University of, I don't know, something silly. Have the Brits are going to come for you. Be careful. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Reading. There's a Reading, Pennsylvania. I'm silly. It's my fault. Hmm. See, I should get up the stupid cat face again just for me. We hmm. uh, have built a statistical model to show that some words of European languages have remained in use for more than fifteen thousand years. Oh, that's cool. Fifteen thousand. Isn't that too long? Isn't that like way longer than Proto-Indo-European's lifetime? I guess they'd be Etruscan. Oh, I remember this. Guys, studies, linguistic studies done by non-linguists are almost universally um, of dubious quality. So don't, uh, <laughs> don't, when you see studies done like this and you see that there's like no linguists involved, then take it with a grain of salt or like go see what the linguists have to say about it. Cause usually they'll be able to explain in, in pretty comprehensible terms why. Uh... Anyway, yeah. yeah. Um, oh, supposedly there's a statistical model to show that some words from European languages have remained in use for more than 15,000 years. There's no way to know what words have been in place in European languages for more than 15,000 years. Because most European languages are, are Indo-European exactly which um, came into Europe 5,000 years ago from the Central Asian steppe. So don't know about that one, but mm. anyway. Um. Yeah, so they're called proto-words and are quite often the most common words. They have been transmitted with such fidelity that we can recognize them. This allows researchers to work on a hypothetical reconstruction of this alleged super language family that would be the common ancestor of seven language families and some 700 modern languages equivalent to 10% of the languages spoken in the world. Is this talking about Indo-European? Yes. Hmm. Uh, this new statistical model is really fascinating. For although we are aware that we cannot just rely on figures when investigating linguistic change, it does provide a map of what might have happened. For example, it allows us to determine that only 50% of words change or are replaced in a period ranging from 2,000 to 4,000 year, 4, years, uh, while others withstand change for 15,000 years or more. Which words are most commonly maintained? Words used in everyday speech with a frequency of more than one. Oh, she, I'm sorry. She wasn't going to ask another interesting rhetorical question. She was going to answer it for us like she had the answer, which, by the way, we don't actually <laughs> have. Um, words used in everyday speech with a frequency of more than once per thousand words can be resistant to change. But I mean, if there's all kinds of factors that go into it. They could be the commonest words that don't change, and they could also be the commonest words that do change. Um, uh, Jackson Crawford has a great video about that exact thing, actually. And uh, which are they? Numbers, pronouns, and adverbs, but also very commonly used words like man, fire, mother. Researchers even show complete sentences that we can still understand uh, today. And then there's a chart here. Tell us about, what do you think about the chart? I'll just kind of hold it up for people to look at. If they want to, you know. Yeah, so I mean, this is basically just listing some words that are present in um multiple branches of Indo-European. So for instance, the word thou, which is the 
which is um, cute because original we, second person not even in English, but I I liked it. <laughs> but you know, thou or or you could use Icelandic thu, right? Mm -hmm. um, which is very close to the Proto-Germanic, which was thu, um, which is of course cognate to Italian or Latin thu, um, which is present in it, it is present in in all the branches of Indo-European, right? So uh, mm -hmm. so there's a there's a Greek cognate, so su um, is actually cognate to this same word. And it's present in Indo-Iranian, so uh, you find the same thing in, in Hindi. non Right, which is uh, about the level of uh, yeah, yeah. of wisdom kind of required <laughs> to go at this book with. I think you're Leon. It's very insightful. Yes. <laughs> <My favorite. laughs> um, um, oh, okay, we'll go on that. I don't know about this figure of it allows us to determine that only 50% of words change or are replaced in a period ranging from 2,000 to 4,000 years. It's so not, this is just wrong because... Good. There's a great Most uh, words sorry, yeah. talk about um, uh, native lang who talks about in, on like a two part of video this exact question of what is the speed of language change and people a couple hundred years ago oh they think they knew exactly how much because what languages did they study and European languages and the European ones in particular so all, show all kinds of interesting and rapid changes while you know you can see other languages which have very slow uh, change it's not you know, there's no definable like these are the exact words that change and how many and frequently. I mean, it's really interesting. It should be studied, but saying something like it is 2000 to 4,000 years and so forth. Um, uh, and there to therefore base your theory on it. It's, it's, it's no, it's nonsense. It's, it's, right. it's a hypothesis, which has yet to be proven. Let's say. It's completely. Yeah. I mean, exactly. It's uh, well, and especially, you know, so it is true that certain classes of words, tend to um, be more resistant to change. So there's a reason why, you know, words like mother versus mater, um, you know, those are present all throughout Indo-European and lots of different branches, lots of living languages preserve descendants of that original Proto-Indo-European word, or thou, you know, thu, uh, tu, right? That tends to not change. And those incredibly common words um, are often resistant to change, um, but you can't make a generalization like this about the whole lexicon. Um, Definitely not. Plus, it, it also, I don't really know what they what she means by change, because all of the words change, um, at least in terms of their, um, at least in terms of their pronunciation, right? Because languages are, are constantly undergoing sound shifts that affect the entire lexicon, right? So is thou not changed versus uh, su in Greek? I mean, obviously those are phonologically very different at this point. And Shakespearean. And come from the same thing, right? Yeah, you know? huge change. Um, yeah. Or, you know, in modern Greek it's esi, right? So in, in, in modern Greek you have esi, and in English you have thou, those are the same word, but they've gone through phonological process after phonological process. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. this is dubious. Uh, in the previous table, we can see that the most frequently used word is this, followed by not and that, included in the grammatical category of adjectives. And I, wanna, I don't want to talk about that thing anymore. Although it may <laughs> seem that we have moved away from the subject. Um, uh, it is not so. Good. We are trying to demonstrate that internal linguistic changes take not centuries, but millennia to occur. Again, no, because we have direct attestation of that at rapid and slow rates. Well, is, um, right? if it, it takes, I mean, what does this even mean? It's a, it's, a, it's a gradual process. So it's not that it takes X amount of time to occur. It's that it is happening over time. And after a certain amount of time has passed, you can measure a certain amount of change that has happened. But you can't just say it takes millennia for internal change to occur. That doesn't make any sense. Right. And and this next bit is completely on. So it says it's clear that words evolve, as we can see from Latin pater and English father, um, establishing a regular. So so yes, um, we establish the relation of languages through regular sound correspondences. Um, 
I'm not sure what that's supposed to have to do with with this argument. Well, let's find, well let's go on. An interesting example of the slowness of linguistic change is the fact that English, Portuguese, and Spanish, spoken by Europeans traveling to the Americas in the 15th century, are not so far removed today from the languages of the old continent. In fact, Americans speak English, Brazilians speak Portuguese, Portuguese, and Latin Americans speak Spanish. In 500 years, there has uh, been very little evolution in these languages, and speakers on both sides of the Atlantic can easily communicate. Number one, it is, of course, interesting how similar the language of 500 years ago is. But on the other hand, if you actually knew anything that I'm sorry, if you knew any that, that much about the details of say 1600s English and how much it differs in phonology, like I can try to affect, um, uh, uh, I, I can try to do a sort of Shakespearean voice, you know, it sounds different and weird and cool. And it's not, you know, it's not how hardly anyone pronounces English today. You know, there's- all And the grammar is different and the vocabulary is different. I mean, Shakespeare is, you know, there are passages of Shakespeare that are pretty opaque to modern English speakers without training. Right, utterly. Um, yeah. Utterly, so, yeah. And the same the same can be said of Spanish, right? So, so there are significant, um, grammatical changes, phonological changes, um, lexical changes that have happened, even though Spanish is, has not changed all that much uh, in the past 500 years, um, we can point out to all sorts of, of shifts that have occurred in that time. But the the point is, is uh, you're comparing 500 years of change in an era um, with much um, greater ease of communication um, and much greater ability to sort of enforce a standardized form of a language. You're comparing 500 years in that context to closer to a thousand years, right? Because the, the real emergence of, uh, of, of romance is about a thousand years after, um, after the uh, standardization of Latin, right? Latin is, is standardized in the first century BC. Um, the oaths of Strasbourg are in the ninth century, yeah. and the oaths of Strasbourg are, are incredibly conservative. I mean, they preserve all sorts of features that are lost in, in later Romance languages. Exactly. Um, there's no articles, for instance, in that form of Old French. Um, it still has a semi-intact case system. Um, it still has an, an incredibly um, conservative verb system, although it's phonologically evolved a whole lot. So. Um, this notion is just fundamentally wrong, and 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 it ties. You know, I remember at one point she mentions, you know, how could it have turned into a completely different language in four hundred years? Well, it didn't. At right. no point in this in in any of this time can you point to a four hundred year gap where it became mutually intelligible, unintelligible with the language that was spoken four hundred years earlier, right? Throughout this whole period, if you took a speaker from one point and then a speaker from another point four hundred years later. They would be able to communicate with each other pretty effectively, um, and they did. And that's and the they did. And the, the com that's so that's an interesting, it's such an interesting thing to talk about. Well, they really, really, I mean, they didn't time travel, but right. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm saying regionally, um, yeah. and also the um, time travel through you know reading written documents uh, from different periods yeah. and how you know. Tell, but yeah, of course, and this is sort of how the, the problem why I found it so difficult to get through the book on my own without Raf's help today, is because. So many things are set up as like these things are obvious to the author, and they probably should be obvious, obvious to you. But you don't know. Okay, now I, the author, have informed you. Now let's move on to something else. But the whole foundation is just sand. It's um, it's uh, filled with um, air pockets. <laughs> um, let's see. And then I'll go on this last paragraph here. All the present forms of Spanish stem from the early modern or classical Spanish. A footnote nine. A language from a period of Spanish history that extends from the end of the 15th century to the end of the 18th. This language is characterized in linguistics terms by a series of phonetic and grammatical developments that led to the transformation of medieval into modern Spanish. Okay. Uh, the changes from classical to modern Spanish are in the prosody, accent, intonation, loss of voiced sibilance, in the, which is true. And we want to say some, when she gets things right, we want to mention that they're correct, right? And that's correct. In the fixation of clitic pronouns and in the... Not this, but yes. <laughs> well, there's many other phonological shifts that happened oh, in that period. Yeah, you know them in detail. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know some of those are on the right track. In the fixation of clitic pronouns and the equalization of composite forms of unergative, 
and unaccusative verbs, which is interesting. Could you tell us about ergative? And um, you know, let's not let's not get into let's okay. not get into case okay. alignment systems, but <laughs> uh, that, that'll take too long. <laughs> um, there are, uh, has also been the incorporation of lexical loans and, to a lesser extent, grammatical loans. Other phenomena are the uh, voceo, the use of uh, vos as the second person singular pronoun, uses of gerund, functional loss of the subjunctive, alterations of unstressed pronouns, anomalous uses of the verbs ser and haber as well as local peculiarities and the verbal system. All this indicates that languages evolve slowly enough so that in 500 years, the divergences between varieties are evident in phonetics and lexicon, but less so in syntax, making it difficult to even refer to them as dialects. They are all different ways of speaking the Spanish language. The last sentence is good thing to say. Yes, they're all just ways of speaking the Spanish language. But the point she's trying to make, which is of course specious, is that there is a, Relative, there is, there is, this is the demonstrated change of Spanish in 500 years. And hey, therefore, that's the exact analogous thing to Latin over 500 years. And it's not, no. <laughs> it's like, why would you can compare them and you can wonder at their similarities or differences. Um, but to say that, therefore, a theory of linguistic change of Latin is somehow false is, I don't know, it doesn't work for me, but. Well, and it's it's also, I mean, it's it's flawed in more ways than just that, right? Because, um, you know, there's also the issue that in many parts of uh, of Latin America, it's not it's not as though Spanish immediately became the dominant language 500 years ago, right? Um, it took significantly longer than that, and there's significant continued um, migration from uh, from Spain. So, like for instance, um, I know that in some parts of uh, of the Andes. So, so there's no dialect of uh, there's no dialect of of um, Latin American Spanish that distinguishes um, the two sibilant phonemes, or historically they were both sibilants of th and s, right? That you have in in sort of standard European Spanish. So the difference between casar and cazar, um, there's no dis there's no such distinction. However, uh, in some dialects in the Andes. Um, there are speakers who exclusively in the words, uh, in words like uh, trece um, and like some numbers, um, have the th sound. Hmm. And this is literally just because of late immigration from Spain. Oh. Um, and so the point is that throughout this period, there was extensive um, contact. Yeah. Right. Um, and contrast that with, uh, with Rome which had significantly lower ability to actually, um, uh, significantly lower ability um, in terms of like communication over vast distances than, you know, 18th or 19th century Spanish or even 17th century Spanish speakers. Um, and also the fact that in later periods, um, the sort of administration over the whole region completely collapsed, right? Um, so it, it's, uh, yeah, it's sort of a silly comparison. Mm. You're, you're comparing a shorter period of time in a more recent period. Um, and you're sort of ignoring once again, the, the fact that, uh, well, I think she's also sort of exaggerating the degree to which Spanish is, is conservative. Um, and you're also ignoring the fact that um, there's a range in terms of how quickly languages do or don't change over, over a given period of time. And a lot of this is motivated by, um, so, so I guess, I don't know how much we want to get into, um, I don't know how much, we, well, maybe we should get to the part where she actually starts talking a little bit about Latin morphology. Absolutely. Yeah. Cause the so next part. I keep wanting to bring it up, but then like, maybe we can, Maybe we can skip this part about Catalan because she's just going on and on and on yeah, about uh, on and on about the same thing, which is well, she keeps bringing up examples for a, a theory which is is essentially incorrect. Oh, I underlined something. Oh, yeah, this is uh, two point two. The way we think, the way we talk. Uh, oh, yeah, this is all. This is this is pretty. This is this is a bit of a howler. Um, in fact, the term howler. <laughs> that's what came. As far as like howling at the incorrectness is what 
uh, came to mind frequently, I think, here. In order to understand this point, we can reflect on what happens with biological diversity. Species become genetically different in response to geographic separation. For change to take place in ecosystems, there must be a climate change, a catastrophe, or a habitat invasion by destabilizing agents. These are all external causes which produce more or less rapid changes, but they do not create hybrids. Oh, okay. Hybrids, like the cross between a, a mare and a donkey, produce sterile animals such as a mule. Like, this is where it goes off the rails for me, because they're like, number one, comparing biology to languages is useful insofar as it helps describe a metaphor, but it's not. Wait, sorry, where, where was this? This is the bottom of page 18. <laughs> It's useful to talk about biology insofar as it actually is useful as a metaphor to help us comprehend what's going on in languages, but it's not to be taken literally, and that's what she's doing, which is ridiculous. Which, wait, sorry. Middle of the where? bottom of, uh, we're at 2.2, the way we think, the way we talk. Um, it says, but they do not create hybrids. Hybrids, like the cross between a mare and a donkey, produce sterile animals such as a buell. Okay. Um, got you are there with me. What is this even trying to say? I know, what's, I, know, I, I kind of enjoy this in a, in a twisted way. Um, so are the languages two subjects, are the languages two subject to the habitat? And do they depend more on the territory than on population changes? The answer is it depends. For internal changes, the answer is affirmative. There is a lexical, phonetic, and semantic continu con yeah, continuity. Ah, uh, yeah. So this is... Oh, it's incredible. It's a territorial continuity. And this takes time, in quotes. I don't know why it's in quotes. For external changes, the answer is negative. We cannot study a language like we would a mushroom isolated from its habitat. There are universal laws that apply to linguistics just like they do to biological processes. Is that so? And then in an interest and in a little, we got a little circle thingy. Little yeah, I'm not sure what a sterile language would be. I mean, I, I don't even know what that's. Well, obviously, if you have a creolization, which is literally that, you could not, that language could not continue to populate or exist, which is, of course, wrong and nonsensical. It must be. I, know that's saying, though? I mean, I don't know. Anyway. Um, okay, so here, here is where it gets, I guess, just real quick, I, I just wanted to, because I noticed something interesting, which is that what do you got? Where um, are you? there's a supposed, there's a supposed transcript of a most Arabic text two pages oh, earlier. Yeah. And um, this is not most Arabic. Uh, it's just not. It looks, I understand it completely. It looks like it's uh, Spanish. Spanish. I mean, forms like Athen, that's not Moserbic. Moserbic didn't have the loss of uh, F yeah. word initially, I believe. So I believe that this is just like an old Spanish. This is just old Spanish written in in, uh, in the Arabic, Arabic script, which is not the same as the Moserbic language. So so that's just an error, I believe. Anyway, um, so so here is here is where we finally get to um, this issue of of how can a language lose cases, right? So, so she says, to say that speakers lost grammatical cases and that grammatical genders were eliminated is to say that they could not think or make the connections that would allow them to correctly structure abstract cognitive processes. If we take note of how we think, then we should also understand how languages can or cannot evolve. Ways of thinking and ways of speaking are intrinsically and indissolubly linked. So this is basically hard sapir whorfism, which is the mm. notion the structure of your language determines the way that you think. Um, this is a hypothesis that was proposed by some linguistics and there are some linguists rather, and there are no linguists that, that um, genuinely believe in this notion that, that the structure of your language determines the way that you no, think. I remember hearing about the soft version is, you know, at least credible, but a hard version of the. Yeah, so, so the yeah. soft version is that there's some, that there's potentially some influence on cognition from the structure of language. And the Japanese and talk about extraordinarily, it. There's extraordinarily limited evidence for this. So right. one, one piece of evidence for this, um, there was a study comparing Russian speakers and English speakers because in Russian, um, the English uh, word for blue, there, so obviously there's tons of words that we've invented for different colors, but in terms of the basic colors, like blue, green, red, yellow, um, Russian has two basic colors that would sort of match to the English word for blue, I believe. 
Um, and so there was a study that found that Russian speakers, if they have to distinguish um, colors that sort of would fall into one of those two categories, um, they can do it like a couple of microseconds faster than an English speaker, where for an English speaker, they're all just blue. White blue and dark blue words in Russian. And, you know, it's unclear if this is actually the structure of language affecting cognition or if this, this is just Russian speakers are more practiced at disting, distinguishing shades of blue because they do it more often because they have different words. So that's about the extent of the evidence that we have for the notion that 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 the structure of your language affects how you think. It's, it's more of a, a feature for comedy or for... Um uh to uh as for mnemonic devices like mm -hmm. um the japanese uh joke that um there's a, a higher incidence of color blindness in the relatively isolated genetic community of japan which is why their words for blue and green are the same word oh <laughs> yeah, that, that's the you know, it's a joke it's, it's basically a joke but that doesn't make sense actually with true biology because they also have like 12 words for red which everybody knows in japan <laughs> there's these to which as you know from uh, an English language perspective seems kind of like, oh, they seems like a subtle variation, but it just works for them. Yeah. Or even in Old Paris, blue and uh, black were apparently the same word. I don't remember which which term it was, Farsh, I think, Farsh or something. Well, like and that. also, I mean, if, uh, if you weren't able to think about things outside of the structure of your language, then we wouldn't be able to invent new concepts and describe them in language. Do right. you, like, anyway. Um, the next sentence is basically saying, yeah, yeah. in addition, language uh, language obeys the laws of physics. Yeah. And that's when I had to put it down. <laughs> uh, science recognizes that the information about everything that happens to us is stored in our cells. Uh, hence, language too is part of this information and is stored in this way. No, that what? What do you mean language is stored in our cells? Okay. Yeah, I know, Not right? It's only at a psychological level. Humanity. It's because actually this is just a fact. It's a, it's just a silly fact. Um, probably much better. Um, this is a little better. But so, okay. I want to ad address this uh, this notion that I, th I think there's just a fundamental misunderstanding of, of like what it means to lose a case system and like how that comes about. Mm -hmm. And this is yet another thing where like, if she bothered to sort of learn anything about any languages other than just the handful of romance languages. Um, and I mean, she isn't even really familiar with Latin to be fair, but, but no, Latin, clearly not. a handful of romance languages, you would be able to sort of learn things from things that have actually been observed to occur. Um, and the gradual loss of a case system is one of those things. Um, the internally motivated gradual loss of a case system, right? Um, so two examples that come to, or three example, well, I've, I've already talked about Swedish and Norwegian, right? Those lost the case system of, of Old Norse. Um, an even better documented example would be English. Mm. So people, um, people often mistakenly believe that like, the Norman invasion happened, the French, the, the Normans, the, the Norman French speaking people arrived and the English case system just like vanished somehow magically. Right. Or, or um, you know, for a little while, uh, there was a, a hypothesis that the English case system disappeared through contact with Old Norse. A realization, right? some degree of Old Norse in English. Right. An idea. I think it's, there's a lot of, uh, you know. There, so there's, there's, there's basically no support for, for either of these hypotheses anymore, which is not to say that Old Norse didn't have extensive and deep influence on, on English. Mm -hmm. But we actually can observe the gradual loss of the case system in Middle English. Right, not morphological, but the word sky, the word for they, you know, those kinds of things were clearly right, exactly. Old Norse. It doesn't mean exactly. there was um, a deeper, um, less visible or you know, less, you know, traceable morphological transformation. Exactly. Yeah, well, and when you're ready, if you feel like answering that that little question, the little <laughs> humble brag. Uh, sure. Oh God. I can um, tell. Wait, I can tell him. Would that be nice? Well, I think you'll exaggerate if you tell him. So, so why don't you let me tell? No, him? I'll, I'll I'll speak honestly. Uh, <laughs> Raphael um, speaks fluently a few languages. Some that he studied a great deal and knows well include uh, Spanish, Catalan, Italian, uh, Japanese, 
as well as he's, he's, I met him when he started studying Latin and he learned um, basic reading fluency in a very short and impressive period of time. And he's also because of his linguistic training is familiar. I'd say you've probably done at least basic study of phonology or grammatical or uh, morphology of 90 languages to some marginal degree, right? And uh, certainly 40 to some, you know, I mean, you know I'm a nerd. Just like <laughs> spelling, pronunciation, phonology. Um, um, because basically a lot of the st stuff, uh, I do a lot more with Indo-European and uh, Romance. And so I do think I do a little bit more looking at Slavic than you do, but not really. Mm -hmm. um, but to some extent. Well, sort of learning uh, a little bit of Russian, but oh, I haven't gotten very far. Zdorova. <laughs> anyway, we'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you're you're extremely, and everybody check out that video in the description where Raphael's on Ecolinguist, where he shows off how well, and he's so shy, look at him, he's so cute. He's such a nice, <laughs> such a sweet guy. Um, yeah, no, he's uh, yes. uh, super knowledgeable uh, about uh, quite a lot. And he's shy about it because, of course, like me, like a lot of us, he wants to get better at it a lot of these uh, languages that he loves. So, you know, we know it's kind of the, um, what's the term for the, the, the Humphrey, the Humphrey Bragg curve? What is, that's not what it is. The, uh, the Borgen Stanley curve, what is that? You know, the, where you, uh, um, where you start, you start to learn something and then you think you know a lot about it and then you get to a point and you realize how little you know about the subject. Oh. The, the Humphrey Stanley curve, what is that called? I forgot the the seven year of, Stanley Kruger. What is it? somebody knows out there? It's sort of the opposite of, of Dunning Kruger. Right? Dunning Kruger curve. Thank you. Oh, is that so, what you're talking about? That is why. <laughs> yeah. so Dunning Kruger is when you learn a little bit and you think you know everything and then you stop. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. So you're you're really yeah. humble because you've gotten to a certain point of um, <laughs> of uh, a, a depth of knowledge of many things to know like how much there is to know, which is why you're of course so uh, so humble. But uh, you've you've earned quite a lot my friend so oh, me stuff all the thank time. you <laughs> um okay well r rather than stroking my ego um not that i don't appreciate it uh, although i should probably give him that introduction two hours two and a half hours ago but here yeah it's... maybe 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 but uh but it's a relaxed live stream so yeah. um okay Cases. I just want to finish this point because it's so central to this whole argument. It's like Latin has cases and romance doesn't. How did that happen? Like, what is you know, what is life? Um, so how how did English cases disappear and how did Latin cases disappear? One of the biggest things is sound changes. So sound changes are just sort of spontaneous mutations in the way that a certain um, phoneme which is like an underlying sound that exists in the sort of internal mental grammar of the language that all speakers have. So when a phoneme um, changes in some way in a certain context so that its, its realization is, is different. Um, and this happens in pretty much every generation of speakers. So I previously gave the example of my parents when they speak English, they distinguish between the word C-A-U-G-H-T Right, and the word C-O-T. Which, like, which I have the same right. thing, so I'm, I'm pronouncing Yeah, it. exactly. So do it again. Like, cot and cot. Right, I, and I say... I sleep on a cot. I don't actually right. sleep on a cot. And I don't know what a cot is. <laughs> and I would say cot and cot. Mm -hmm. Right, so it's the same exact vowel for me. But my parents pronounce it the way that Luke pronounces it. Mm -hmm. So this is a sound shift, right? It's it's spread throughout the, the generation of speakers um in many areas of the united states and these are constantly happening with every generation and sometimes they have very little impact on the structure of the language as in the case with cot and cot because i still use both of these words i mean not that i talk about cots as in the beds not that i talk about those very often but um but i still use that word but sometimes, especially when you have a language with lots of information communicated by word endings, like Latin, um, where you have lots of endings on, on the ends of nouns um, that communicate information, grammatical information, right? Um, and in Old English, a sound shift can make two endings that previously sounded different sound the same, right? So in Old English, a sound shift happened at the end of the Old English period 
where lots of vowels in unstressed syllables went from being distinct um, to sounding the same. So all of those vowels began to be pronounced as the sound a. Uh. So instead of a or e or e or u, um, they all began to be pronounced as a uh in unstressed syllables. And this caused all of these case endings to sound identical. And once they sound identical, then they're not communicating any information, right? So you need a new way of communicating that same information. But because as, as we've seen before, when we were talking about Creoles, right? When children acquire a language um, natively, if, if what they're acquiring is sort of lacking in some fundamental feature um, that is necessary for fully complex language, as is the case in a child acquiring a pigeon, but acquiring it as a native language and sort of turning it into a, a Creole, um, then some other solution will, will be arrived at, right? And so in the case of English, the solution that was arrived at to communicate the same information was word order. So Old English and Modern English, Old English has a much more flexible word order than Modern English. Right. Because Modern English lost all of those case endings. And the same exact thing is true going from Latin to Romance. Yeah. So you had things like um, long vowels and short vowels merging. You had things like certain qual vowel qualities changing. You had um, uh, nasal consonants at the ends of words disappearing. So that caused the accusative um, and the nominative to sound the same. You have S disappearing in, in some Romance languages, as is the case in Italian. And this is sort of once one of these things kicks off, it's sort of a self-reinforcing um, process. And so this is how certain shifts in certain contexts can happen actually quite rapidly over, over a few hundred years, um, where a case system can become very drastically um, reduced. Mm. And so another example of this is Bulgarian. Mm. Um, so if you look at Bulgarian of a thousand years ago, it has seven cases, like all the other old Slavic languages, right? They have seven cases. Modern Bulgarian has exactly like English, it has no cases. This is on nouns, not on pronouns, but it has no cases except for the genitive, right? Right. And what's so fascinating about the case of Bulgarian is that not only did this happen observably, where we actually saw a gradual reduction of the case system from Old Bulgarian, which is really Old, old Church Slavonic, to Middle Bulgarian, which had lost, I think, three or four of the cases, um, to Modern Bulgarian, which lost all of them. Hmm. So not only do we see that transition over time, but actually, if you go to the Balkans and you start in Bulgaria and you start village hopping, from Bulgaria into the sort of Serbo-Croatian speaking area, you'll find these transitional varieties that have more or less of the case system intact. But as you go along, each variety is going to be mutually intelligible with the varieties that it's it's very close to geographically. Right. So you have these speech varieties that go from no case system to uh, a very extensive case system with seven fully intact cases. And they're largely mutually intelligible with each other across this whole spectrum. Especially if the one with um, a more complicated syntax tries to make him or herself uh, sound easier to understand, so a more you know, regular, I don't know, word order or something. Exactly. So this notion that marking this syntactic information on word endings is like some fundamental thing in terms of how we think and that it's impossible for this to disappear through normal processes. Um, is both wrong at a conceptual level because it's just not that fundamental to how we think. The same information gets communicated no matter what, be it through word endings or word order or some other process. Um, but it's also observably not true. If you just look, even if we stay within the borders of Europe, right? Even if we stay within our, our Eurocentric little bubble, we can still observe the cases of English and Bulgarian, let alone the entire world. Why would you go? east of austria to learn anything about language right yeah, yeah. yeah. and that, that's the bias too because you have a group of languages which are all culturally uh connected for a long period for over a thousand years uh, meaning specifically western europe um you know and you're not surprisingly they have a lot of things in common and so but then they end up studying like that's that it's a 
very common shallow way of uh, looking at language around the world. And I don't blame anyone for it because I used to see it that way. I kind of thought of, you know, English and then there's German, which is related to English. And then there's French and that's, you know, and Spanish and Italian. And that's really all I kind of knew for years. And that was a lot. I thought it was great. But then I realized what was really going on. It was so much more interesting and so much deeper. And uh, yeah, Carlos, you ask a great question here. Do we know when vowel length is lost in Latin? We know a lot about that. Um, and I have a, more than one video about that. If you write a comment in the description um, after this goes live in a few hours or tomorrow, it's already live. I mean, after it becomes a permanent video on the channel, um, maybe tomorrow, for example, it'll definitely be up. Uh, then uh, if you ask that question again, I can give you the links to them. But if you search around Scorpio Martianus, I have a 30 minute presentation I give in Latin with English subtitles going over like how, what we know. And I have a whole bunch of spreadsheets that I put together with Raph's help actually about this. But to answer the question simply, we see the beginnings of certain very specific situations of some vowels as early as the late first century BC um, word final, for example, um, mm -hmm. increasing frequency in different situations with a probably completion of phonemic vowel length loss towards the end of the fifth or sixth century. It depends, you know, who you're looking at which dialect I don't, I don't usually anymore try to talk about dominant or like the Latin of the period because there's so much potential variety that it seems um, almost disingenuous to me anymore, but I can talk about pieces of evidence that we Especially have. Especially in later periods, there's more variety, of course. But... Absolutely. Yeah. All right. So about the laws of physics. <laughs> <In our science. laughs> Science recognizes that information about everything that happens to us is stored in our cells. I'm really glad science has uh, told us that. Hence, language, too, is part um, of this information and is stored in this way. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I just, hold on, there you go, that's better. I just needed that up while I continued. Um, <laughs> We do not mean it only in a psychological level. Words said to us when we were young, which caused us an emotional reaction, whether they hurt us or filled us with motivation and affection, all helped us in our development. Oh, this is true. They, uh, and they are all part of our neurological programming and determine the way we see the world. So it's just the beginning here. The language obeys the laws of physics. Is, is That's pure pseudoscience. Like, what are you talking about? In, in what respect? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, so the, uh, would you like to get to the Latin verb systems now that I got through my favorite part of this? Sure. Episode? Oh, thank you, Ethan. Um, thank you so much. That's so nice of you. I appreciate that. Uh, uh not needed at all. Thank you, though, for the, the super sticker. I hope I didn't miss any others, by the way, um, or any of your other, uh, questions. So thanks so much. Um, okay. So, Yes. Uh, knowledge is structured by language. Each language has its own way of structuring this information that is transmitted from parents to children unconsciously through language. A verb-framed language, such as Catalan or Spanish, is not the same as a satellite-framed language, such as English. Hmm. I'm not familiar with this. Uh, I'm not familiar with this um, framework of verb framed versus satellite framed languages so i can't comment on whether or not the term is being used accurately or not but well then uh i know it's citation but that's books cool. Noam Chomsky on the following page what's that uh well it's a it's a citation so that's great hey um, citation noam chomsky uh a language but as with all almost all of the citations it seems basically irrelevant um so yeah. the language is the verb in the central position, SVO, is not the same as another that places it at the end of the sentence, such as Latin. The change in the syntactic not order... true, which we thing. need to emphasize. Right. And it's not... Not, which made me think of another thing that I wanted to mention while you're um, explaining that about the cases, that like Latin has prepositions. It's not like Latin, people think of, of Latin, oh, it's the, you know, it's just the antecedent of everything. And no, it's not, obviously. Latin is, is just the written down standardized form of language from Proto-European to the present going through this really interesting stage of transition. It has prepositions and it has cases. It doesn't have all the cases of Proto-Indo-European. Some of them merge, like locative, for example. So when that happens, you need more prepositions. Greek lost yet another case. It doesn't have ablative case. And my ancient Greek, contemporary with Latin, ends up needing to, I, and I, yeah, I would definitely say it uses more prepositions, a little bit more, plus it has an article, you know, and it, if 
Greek, ancient Greek finds those things convenient, probably in part because it lo loses one of the keys. So these are languages in transition um, from a stage where I don't think they had practically any prepositions. I think the theory is that prepositions developed from adverbs and were postpositions and then were assimilated to the, the front through various processes through Indo-European languages. Right. So it's that sort of like. Um, right. And the and the other notion that Latin verbs come at the end is false, as you know, fluent readers of Latin. You know, I see people out there. You've probably heard me speak Latin a lot. And if you hear me speak Latin, I mean, I'm trying to speak Latin like everybody else tries to speak Latin, the most like classical Latin possible. And when I speak, you know, sometimes I might start my sentence with a verb, but a lot of the times it'll end or it'll be in the middle. And in a way that where I am imitating authors who do the exact same thing, which have this kind of variety, this balance. So it's not like Japanese, for example, where syntactically at the end of the phrase, practically every normal phrase in Japanese must end with a verbal construct of some kind, right? It's not like that in, in Latin. So, I mean, it's just, you'd have to have like, like a year of Latin to understand that kind of superficiality isn't true. I notice this often in, uh, in, in videos of you talking, sometimes people will say, why are you not always speaking in, in SOV word order? Yeah. And it's it's this really unfortunate um, generalization that people have taken, you know, and, and I understand why people latch onto this because a lot of modern European languages, especially English uh, and the Romance languages have very rigid word order. And so we want to latch onto this notion of, okay, Latin has this word order and you have to respect this word order. Um, but it turns out that if you if you do an actual statistical analysis of uh, what the default word order is, um, it's actually different for different authors in Latin. So some authors actually use SVO more often than they use SOV. Absolutely. Um, and it's also different for different verbs. So for instance, in for all authors, um, I believe SVO is actually more common than SOV. That's subject, verb, object. So uh, he eats the potato, right? As opposed to he, the potato eats, that would be SOV. Mm -hmm. I don't know why that example, but, um, Fried potato. So, fried potato. <laughs> fried, fried potato <laughs> so, uh, so the point is, um, right. So, so for all authors, I believe, um, subject, verb, object, which is the same word order that you see in uh in um in uh italian mm -hmm. um is actually the most common word order for the verb uh esse right to be mm -hmm. so okay. something est something is actually less marked usually is is the more standard way of ordering a sentence than something something est I people are the, used. right and i regard the over usage of um uh, verb final in mm. spoken Latin. You, you, I don't regard it like I'd criticize it because people who speak Latin are wonderful, every one of them, who are trying to do it, whatever level they are. And uh, But it's usually a mark of a beginner to use the verb at the end um, automatically without uh, uh, trying to instill some more variety that you see in, in different authors. Yeah, I'm ready to move on to chapter three, if you like. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Chapter three, we've got uh, page 21. <laughs> okay. fun. Is this actually, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's do this. Okay, All right. so, um, the non-existent vulgarization process of Latin. Linguists use the term vulgar Latin in reference to the language spoken by the common people during and after the classical period. Romanist linguists use the term to designate the colloquial language of the Lower Empire and of the following centuries until the arrival of the new forms of the Romance dialect. Some linguists prefer to call Late Latin the language used from the 4th century AD onward. I would also, to be honest, although it's somewhat ambiguous, because it's unclear if you're referring to, you know, throughout these periods, text. Mm. Oh, Raf, uh, I don't know if you hear me. I'm mean, broken for a... Uh... For the moment, oh. hold on. Let me let me see. Take you out for a second. Let me put oh. you back in. See if that helps. Hello. Hey, why don't you uh, jump out of the chat and come back in? Okay. Okay. 
that might be a cause. Um, yeah, and I wanted to add to about the terminology uh, late Latin. Normally, these are literary, uh, literature derived terms. So, classical Latin's definition is usually from um, 100, approximately 100 BC to 200 AD. And it's about literature, it's about style, and so forth. And usually, the authors after the second um, century are considered to be part of late Latin. Now, whether or not, um, hey, you're good. Yeah, you seem fine Can now. Oh. Yeah. It's just time to the definition of when late Latin. She says from the fourth century on AD onwards. Well, I mean, it, it's it's all arbitrary. A lot of it is aesthetic. Mm -hmm. yeah. Normally, we say after 200 AD is all late Latin, um, or you know, but whatever term you want to use, as long as we're clear about what that means. So that's her term. Okay. But I think I think a lot of this is a criticism of an incorrect notion of what linguists actually believe vulgar Latin is. Strong. In that she sort of built up this this idea of, of a vulgar Latin that nobody actually, nobody who, who studies this stuff actually is arguing for, and then she's arguing against it. Um, yes, sorry, Strawman, exactly. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, today it is recognized that classical Latin was a written language that differed significantly from spoken Latin in its pronunciation, vocabulary, and grammar, not in the classical period, only in significantly later periods, right? Mm -hmm. um, in addition, and as we have seen in the chapter on what language did the Romans speak, it seems that some of these traits appeared very early on. What was Vulgar Latin like? There is no written record that would directly testify what Vulgar Latin was like. Late Latin was used for writing and differed in style from classical Latin, but was not the spoken language either. Uh, well, it was, but yeah. therefore, to describe it, indirect sources as well as the comparative method between different Romance languages are used to identify its differences from classical Latin. Um, the comparative method being the method of, of reconstruction of an earlier stage of various related languages by, compar by, comparing, um, by comparing them and basically seeing uh, what could plausibly lead to all of those developments in the different daughter varieties, right? right. Um, yeah, and the whole notion that these are not, neither vulgar nor classical Latin were spoken languages is just this, hmm. you know, wh right. why, where did you make that up? I mean, this, so it's like, you know. right. Latin authors cannot be of much help because there's no continuity. The model is always the classics. We must resort to the prescriptive grammars of late Latin where the authors condemn the most frequent errors in speech. And finally, the spoken language can be identified with the aid of those texts that show a poor command of the Latin language and use incorrect gra grammatical forms and structures, as well as texts that contain solecisms with their syntactic irregularities and anacoluthans. I don't know what that is. Anacoluthans. Anacolu, uh, is, uh, Akoluthin is Greek for follow, so it, I think it means non sequitur. Hmm. Just okay. using my Greek knowledge there, I'm guessing. Sure. <laughs> that is inconsistent constructions and expressions that have deviated from classical Latin. Therefore, an important lapse of time exists between the last Iberian writings and the earliest writings in Romance, which prevents us from clearly identifying the evolution of spoken language. A slightly more accurate term to describe these vernacular speeches on the Iberian Peninsula would be Proto-Romance or Proto-Iberian Romance. This period, which begins around the 3rd century and continues around the 7th to 8th century, until the 7th or 8th century, has so far been explained through a series of theoretical processes that would justify the formation of the Proto-Romance languages through Latin, without considering the elements that could be found in the substrate preceding the, the presupposed Romanization. The reason is simple. Almost nothing is known of the Iberian substrate. Therefore, instead of performing the algebraic operation, uh, Iberian substrate plus Latin, the italic languages equals proto Romans. <laughs> right. Iberian substrate I plus, it's because it's, it's letters, it's algebra, so it's good, so it's correct. A Latin and other italic languages L equals proto Romance P. So instead of doing I plus L equals P, and then reversing the addends to achieve a formula where P minus L equals Iberian. Her formula is saying that where Romance and Latin differ equals the Iberian language substrate. Of course. <laughs> Did I not see that before? So, uh, huh. As we have seen, if the mixture must be based on the syntax of one of the two languages, but why are you pre presupposing any such mixture? 
So this is basically arguing for creolization, which is um, completely uh, baseless. But uh, And the result is not similar to Latin. We must assume that it resembles the other elements in addition. However, historical grammar studies have attempted to explain the result as a linguistic evolution or change due to the vulgarization of Latin. So basically, she's arguing that syntactic shifts can't have happened in Spanish without um, creolization, right? That Iberian substrate, even though we don't know much about Iberian, according to her, I'll talk a little bit about what we do know about Iberian, but um, but uh, she's arguing that the only explanation can be, well, so actually, I, I didn't want to get into this too much, but I, I'd like to bring up one uh, example of a shift from old Spanish to modern Spanish that I think mm -hmm. is quite interesting, sure. um, which is, um, so there's this one there's this one phrase I forget actually what the source is but I just remember it because it's a good illustration of this which is um I'm actually going to write it in the chat maybe I can I do that so in in old spanish it would be empeñar je los je los e Versus in Spanish, modern Spanish, it would be se los empeñaré. Um, so basically what happened here um, is that uh, oh, yeah. in, right? Yeah, that's that's the old Spanish form. Okay. Um, Here's the second. What one. happened here is um, so so um, the Romance languages lost the future tense of Spanish. Uh, sorry, the future tense of, of Latin, the synthetic future tense that is the future conjugation. Right. Um, and they replaced I it. I can. I will do. Exactly. Okay. And they they lost it because it basically through sound shifts that ended up sounding very similar to some other verb forms. Um, and so in order to replace it, they used um, a synthetic construction with the verb um, habere, right, to have. Mm. Um, and this is still actually preserved as two separate verbs in Sardinian. So in Sardinian, you have like apo, apo facere, which means I will do, but it's literally I have to do. Um, but in the other Romance languages, the habere was put at the end instead of at the beginning. So it was facere habeo or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, to do, I have, which means I will do. Um, and as you can see in Old Spanish, so what, what's actually happened with this verb is that, so empeñar is to um, pawn, I guess, like to pawn something. Um, je in this case is is a is a pronoun in in Italian. It would be equivalent to lie, which means like uh, to them. Like lie, uh, lie li would be the Italian equivalent. So, literally, to pawn to them, los, which is the direct object. So those things, them, e, which is the future, which is which is uh, the conjugation of of. Uh, habere, which in modern Spanish it's still e, which means uh, I have, although now it's only used in, in certain contexts. But anyway, the point is um, here it's literally a separate component and you can like stick a bunch of stuff onto the verb before this e, which is marking the future. Mm. And in modern Spanish, this e is just a verb conjugation. It's a new future tense. You conjugate the verb into the future. Mm -hmm. It used to be two separate words, but now they've fused together and you can't, you're not allowed to stick anything between them, mm. right? So you have to completely restructure the sentence into se los empeñare. I mean, um, similar evolution over in Italy and <clears throat> other um, romance languages. Mm -hmm. And I think this, the, right. uh, the uh, non-synthetic version is still commoner in Romanian. Um, mm. In fact, I think they're all non-synthetic. There's an o and there's a voi Romanian. Ah, uh, yes, in the future, Romanian. yeah. Remind me, I don't remember my Romanian. Right. Name. There's like two or and three. So, <laughs> so the the point is, um, this is a pretty drastic shift in at least the syntactic structure of this particular 
way of saying things, which is a very common structure that everybody will have to use at some point. Like I will blank the blank to blank, right? Um, that's a very common structure that you could slot a whole bunch of different verbs into. Um, and so this notion that it's basically impossible without some kind of creolization process for uh, syntax to change in the way that we just observed from old Spanish to modern Spanish is ridiculous because there is no creolization that could explain that shift in, in old Spanish. It's just a thing that happened, right? right. Um, and there's other examples of, of syntactic change too, right? So, so in old Spanish, you say to say the women have arrived. This is the, the classic example. You say las mujeres son llegadas, right? the women are arrived, literally. Whereas in modern Spanish, you say, las mujeres han llegado, right? Um, the women have arrived. And, um, you know, this argument about people don't just start thinking in a completely different way um, is just ridiculous. Like new ways of expressing ideas are being developed all the time. And newer ways tend to get used among communities of younger peers. And soon that becomes the standard way of expressing an idea. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I ranted about that for too long, but but, um, but that's okay. <laughs> oh, thanks. Um. Yeah, exactly. And so it's because, and why does that change occur? And that's more interesting, uh, I think, to think, oh, well, well, it could have been spontaneous, but was there a cause for that change? Was it more um, pronunciation based? Was it morphological? Was it, um, you know, preferences? Was it clarity? You know, English also, I am arrived, which we see in like Tolkien, which is has lots of beautiful archaic styles of English. Uh, you know, and that's how Italian and French work to this day. German still uh, works that way. So there's all kinds of, um, you know, reasons to prefer one construction or or the other because they bring up more clarity or may, and then that language, obviously, that group of people found equally or preferable for whatever reason, in this case, the um, verb have instead of the verb to be. Um, uh, yeah, so let's see. So the rest of that is, of course, nonsense. <laughs> 3.2, the oldest texts in Romance languages. We can, uh, uh, yeah, let's it. take a look at this. What's that? Let's take a look at this. <laughs> um, Council of Tours, held in 813. It was decided that the clergy should preach in the vernacular, as you were telling us earlier, mm. uh, so that the audience could understand them. How is it possible that in just 400 years, Latin had grown so far apart that it was incomprehensible. Let me go grab Roger Wright. Well, why is it just 400 years, not 900 years? Because Latin, Latin was, <laughs> Latin was established as a literary standard in the first century BC. So where is this 400 years coming from when you're talking about the ninth century in the, in the Council Latin, of Tours? Latin until the end of the Western Roman Empire, and then you have only have 400 years to allow it. That's not how it works. I know, it's a very common notion. I remember like thinking about that. This wonderful book by Roger Wright, Late Latin and Early Romance, about which I've spoken extensively. is great because it talks about essentially um, the the notion like, like how what, what is it that happened 13 years earlier, the crowning of Charlemagne, as the Holy Roman Emperor, his um, hiring of Alcuin, the Englishman, to standardize Latin pronunciation and teaching around the Holy Roman Empire, as we call it today. And um, what was the result? And the reason, of course, the cause was that you have all these different varieties of native spoken Latin, and those pronunciation differences were interfering with communication when trying to communicate and recite the standard text because you have the people doing it a Frenchish way, a Spanish -y way, because it's not really like modern French or modern Spanish is why I'm saying Frenchy and Spanishy, and an Italian -y way, um, and uh, an Englishy way. Apparently, the Englishy way was especially conservative, and the ecclesiastical pronunciation that we know today is essentially based off of that English um, version, more or less, or at least that's uh, how that's how Roger Wright uh, characterizes it. And you know, you can make up your own mind on that if you uh, end up reading the text, but. The point is that that's what's going on. What that does is it creates a separation. No native speaker of Latin, that is what we call today Proto-Romance languages, is no longer reading Latin, no longer allowed in the clergy. You have to pronounce the standardized way, which is highly archaic. You pronounce all those, con every consonant gets a pronunciation. 
Every vowel gets a specific sound. There's no silent anything anymore, which is, as we can see, immediately after the century that follows. Um, the text then being written in the Carolingian realms are suddenly being written um, if they're from if they're vernacular texts, they're not being written in Latin anymore because they don't look like Latin because Latin pronunciation has suddenly been diverged. And that's the creation of the immortal language, as I like to call it, a Latin, you know, this immortal language, which is just thick suddenly in time because of a pronunciation standardization choice. It makes Latin dead, you know, disconnected from the native speaking population and therefore unchanging. Um, so that is what's going on, uh, Carme, right here. Uh, and then, so she asked, uh, how is it possible that in 400 years, try four years is essentially what happened because it was a specific choice. And the consequence hmm. was was exactly that, that suddenly the way that people were used to understand, it was like, it would be like if we all enforced uh, Middle English phonology on everyone suddenly, which would hmm. be weird, but it would mean- Based on our orthography. Right. Exactly. Like if we all decided to say Knicht instead of Knight, since we spell K and I G H T. Yeah, exactly. Knigget. Yes. <laughs> That's to answer her her um, rhetorical question. Even today, with little patience, with a little patience, uh, we can maintain and understand a conversation with an Italian or Portuguese. If you are advised to stop preaching in Latin, there are two obvious reasons: indoctrination through the sermon was important, so it had to be delivered in the language of common people. Latin was, and the other, Latin was uh, a language reserved for learned people, clearly incomprehensible to most of the population. So she is interested in the argument, but I already gave the, the answer there of what was actually going on. Well, yes, the, the point is that the first of those things is true, although, you know, maybe the term indoctrination is a bit uncharitable, but uh, but but the politics of that aside, it's true, right? You want people to understand the message of the sermon. That's the point of a sermon to the common people, is that you're communicating. So, so you know the 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 Bible is is the word of God, right? And your job is to communicate it to the to the people, and so you're supposed to communicate it to them in a language that they can understand. So that has always been true. They've always needed to communicate to the common people in the sermons. It did, that didn't just start being true at the Council of, of Tours. Right. What started being true was the second of these points, that classical Latin was no longer understood by 813, by the common people. So yes, 900 years later, not 400, 900 years later, the standard uh, language was too different um, to be understood by the common people, just as how we would not be able to use 900 year old English in a sermon and expect people to understand it very well. They wouldn't understand zero and someone in 813 wouldn't understand zero of a classical Latin sermon, but they certainly wouldn't understand everything or enough. Um, so yes, it's as Carmen, as Carmen says, it's obvious. It's meaning is obvious, <laughs> but it's obviously not how she's interpreting its meaning. She's, Right. It's, and what, what happened in that a few years before was the unification of the Carolingian Empire. You know, we, so we have a massive political event, the largest um, political, you know, organization suddenly uh, outside of the, the church. And with, I would say, in some respects, a lot more power than the church suddenly existing and therefore interested in creating standards like many empires wish to create standards, which is a typical feature of most empires. And one of their standards was was that they, you know, wanted to do a thing. <laughs> and, that, mm. and here's the result of the thing, in, uh, which is the um, item here. What did they speak then? She goes on. This idiom was a Romance language, which uh, we can still understand 1,200 years later. And this is where it gets more specious, which I think you'll comment on. If it were mm. true that the spoken language stemmed from Latin, it would mean that it was a language separated from its parent tongue only 300 years before. So it should be more similar to Latin than our present languages. So how can mm. it can be plain that people did not understand it? The time elapsed was a quarter of what separates us now from those times. In the year 842, less than 30 years after the Council of Tours, the Oaths of Strasbourg, which uh, reproduced mutual pledges of allegiance between Charlemagne's heirs, were written in two languages, uh, Teodisca lingua and Romana lingua. Uh, Teodisca is an adjective for German that we use even in Latin today, by the way, for the Germanic mm -hmm. 
language, uh, German, modern German. This is the earliest surviving written document in proto romance tongues. It is worth reading. The English translation is roughly, I'll just read the beginning. For the love of God and for Christendom and our common salvation from the day onwards, as God give the wisdom and power. It's an oath. Um, would you like to read any of, of this? <laughs> of the of the Romana lingua, as she's called it? Galisca. You probably could do it better than me, but I could give it a shot. Of the of the of the old French? I mean I'm not an expert on old French, but like sure. Pro deo amur et pro Christian Poblo et nostro commun salvament. This di in avant, in I guess it would be cant, in cant Deus savir et podir me dunat. Si salvarai e otsist me on fradre Carlo et in ayuda et in caduna cosa. Si cum on per dreit son, fa, son fradra salvardist. You know, kid mi altres i fadzet et ad luder nul plaid nunquam prindrai qui me on volcist me on fradre Carle in damno sit. Oh no, in damnation. Harm. Um, <laughs> and uh, don't be in damnation, Charles. And then the Teodiska, which is a form of, um, an older form of German. And go this mina in in tes Christianes folkes in unser uh, bedero gealtenisi von um, tesemo dag, dage fram mordes, so fram so mir got. Now you can hear stuff that similar German and other Germanic languages. So anyway, mm -hmm. what's your point about all this? The first text is written in a Proto-Germanic language of the Frankish type, which is spoken in the Rhenish region. Mm -hmm. uh, we are not in a position to assess the distant separation present uh, languages. We'll focus on the other text, the Code of French, which was clearly not Latin, but neither was it French because it lacked the distinctive features of French that can be found. For instance, the literary text of the Antique of Saint, Saint um, Eulalia, included in a collection of Latin sermons by St. Gregory dating back to 880. Strangely, the second text is easy for a Catalan speaker to read. The only foreign element is the position of the verb, in this case, displaced at the end of a sentence. So in fact, this text is more intelligible for a Catalan than for a French speaker. Comments? Um, well, that's not the only, <laughs> that's not the only foreign element. There's also no articles. Um, there's also a case system. <laughs> there's also uh, a whole bunch of vocabulary that well and it's not a very complicated text no so what it's sort of understandable that Catalan? i mean it looks a lot like an iberian franco proto romance mm -hmm. language to me but mm -hmm. specifically catalan i don't i don't necessarily see no i mean obviously you know it's it's in the same broader family as as catalan i guess you could say um as in catalan shares some features with this that maybe it doesn't share with uh with ibero romance mm -hmm. um but the notion that that this language is like entirely comprehensible to a catalan speaker it's certainly much more comprehensible than latin was since it's 900 years later 900 years closer to the modern languages yeah um, but sure. this is not like perfectly comprehensible to a, to a modern Catalan speaker, absolutely not. And there's many, many features that are not any more present in Catalan than they are in any other living Romance language in terms of uh, archaic features of, of this language. So mm. She talks starts to talk about phonology at the end of uh, 25, if you want to skip to it of uh, the reason, ultimately getting to the reason why Romance languages can't be from Latin, and that would change the pronunciation of certain things. Mm. Um, and it's, uh, if you like, that's on the bottom of 25. Following are some of the Romance traits of the Latin text of the uh, Cartularies, um, uh, which uh, we can- Oh no, yeah, this is the- uh... This is the, the like 10th century- uh... Oh, right, yeah earliest um ibero romance text i think it's 10th century oh right yeah this isn't actually this isn't particularly um elucidating i i don't think no uh, it's so simple i mean like like translate the first bit i mean like how would you say the first bit in latin um which is there in the in the navarro aragonese you mean yeah like how would you say the uh, first like no, three lines no, no, in latin? De nuestro Dueño, Dueño Cristo, Dueño Salvador. Dueño. It's Dueño, yeah. Uh, called Dueño. Get, Jet. 
Uh, yet, I guess yet? it's using a G, okay. but yet? yeah, it's N -O no -E. Is that one honor? No, no, yet, no. yet is est. Est, cool. Yet mm. en honore et cal, maybe qual, duen, dueño, maybe it's a duen, now it's double N, dueño, tiene mm -hmm. el uh, mandazione con o patre, con o spiritu santo, en os seculos de los seculos, de los seculos, and so forth. Yeah, looks a lot. I see, you know, to what so like how, how would you say, like, how would you say, like, with the help of our Lord Christ, Lord Savior, Lord who is an honor, right? How would you say that in Latin, like oh. those first three lines? In, in okay, just all spontaneously translate into classical Latin, yeah, sure, just give it um, a auxilio, um, uh, 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 Domini nostri Christi, uh, Salvatoris, uh, Dominus qui est in honore, Dominus uh, qui imperium habet, cum patre, uh, cum spirito sanct, spiritu sancto, semper et semper, um, Deus omnipotens, uh, fac ut faciamus uh, servitium um, ante facien eius. Hmm. Demus, something like that. That's what I would yeah so that, that's the point like this text is so simple if your point is that it's it's not that different from from modern romance languages like yes it's not that different um this is an example of of very little change in the past thousand years not no change but very little change relatively speaking not as little as say um Icelandic and, and Old Norse, but but pretty close. Um, but then if you compare it to the Latin, it's like almost identical in the same text because it's such exactly. a simple text. Vocabulary terms and all the vocabulary, um, like I could, um, my preferences as you, because you asked me like say like you would normally speak, um, mm. I, but I could certainly use almost all of the vocab terms here. Like uh, are you- Right, you could make it even more similar. I could easily do that and it would still be very, um, very similar sound. Right. And and similarly, you know, you could even take, you know, people people often think of Old English as being like completely incomprehensible to a modern English speaker, because they look at Beowulf, you know, oh, like what the fuck is that supposed to be? Um, you give the beginning of Aeneid to and, uh, familiar with the context or hexameter right. or poetry, but if you. But you could contrive like a very simple phrase or a couple of phrases or a couple of sentences that's incredibly comprehensible to a modern English speaker, at least in written form. So, yeah, like if I say, um, hmm. like, thank you, because it is. Um, yes. Goes over the various, uh, the very same Latin texts used to claim the existence of vulgar Latin demonstrate that proto romances were spoken long before writing appeared in the natural languages. What these texts show is not a transposition of lexicon, but a marked divergent phonetic characteristics and in basic grammatical structures of the oral language. So I guess that's sort of obvious. Um, but she says in number four here, palatization occurs in contact with Yod, which is directly because of an Iberian language substrate. And mm -hmm. by Iberian, we don't mean modern romance that's from the Iberian Peninsula. Or other language. Oh, I have a lot of underlines on page 29. <laughs> I'm just looking through because oh, take your time, man. Go I ahead. was hoping I was hoping she would get back to trying to prove um because she talks so much in the interviews and she sort of mentioned it earlier that uh she thinks that Spanish comes from Iberian. But as she mentions, there's so little information about uh, Iberian that it's sort of um, so. Uh, I don't know. Maybe maybe we can just talk about that now a little bit. Absolutely. Okay. So so here's the thing about trying to say that that Iberian is the answer to these supposed problems with with um, the Romance languages des descending from, or let's say Spanish oh, descending from from Latin. Right, so Iberian is is written in a phonetic script, 
right? It, it's a syllabary or, or an alphabet or however you want to describe it. You know, it's a it's a script that shows like the sounds of the language. And we have many, many, many inscriptions in Iberian, not a huge amount, but like a decent number of inscriptions. Because as she mentioned, there was a period when Iberian was being written um, all throughout Iberia. Um, and so if her argument is that Latin is too different from the Romance languages for the Romance languages to have descended from Latin, and that really they descended from this language known as Iberian, then surely these examples of Iberian, which are written in a script that is phonetic, should be so similar to Spanish that we should be able to understand them and read them. And yet they're incredibly difficult to decipher precisely because they're not in, in Iberian is not an Indo-European language, right? It's not even remotely similar to Spanish. What about Basque? The only language, what? Does it have any resemblance to Basque? Yes, so it so it has quite a bit of resemblance to Basque, um, in that um, so it so it seems to have a pretty extensive uh, case system. It seems to be agglutinative. A lot of its its case forms seem to have correspondences with Basque, and critically, um, there's been work done on the number system of Iberian, which seems to show almost perfect correspondence between Iberian core numbers and Basque core numbers. Now, um, it should be noted that I don't want to overstate the evidence for the relationship between Iberian and, and Basque, um, because linguists do not confidently claim that the two languages are related. And although it's very, very rare, it is actually possible for a number system to be borrowed. So the classic example of this would be um, would be Japanese. Yeah. Uh, so in Japanese numbers, right, you have ichi, ni, san, right? Those are Chinese. Mm -hmm. You have that's Japanese. Then you have right. go, rok, those are Japanese. Then you have, uh, sorry, those are Chinese. Then you have nana, which is Japanese. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest uh, of the basic numbers are all Chinese. And the only reason that yon and nana, uh, meaning four and seven, I preferred is because, of, from what I understand, at least that's what they told me, a superstition because number four, si, and seven, si, si, have the word si, which also sounds like death. And yes, death, exactly. It sounds a little like, you know, if you can avoid it, and it is used in some terms um, prescriptively and like necessarily, in other terms, you can like interchange if you're saying si or yon or si, si or na, na. Um, but almost the, basically the entire fundamental number system, especially when you're using count, a lot of the counters is Chinese numerals. It's baffling. Right. Except the only comparison I have is the word second in English. Isn't like the Tsvaitis or whatever. It's, it's right. Like, it's like, like, right. like Germanic, Latin, Germanic. It's so strange. I so exactly. So there, there is a possibility that Iberian is not related to Basque, that it is a different non-Indo-European agglutinative, uh, ergative um, language with that has borrowed the Basque number system or maybe the other way around. But it, but it seems quite likely that they're actually related languages. Um, and so the notion that it's somehow more likely for Spanish or the Romance languages to have descended from that language um, than from Latin is absurd. And it gets even more absurd when you consider, you know, talking about all of the Italic languages, because of course, to result in Italian, this uh, Iberico, this Iberian language has to have been spoken throughout Italy as well. But as right. we know, that's not the case. Throughout Italy, they were speaking all of these different Italic languages. Those all also have extensive case systems. They, they have lots and lots of features in common with, uh, with Latin. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is, the only language spoken in this period that is at all attested that is even remotely similar to the living romance languages of today is latin there is no other language attested in this period that is at all similar to spanish or any other romance language mm. iberico yes we haven't completely deciphered it we don't understand it perfectly but it's sort of like you know if we had a bunch of Japanese written in a phonetic alphabet from this period, we would be able to tell that Spanish didn't come from that language. <laughs> and it's, it's that degree of like, 
completely yeah. not a solution to this Unlike supposed the, problem. She ends up mentioning in one of the interviews, like, oh, like linear B, and she yeah. compares that to Iberian. But linear B, you can tell, is a Grecian, you know, Hellenic language of some type. Um, right. It's, it's evident that's what the script is standing for. The, um, As opposed to linear A, which we haven't deciphered, but is quite clearly not an Indo-European language. Right. Right. And you can figure that out. You know, that's so, it's, that's what's so, uh, so fascinating. A little map of where Basque is, um, Basque is spoken today. Basque. Basque. <laughs> um, Basque de Gama. Should uh, we, should we briefly do questions if there are any, or? I didn't hear you. Should we do any? Should we do questions, maybe? Or yeah, some questions. We've got some questions. I haven't looked at questions in a little while, people. So go ahead and rewrite them. Uh, your comments are all, all great. I'm glad you're enjoying uh, your discussions with one another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is funny. Uh, actually, she wrote it in Spanish. This is translated. I don't know by whom. Uh, it's in the front here somewhere. Um, she her books in Spanish. I don't. I'm sure she knows English, but. I believe this was translated by someone else um, from Spanish. Point out, she hasn't written a Catalan version. Um, do you know the new Latin project Via Neolatina, a standard standardized form of current romance? Are you talking about like inter romance? There's I a bunch of, of these projects. Uh, yeah, I don't know, but it's familiar. Via Latina, but... I don't have a lot of interest in those kinds of con mm -hmm. lines. I don't know if you do, Raf. I mean, they're, they're kind of fun as a project, but uh, but no, I, I haven't like pursued them as a. No. I'm not particularly interested. No, yeah. I think when um, maybe you might have the same perspective as me. There's so much to learn about uh, languages that have lived or do live that you know, <laughs> and they're just you know they're, because they were created by thousands or millions of people over generations, and then a con lang is created by um, one or a few people. Over a shorter period of time, it's just yeah, you know, just it's interesting, but not quite as interesting. Hmm. That's how I see it, anyway. Uh, what about Basque? Why is it the only language not Latin from Spain? Should we answer that? Sure, that's a good one. Um, yeah. So it seems like basically, um, so Europe used to be much more linguistically diverse than it is today. Um, it was filled with various language families that were sort of not necessarily re related to each other and not related to Indo-European languages, which we can call sort of Paleo-European languages or pre-Indo-European European languages. Um, and Basque is the only one of those that has survived because um, it seems that basically, you know, for the same reason that, that any given particularly conservative holdout in any capacity happens anywhere, um, just the factors aligned that Basque speakers held on to their language. Maybe it's because they were isolated. Maybe it's because they were particularly tenacious. You know. I'm sorry. I know uh, uh, Hungarian is alakthenis, but I thought uh, Finnish and Estonian were autochthonous. Um, they they seem to have arrived later than Indo-European. Cool. I didn't. I wasn't. I didn't know about that. Not so, necessarily to those regions, mm -hmm. but to the continent. Yes. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. There you go. Oh, Cassie asks, are we doing future streams together? What do you say, Raf? We doing I mean, do, you, do you guys want us to do future streams? I'd love to do future streams together. That'd be fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah, why not? I don't know. What do you think, Luke? Oh, please. Uh, <laughs> was, I made the point of the podcast yeah. just to get you on it someday. So. <laughs> yeah, man. I'll can. Awesome. Um, the she gets I, there when she starts talking about the change of Latin pronunciation, uh, it gets especially entertaining uh, for me. Uh, well, of course, we'll look at your your questions as they um, they come in, everyone. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, we see we got some. Yes, it's very very interesting. I'm glad people awesome. uh, people are are down for more of that. Cool. Uh, yeah. So. Um, on the top of page 29, she says, so why do the English use the Saxon genitive? Because talking about different forms. The order of the constituents also changed. That is, the adjective was placed after the noun rather than before. In, in English, the adjective goes before the noun. Again, English is more like Latin than the Romance language. Oh, right. She this is so fascinating. She thinks that Latin adjectives precede the noun as a rule. 
hold on. I need something for this. <laughs> you need a, you need a cat meme. <laughs> that's about that's that's about right. Yeah. Like, really? No, I mean, like, <laughs> like how you? Say... No, I mean, it is that's true for Greek. Ancient Greek is, but like, and also Slavic languages, they tend to have the adjective first, which I think is really cool. But certainly not a necessary aspect of why on uh, why on earth. Um, Oh, you're uh, you're coming in a little broken at the moment. You look okay now. No, you're, you're fine. Now yeah, you're fine. You're good. Now yeah, you're fine. Just taking a little, little break. You you don't need to break anything. You good? You don't, need a, you don't need a break. No, you're breaking up for me a little bit. Uh oh. Uh oh. Hold on. Better now. Cool. How are we doing? Yes. How am I? Hey, uh, I think audience. Who is? Which of us is breaking up? Is it Raf or me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> reps, I think his, his, his signal looks good now. Um, oh, uh, someone Danilo asked. Uh, oh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Someone asked um, why uh, why Latin grammar is so different from from Romance grammar, mm -hmm. which we sort of uh, we sort of. Well, some people. Say I think you addressed it very well. But, uh, and I'd, I'd say the simple answer is. is um, certain uh, the it's, but I think the, one of the most uh, important reasons is the loss of case system. The loss of case system, like you explained, happened in Latin predominantly through the loss of certain or the merging rather of certain final noun sounds, which is exactly what happened from Old English into Modern English. We have the final defined sounds of the case endings in Old English all becoming just kind of a uh, a schwa sound, and therefore being mm. unimportant and indistinguishable. You need prepositions to clarify. Word order becomes a primary way to communicate in those uh, relationships instead. And very similarly, that's what happened in Romance, except of course, um, Romanian to an extent, which retains some uh, case structure, right. which is cool. Um, there's, a, there's an element of this also, oh, this is an interesting question, but uh, before we get into this, um, there's an element of this also that I didn't quite touch on before, um, which is that another thing to consider is that certain kinds of change are more likely to happen to language that is, languages that are structured in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, that is, certain kinds of languages are more vulnerable to certain kinds of change. And two very closely related languages that are descended from a common, a, a recent common ancestor are going to have a whole lot of things in common. And so they're going to be susceptible to the same kinds of shifts Right, and so this is why you can you can look at the European or the Indo-European languages and observe something like the case system disappearing in many different independent branches of Indo-European, and say, well, why does why did this happen so universally? And the answer um, is that uh, languages that have lots of case suffixes that communicate multiple different pieces of information as in the, the European case system, um, very easily as sound shifts happen over time, different forms will fall together. And um, over time that system will, will erode. It's very common. Um, and so this is part of a, a cycle that, that can occur. Um, and uh, Egyptian is often brought up as, as an example of this cycle you know, going around completely where basically you start with a language that has no affixes whatsoever, nothing nothing is attaching to the nouns of the verbs, and extra words eventually get fused on. So we saw this before with the old Spanish example, right? Words can get fused on to other words to form new endings. Um, and at first, those endings are very regular, right? Because it's just a word gets fused on it, so it's always the same in all, in all contexts. And this is how you end up like languages with languages like uh, Japanese, where you have lots of endings, lots of conjugations of verbs, for instance, and a case system, but it's 100% regular or 99% regular. Or Finnish is another example where it's very, very regular. But then over time, sound shifts cause different endings to fall together so that instead of 
each piece of meaning is con communicated by different endings, you maybe have one ending that communicates three different pieces of, of meaning. Um, an example might be, you know, the genitive masculine plural ending in Greek, uh, which is on, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's one all. ending. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, for all of them, yeah. yeah. Uh, so that's one ending that communicates multiple different uh, pieces of meaning. And you can't really separate that out into, here's the piece that means plural, here's the piece that means genitive, right? Right, synthetic um, endings. Exactly. So as opposed to a language like Finnish or Japanese, where each piece of meaning has like a different component that you can really separate out. And so first you'll have endings get attached to words or, or maybe prefixes. It doesn't have to be suffixes or, or other, other forms of morphology. And then they start to fall together so that you have fewer endings communicating more meaning. And then those endings start to disappear as sound shifts happen and, and those get eroded. And then you can attach new endings and get a whole new system of, of, of uh, mm. prefixes or suffixes. And right. this entire cycle has been observed in, in Egyptian over 5,000 years of attested writing. And so- As far um, as human history goes, that's relatively short. Anyway, right. you, know, you talk about you know 40, thousand years so you could you could go back think like right. archaeologically so we know that people are speaking languages for the this period so there's no reason these cycles can't uh continue right uh infinitely exactly so 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 because of this the romance languages are all typologically very similar to one another so it's no surprise that the same kinds of shifts happen to them even independently mm -hmm. in the same way that a lot of the same shifts happened in swedish right it, it, again, um, looking at Greek and Latin, how and early before there's a lot of contact between them, there are things that they start doing very similarly but independently. Um, mm. And uh, I have a question that I'll send to you about uh, Theos versus Deus in a second, but I wanted to answer that again <laughs> as a way to know how. They, uh, I think you want so like how Carolingian uh, pronunciation was. Um, yeah, did, if you saw my video about it, I, I describe it, uh, and it's. Um, it's uh, it's very interesting how, um, uh, the how it was. So essentially, there is given there one sound per letter, not multiple ones, which would even seem to suggest a hard pronunciation for k and for k and g for letter c and letter g. So you'd expect to hear um, uh, so which is one possible interpretation. But it depends on the dialect of English of Old English at the time, which also had ch and j in certain dialects. So it's entirely possible there could have been a, a, the um, post alveolar um, ch and j as well in that form. Essentially, ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation is a descendant of that Carolingian alkaline system. That's why it's artificial. Ecclesiastical Latin pronunciation, I think, is very beautiful, but it um, isn't does not represent a natural stage of Latin as a complete. Uh, system. It's great, you know, I mean, use it if you want, but uh, um, but I, I can, I have a video answers those questions, I think, in more detail. I'm happy to link you to it. So, Raph, I'm going to want to give this to you while I uh, step out for a minute about Theos and Deus. Now, you have a video about this, but if you want to give the one-minute summary or three-minute summary, I'll, I'll be right back. Uh, yes, sure. Um, yes, so there really is no possibility that these are uh, these are related. <laughs> so this so this is um this is a thing um, to understand, which is that statistically speaking, it's actually incredibly likely that if you take any two um, languages, you're going to be able to find many many words that have a very similar form and a very similar meaning, but that are completely unrelated. So the classic example that, that they teach you in a, if you take linguistics in a university is that there's an Aboriginal language of Australia, so an indigenous language in Australia called Mbaram, where the word for dog is dog. <laughs> and it's, it's clear that this is not a borrowing from English. It's existed since before contact with English. And there's cognate words in other closely related languages that have different forms than the bottom word. But it's just through totally um, uh, coincidental processes, their word for dog is the same as the English word for dog. And there's many, many, many examples. Um, in Japanese, the word for name is namae. Uh, there's also a verb in Japanese, okoru, which means to occur. 
right? Um, in Turkish, the word for good is e, which in Japanese is e, right? So there's thousands upon thousands of perfect uh, coincidences. Um, there's a great Facebook group actually devoted to uh, linguistic coincidences that y'all should uh, should should join if you're interested in seeing lots of examples of this that people find and, and post about on Facebook. Um, so the way that we know that that this is a coincidence is um, is by looking at regular sound shifts, right? So we we know what sounds in oh and Burak, are you Turkish actually? Because <laughs> uh, I, I, I gave the I gave the Turkish example, but I, I didn't even notice okay. your name. Merhaba, um, uh, uh, Burak. Um, so, Teos uh, and uh, Deus. Um, this T sound, or in later stages of Greek, Th, um, descends from a voiced aspirated D in Proto-Indo-European. Um, and this is preserved in, in Sanskrit and potentially in some dialects of Armenian also. Um, but it's it, it changes in all the other branches. In Greek, it becomes ta, so it devoices, and then it becomes tha later on. And in Latin, it first becomes the, and then it becomes tha, and then it becomes fa, and then it becomes fa, like an F. Um, and so if deus, and teos were related, then the Latin word should have been pronounced uh, feus <laughs> if it was from the same root. Um, Great explanation. So uh, it just doesn't work phonologically. I made a similar uh, error uh, once, which I'm on record on one of these videos for having said, which is um, the um, uh, folk and uh, vulgus vulgus, vulgar, being related, and it's coincidental because it's, you know, with Grimm's Law and all the obvious changes that have to happen between Germanic languages, I wasn't really thinking when I said it. I just kind of like, I just, because other people have said it, especially classicists through, you know, hundreds of years have said, oh, well, that must be, you know, from Latin because everybody wanted everything in English to come from Latin. So uh, thanks, Raph. Appreciate it. And but definitely watch his video, share his video because it's super cool where he talks about this and all uh, in great detail. And also similarly, I would say, yeah, these are um, these must be coincidental as well. Yahweh, however, that the tetragrammaton ought to be pronounced, of which we're not sure, by the way. Um, and for that, right. there is more than ten hours of Andrew Case from Aleph with Beth on his podcast, where he talks for beautiful ten hours, ten hours of the not ten hour podcast, but ten episodes of it, going in great detail about the pronunciation of the tetragrammaton or the divine name. And he even has a book for free. It's a PDF. So check it out. It's called um, Working for the Word is the name of his podcast. Website as well where you can download that. And that's where I would direct you to. It's super cool. I think um, I think maybe we should do uh, some more questions and then uh, I should probably head out. But Okay. You've, you've done your heroic. Rather than, rather than getting back to the book. But we could do, we could do some more questions. I, well, questions yeah, absolutely. Are, do you have any more fun. questions there that you saw? Um, I'm looking also if you see any, that's, that's good. Yeah, the, uh, and while you're looking for questions, find a few you, you like, and I'll just give my, my impression of, um, her analysis of pronunciation. Um, the her, link below seems to be to okay. echoing this channel. Uh, my channel is called Paleogloss. You can uh -huh. find, I mean, yeah, Paleogloss, youtube.com slash Paleogloss. Yeah. Spell also, if you just that. click my name in the chat. <laughs> there you go. This is his um, and there Zeu, uh, so Zeus and Deus, uh, those are related. Yes. Um, so yeah. uh, Theos is not related to either of them. But uh, Zeus um, uh, and uh, Deus both come from a word that means something like day or sky or... or uh, light you know something along those lines mm. yeah the sky god david yeah, says make, make more vid si <laughs> lo faro david lo fará lo prometo yeah um, yeah look for other other questions if you like dovremmo anche dovremmo anche fare un live stream insieme esatto si sì, uh, un uh, triangolo tri tri stream 
tres stream. Um, but uh, the oh, they're just oh man, Romans or Romanians. I'm so glad to talk about uh, Romanians always, and uh, uh, that would be. Uh, but I could probably talk about that uh, after you go to bed. We don't live in the same time zone. If you all figured that out. Um, um, did you talk about Karme's take on how Romanian might be older than Latin? If oh, not, I would, could you do I would really love quick? to talk about. I was going to read the whole thing and yeah, just let's, laugh let's uncontrollably let's talk about, about the whole thing. But you want to? Yeah. Well, we could just address this question, I guess. Well, uh, it doesn't. But I mean, um, it's the same kind of. It's the same theory. I have underlined here that my favorite part of it: nobody voluntarily adopts the language of their enemies. Is her statement. Nobody voluntarily adopts the language of of their enemies. She's saying, and it's just nobody like, has ever been nobody has ever been conquered and and had their language replaced. That's definitely not a thing that's happened all throughout history, I mean, over and over and over again. It's like, are you kidding me? And like, <laughs> of course they do, because again, it's about the connection to how you can exercise. Because everybody in life needs to exercise some form of power, whether physical, um, social. Uh, economic mm -hmm. in order to survive and to then thrive to create prosperity for your family or whatever other things you mm -hmm. care about right so um mm -hmm. yes if you if it helps you then you will figure out a way to get along with them to use their language but i mean there's all oh this is also the part where she starts miss it's not her it's the translator misspelling cesar you know caesar augustus i mean augustus is right but the cesar is spanish way it's i'm nitpicking the translator not not really her mm -hmm. um and uh, oh, and, this and he talks about Ovid. Ovid describes the language of the Dacians as barbarian, but confesses to having written poems in the language. If the two languages had not been very close, how could he have learned the language so rapidly despite being more than 50 years old when he was exiled to Tomis? Because she apparently believes you can't learn a language when you're 50. <laughs> having had wonderful students older than that age, um, including, uh, and I had an 80-year-old student actually at one point, wonderful fellow, um, yeah, there's definitely, there's certain challenges which go with every different situation. Age is always a component, but it doesn't mean you can set, you can't learn languages after. That's not true. Just like anything, you can, you can do what you can do. There's no hard limit on anything based on ar something arbitrary like age. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, it's all, it's, and she also uh, talks about the, all the, the typical things they talk about with trying to disqualify Latin as being the origin of um, Romanian. I say typical because when you get, you read some of this, you're like, oh my, like I was like, when I started learning Romanian, I ended up coming to this like rabbit hole of like YouTube videos talking about this exact <laughs> subject. And they were like, they were like, it was like, oh wow, really? It's really interesting. And then I looked into it more and more and I found like, no, because then I actually started learning some Romanian and I saw how identical it is to Latin, like all the other Romance languages are so similar. And it was like, uh, no, fundamentally, this is clearly a romance language like any other. Um, right. And so the, like, go ahead. I guess we didn't actually necessarily get into, because this is the thing that, uh, that it's like, it's so fundamental to, to understanding this stuff that you just sort of take it for granted once you understand mm -hmm. it. But how we actually know that the romance languages are, first of all, related and there, and, and second of all, are, directly related to and descended from Latin? Like how 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 we actually know that? And the answer is, is precisely this thing that I was mentioning when you guys were asking about uh, Teos and Deus, which is this notion of, of regular sound correspondences. We're basically, um, so, so uh, early linguists looking at the Germanic languages, the neo the neo grammarians as they are called, discovered something called Grimm's law, which is basically um, they discovered this um, correspondence between sounds in the Germanic languages and other Indo-European languages, which demonstrated this notion that when a sound shift happens in a language, it happens to it happens across the entire language. It happens regularly to every single thing that it could happen to. It's not like random words just change in their pronunciation, but a sound across all words that it exists in, in a particular context, changes. So one example would be um, F at the beginning of a word in Old Spanish becomes H 
in late Old Spanish and then disappears in modern Spanish. So you have uh, filius in Latin becomes fijo in old in old Spanish, which becomes hijo in modern Spanish, or you have facere in Latin, which becomes um, facer or facere depending on the period in old Spanish, which becomes uh, hacer in modern Spanish. So it loses that F and this is regular, right? And so random words that look similar are not good evidence for languages being related because as I mentioned before, you can find random words that look similar between any two languages. Namai like, in Japanese, name in English, completely. Exactly, exactly, exactly. What you can't find between two random languages are regular sound correspondences that demonstrate um, that sound shifts occurred to take the same word and transform it in different ways. And so the reason why people maybe studying Romanian have this reaction when they look at, at Latin and they see these sort of derivations of this is how you get this word from this Latin root mm -hmm. is that Romanian underwent a lot of sound changes. But fundamentally, the thing to understand is that these sound changes, because they're regular, we can actually see their correspondences with other Romance languages and with Latin throughout the entire lexicon. Mm. And not only that, but based on these regular sound shifts, based on this sound in this language corresponds to this sound in this language, we can reconstruct earlier stages, right? And so even if we completely ignore Latin, we can take all of the Romance languages, right? We can compare their extremely basic vocabulary. We can look for the most conservative features of, of all of these different languages, and we can see what the ancestor, what the ancestral form had to have looked like in order to explain the modern Romance forms. And what we find is that when you do that process, what you get basically looks like Latin. Right. So like if you if you take examples, if you take the word for son, like my son, filius, right, in Latin. But let's pretend that that we never knew the, the Latin word filius, right? Well, in uh, in some dialects of Sardinian you have filu, in Italian you have figlio, in Spanish you have hijo, um, and in French you have fils, right? Um and of course, you have lots of other lots of other uh, versions in different Romance languages. But the point is, based on all of this, based on the vocalism in a language like Sardinian, based on the more conservative consonant in the middle in in uh, languages like Italian, where you have the ya, yeah, um, based on the s at the end, which is preserved exclusively in French, you can get something like filius which is extremely similar to filius, right? It's yeah. it's just barely not the same exact word. Right. Um, but and the point is- I didn't even hear the distinction and it was perfect. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. right. And, and so the point is um, when you actually do this process honestly and look at these languages that are cl clearly related, um, you can see that when you do this comparative research on them, the result of that research points towards Latin. And it's the same thing with the case system, right? So Carme talks about, well, how did the Romance languages lose the case system? Well, even if you ignore Latin, even if you just look at what's attested in the Romance language languages, we can account for four of the six cases, right? Mm -hmm. Because we have in Old French and Old uh, Occitan, we have the nominative and the accusative in, um, Italian, in, in old forms of Italian, we have uh, forms of the genitive that we find preserved, and also in, in Romanian. And in Romanian, of course, we also have a preserved uh, dative, although it's mer merged with the genitive, but in pronouns also, you find a, a genitive and a dative. Mm -hmm. And so just looking at the Romans, we can, we can already start to see, well, this language actually used to have a full-blown, these languages used to have a full-blown case system that has sort of, it's only partially preserved in different members of the family. Mm. But if we look at the common ancestor, the common ancestor had to have had at least four cases. And we see the same thing with the genders. The common ancestor of the Romance languages, even if we lost all attestation of Latin, even if the entire corpus disappeared, we would know just from the Romance language, languages that the ancestor had three genders and not two because right. of 
forms in Italian and in Romanian that point towards, you know, people still actually refer to this as, as a neuter gender in Romanian. It, it's, it's, it's more like what we have in Italian where, uh, well, I won't get into that, but anyway, there's, there's forms that tell a us more that developed that, version of uh, le braccia. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. More consistent, regularized version. So oh, is it somewhat, um, somewhat innovative and in, I'd, I'd say um, hmm. kind of reformed, uh, very similar to the, but yeah, anyway, right. we don't need to talk about this. So, so the point is, it's not just orthodoxy. It's not just looking for excuses to say that romance comes from Latin. It's a real rigorous process that makes predictions, as all science should, that can then be confirmed through observations. Because right. the the comparative process, the the comparative reconstruction has been confirmed in many cases by literally people reconstruct something and then they discover um, some ancient text that confirms exactly what they reconstructed. Right. So so this methodology is well tested. Right. Um, and something that's important to mention is mm -hmm. that linguistics is a science, not a, you know, like geology or chemistry or physics, but the point that when it's done well, it, we do the same thing as any um, basic, you know, hypothesis, you know, descended from Socrates, right? The basic fundamentals of science and, you know, thinking logically about things. So that's the, that's the point. So any, mm -hmm. what I like about it, you don't need to have extensive mathematical and physics background to, to be able to even engage in the discussion. Anyone can, if you, you know, read a lot of the, the books and the texts, if you learn these languages, especially if you learn them to fluency, then you really um, you have a good framework, a practical framework, and then you can get into the theory. Um, and the author here just hasn't done that, either of those things. <laughs> Has where, where she got her information from, interesting to know. She doesn't cite a whole lot of things, but a quick yeah. question from Christian. Moldovan, uh, yes, you asked, is it the, where did the article come from? And like Barbat, Barbatul, it is from um, uh, Ilum, would be the accusative version of uh, Ille, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Just like the other Romance languages, it takes from the pronouns, um, sorry, from the demonstrative pronouns, like um, Is, Ea, Id, like the uh, Ea becomes that in, like, say, Limba, language, Limba. The language is the usage of ea being suffixed to the end. Um, those kinds of mixes happen all the time, all around. You know, different romances like Catalan. It's from uh, mm -hmm. it's from ea, not illa. Uh, yeah, that's my understanding. Otherwise, it would be like um, limbala or something. But they do in the plural have limbale. So you see that they the clear because there is very little clear definition in um, actual classical Latin between the difference between idle and he can especially is is ea id which is right in between those it's an abstract form so it makes sense they get they got uh, mixed together well Raf you've been here for four hours more actually uh, thank you so much yeah. I, I, I'm not I'm not tired myself and I kind of want to see how much further I can get if everyone out there wants me to keep going I'll um, be delighted to show you what else is in this lovely book um, I deposit book um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah maybe uh, maybe if you keep going and I'll come uh, later I'll, I'll like maybe write up a comment on the video or something be great oh did you freeze? That wasn't quite the goodbye I wanted if you just froze. Oh no. Oh no. Did he freeze for you guys? Froze for me. Responding to uh Oh, you're back. Did I get you back? Okay. Hello. Hello. Um okay. Thank you everyone. Gracias a todos. Uh gracias a tutti. Um gracias a ti. Thanks, man. Sleep well. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Bye, bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. I'm glad you all enjoyed uh, my awesome, clearly super awesome friend, Raf. Right? Um, yeah. What a huge amount of of knowledge. So yeah. Do you do you want to keep? I mean, we only gotten like this is how far we've gotten, and you took four hours just to untangle this amount of you know, nonsense. It's, it's unbelievable. I think someone was asking, you're pushing, um, like we're trying promoting this book. I hope you meant that sarcastically because 
we're not. Uh, this this um, pseudoscience is definitely a kind would work for this since linguistics is a science and this is claiming to use linguistic theory and it's doing it incorrectly. It's definitely a kind of pseudoscience like flat eartherism or I don't know whatever. Um, things just don't add up. Um, it's uh, it's 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 crazy. I do like the Romanian. I love Romanian. Ubesc limba romana. I love it very much. So why don't we just go ahead and read this whole this whole section and uh oh for, uh, vox media and what period did fortuna fortuna stop having a vox media well that's a noun so vox media usually refers to verbs ettore ettore scusami fagioli um dimmi che vuoi dire riguardo alla voce media ad esempio in greco um erchomai Oh, no, I thought that's how correctly deponent, but those kinds of verbs, those are middle voice verbs, right, in Greek. And Latin does, the proto-Latin theoretically should have had something like that or a proto-Italic, but Latin doesn't. It has deponent. We can talk about that if you want. Um, you're asking Sebastian, uh, is there going to be uh, chapter three? There will be more with me, and I'll just give the surprise uh, what it will be. It won't be with um, those languages yet. I mean, maybe in the future, though. I'm certainly... Very interested, uh, and uh, Norbert's great, isn't he? Wonderful channel. Uh, all the stuff he does there, endlessly fascinating. All this stuff, and um, and so that's sort of what's so great about our technology in the world today, right? Because we can we can learn so much, really, by our own devices, by um, YouTube videos like this, uh, you know, reading by getting books and finding ideas. And what's also apparent, and I I hope that was implicitly clear but my inviting my um my very uh, talented and uh, skilled friend Raphael here is I don't have all the answers either on certain things um I know a lot about what he uh, talked about but he just has as a depth in certain areas that I don't um and so the point that I would then make is that you know that's you know this is I would hope if someone picked this up or saw this or saw one of her interviews they would investigate a little further and then discover, oh, that's can't be true, or like, or really, and like, because um, I don't blame the journalists who come in contact with her who don't know enough about the history of language, who would be persuaded by her argument, because she's, you know, she's like me. She'll just talk to you and say, like, I know what I'm talking about, and say this is this, and you know, she, and I get, and I respect that. I also respect the fact that she's not necessarily um, a professional in this field. You know, I, I'm the same. Um, this is. My profession and uh, you know uh, because uh, i do it all the time and i love it um but not in the traditional way so i'm sympathetic to the fact that she you know might not be credentialed specifically in a linguistic field uh that's why i like about this topic too it is open to everyone and it, uh, there's a lot of things that people can learn but if you just scratch the surface you see a couple things there's so much more to learn and it's um there's which always which is what's great at Dore, looks like you um, it's not a, a vox media doesn't autonomously possess positive or negative value. I'm not sure what you're describing. It's many on the sentence fortuna can mean good luck or bad luck. Oh, that's a characteristic. Uh, oh, right, right. Um, yeah, because force uh, is is and source also those are related to fate ultimately. I see, can't see what you're getting at. Uh, do, do a part two of this. Oh, we could totally do that. Yeah, I'm gonna read the Romanian part at least. Uh, but uh, Romans or Romanians 3.4. Um, we tend to have such an ethnocentric approach that we try to explain the world from perspective that disregards or ignores any parallel lines of investigation. For instance, in school, we learn the language of the country and a foreign language. In the case of Catalonia, two national languages are taught and a third foreign language that is usually English. However, our immediate neighbors, with whom we share political and cultural borders, speak Portuguese, French, and Arabic. Yet we do not study these languages in our schools. This occurs at all levels. Universities tend to be even more closed to external influences, and course contents are transmitted without admitting new knowledge or exchanges. Um, the rest of this is just saying about dogma, doctrinal, like it must be this, it must be that. Uh, that's what's so uh, funny. Sorry, let me move on. So basically, she's 
Um, Roman <laughs> going one step further, this situation also explains why Spaniards know nothing about Romanians. In the classrooms, Romanian is only mentioned to say that, is, that it is a Romance language, and the explanation ends here. Reality shows us that Romanian immigrants are quick to integrate with Spain due to two reasons. They learn our language with astonishing speed in a few weeks, and ethnically, their factions are indistinguishable among the population, so they can go unnoticed. I mean, we're talking about people from the general Mediterranean area. I'm saying because they look similar, they blend in. Yeah, that's quite reasonable. Um, <laughs> sure. I don't see why that's specifically a Romanian Spanish thing, no. Um, who are the Romanians? Why, why are the words Roman and Romanian so similar? Are they etymologically related? Uh, there's a footnote. The Romanian word for Romanian is Roman, or as one of my friends doesn't want to be reminded, was once Rumen in an older form of uh, Romanian. Oh, look, it's right there. But the ancient word is Rumen, as in Spanish, which is Romano. In Italian, in Italian it's Rumeno, with a meaning of peasant. Information facilitated by uh, Mihaela Alda. Okay. But it's, of course, from the word Romanus. <laughs> Just so we're clear, whether it means peasant or not. Uh, okay. The term Romania, Romani, Romania, pronounced thusly, means land of Romans. And in theory, it designated all the territories occupied by the Romans. Not in theory, that's another term. Romania means two things, actually, uh, in English. Just as, for example, America means two things. Um, for an English speaker or speakers who say French, Italian, German, and so forth, the term American, American, Americano, American, um, designates... A, uh, an inhabitant or something describing the United States, usually, uh, whereas there's another uh, geographic term, the Americas, North and South America, um, mean, thus meaning that anybody who inhabits, inhabits the Americas is also American as well, or that's you know an American species of plant or animal, for example, meaning it inhabits uh, these continents. Um, and uh, that's, those are just those terms can mean more than one thing. And similarly, um, Gallia, for example, in Latin, Gallia means France, but it also means the Gaulish territories of ancient times, which includes Belgium and, um, I was going to say Helvetia, Switzerland. So those are all Gallia, but they're also is a specific Gallia. There's a restricted and a broader sense, and these happen to be geographical terms, and so is Romania. So uh, Romania uh, Romania, as a Latin word, means either you know Romania, uh, the country of Romania, or Romania means the territory occupied by the Romans. The Roman Empire, effectively, would be a greater Romania. And linguistically, we can talk about Romania as being the kind of um, contiguous, linguistically contiguous um, place where vulgar Latin was spoken and this ended up becoming the antecedents to Romance languages, we can also speak of it in a broader sense to include the Greek-speaking places, because speaking of the Roman language, the other Roman languages, of course, Greek, ancient Greek, um, but even modern forms of Greek, the form of modern Greek spoken in northern Anatolia, uh, that is to say geographic Anatolia, the other double term, right, which is Turkey, uh, there are Greek speakers there today, which they speak a language of descended from ancient Greek of Koine, Koine, Kine, Kine, however you want to pronounce it, and um, their language, I'm pretty sure it's, they say, Romaiki, if I'm not mistaken. That's exactly what they call it. That is Roman, um, or uh, Romaika. I'm not sure. I think it's Romaika, but um, <clears throat> they uh, it means the Roman language, meaning Latin, in fact, normally. Like, if you go back uh, far enough, um, um, Romaisti means to say something in Latin, but then later it means Greek, because it means Roman language. Anyway, so that one's that's the general geographical term of Romania, Romania. Uh, so land of the Romans, in theory, but no, in truth, it designated all the territories occupied the, the Romans, the Byzantine Empire included. However, it has somehow ended up designating the eastern part of the empire, somehow inhabited once by the Dacians. She doesn't say once, I'm saying once. <laughs> the heroic conquest of Dacia was led by Trajan, a Roman emperor of Hispanic origin, but it was Emperor Hadrian in 117 AD who organized the territory by dividing it into two provinces, uh, Dacia Inferior, Lower Dacia, and Dacia Superior, Upper Dacia. A few years later, in 119 AD, 
the two provinces were reunited under Roman rule. However, over a century later, Emperor Aurelianus, Aurelian, great guy, withdrew uh, the uh, Roman administration in 272 AD. Oh, it ended the Roman, yeah, this is, I'm just kidding. Like, oh, it's like, it's a shame. It's, it was thousands of years ago. Leaving the region in the hands of the free Dacians. And it came the Goths, the Huns, the Slavs, Bulgarians, Ottoman Turks, that's the splits, uh, the Austro-Hungarians, and many other peoples that were not mentioned when we were at school. I mean, they were mentioned when I was in school, but okay. Maybe not specifically Romania. In Spain, we know almost nothing about this Central European country called Romania, uh, constituted on the territories of historical Dacia, namely inside the outside, namely inside and outside of the Carpathian Arc of Mountains, on both sides of the Danube River and down to the shores of the Black Sea. How could Trajan, born in Itali born in Italica, 35, oh, the um, city of Italica in Spain, currently San Santi Ponce, a uh, town of the province of Seville, Spain, uh, implant the Latin language among the Dacians so completely that it has managed to overcome all these historical vicissitudes. Um, or at least this is the official version, which is harder and harder to keep afloat when we've addressed all this. Uh, let's, let's get going. There are sources claiming that there was a genocide and that Roman troops killed or sold some 500,000 of the 2 million Dacians as slaves, a quarter of the population. These figures are meant to justify why the language of the Dacians would have disappeared, why Latin would have been imposed in record time, and then why it would have deteriorated incomprehensibly into vulgar Latin and then further into Romanian. There is no evidence, however, that the Romans actually led an extermination campaign against the Dacians. Their historically documented interest was mainly linked to the gold mines in Transylvania, exclamation point. They have exclamation points in an academic work. Uh, this is why they went to old Dacia in search of gold and salt. And she does have some sources. Information provided by Steely Ploskar, whoever that is, no further reference. There's, is there a bibliography here? Nope. No bibliography, just some guy or, or gal. I know Steely books from Armenian. And the other by Dimitru Sonia. The uh, that's, that's all they give us. Fascinating. Um, so no, you know there wasn't this genocide, but doesn't have to be. That's a way to certainly talk about imposition of a language on a territory, but it's by no means mandatory. But if the idea, as our author has here, must be that you can only acquire language from parents, and you're not going to learn it from other people, then it, it I can see why I can. <laughs> To use this in a, this one in a different way, if it's, I still have it up here. Where did it go? Yeah, exactly. So um, that's essentially again, you know, if that's your worldview, used from a different perspective, uh, from her perspective, that's the worldview that you have to acquire language from parents directly, and you can't acquire it from any different way. Then, then of course there must then you create this fiction of an uh, terrible, an incredible, unbelievable genocide, even for ancient um, times. And it's, and then you, so you have to contort things because then you create a straw man essentially out of people's other incorrect ideas to then strike down when it's not required. Um, moreover, we must bear in mind that the extent of the Dacian territory conquered by the Romans is very uncertain. During its maximum expansion, it would have represented 14 to 26 percent of the territory, and this occupation only lasted for 165 years. Yeah, that's why that's the common thing. They were only there for 165 years. How could they possibly have imposed the language? There's all kinds of ways that can happen with the people. Who, if they even if they stayed behind, they probably um, they if they can continue to hold on to the language. There's no reason that language can't then later spawn um, a greater, you know, broader language that gets accepted everywhere. Um, which I mean, if we talk about French, for example, how standardized French was imposed on the population and, and those kinds of things, fascinating things, but I mean, there's all kinds of ways. Um, so uh, during the period, there were dozens of riots from the conquered Dacians with the help of free Dacian tribes. There was never an established Dacian Roman society. In contrast to what happened in Spain and other countries under the oppression of the Catholic church, in later centuries, Latin did not prevail as a scholarly language either. Right, because it wasn't connected with the West. 
Uh, so how could we explain that contemporary Romania has such a remarkable linguistic unity throughout its territory? Where are the Romanization factors? They are by far, there's an exclamation point coming up, they are by far much less apparent than in other countries with Romance languages. What? What are you talking about? That's a little bizarre to me. I don't know what what that's supposed to indicate. There's less Romanization less romanization factors oh i can't find the one i want hold on hold on hold on um no i wanted a different one there it is especially roman this is perfect there we go so um uh when emperor trajan conquered dacia he said i am going to return to the country of my ancestors mm -hmm. and that is footnote an extensive one um, the region where Trajan was born, the valley of uh, Guadalquivir, I hope I said that right, was previously inhabited by the pre-Roman um, Traditans. Wait, it goes on here. So, okay. I am including a comment made by, um, looks like, uh, Jorgios Diaz Montejano, I hope I said that right, uh, Jorgios, writer and researcher. Trajan's statement has been misunderstood. Obviously, he was a descendant of the indigenous people of the region. The uh, Tordetans, or Tordetans, Tordetans, when he stated that he would return to the land of his ancestors, he was simply saying that his earliest ancestors came from this region of Dacia. That the Tordetans, not the Romans, came from old Eastern Europe, the region of ancient uh, uh, Dacia. As I have studied, as I have studied all this for more than twenty years, I can say that it's consistent with several facts and details. First of all, the presence in the region of Dacia and in old Eastern Europe of abundant toponyms with Tordo form. Tordo is really the root of Torde Thanos because the ending Thanos is a suffix of origin or provenance. Um, Torde Tania is the country, nation, or region of the Tordos and indeed the capital of Torde Tania was mentioned in uh, Torta or Torda. It's just, you know, this is, this is all, you know, Bizarre. Even okay, maybe Trajan believed that. It doesn't mean he's right. They thought all kinds of weird things in ancient times. For example, they thought that Latin was a dialect of Greek. What they hit upon was the obvious similarity between Greek and Latin, of like pater and Greek and pater, and mater and Latin, mater and Attic, standard Greek, right? So you get, um, you can see that the languages are related. And since the Greek dialects, many of which were literary and um, and prized and had all these beautiful, um, uh, beautiful similarities that they um, that they were related, but they're related not as dialects but as their fellow Indo-European languages. So his words are not usually interpreted correctly because they are used to justify what no translators were needed in the post-war negotiations. They understood each other because their tongues were related, not because they had been rapidly Latinized. Nobody voluntarily adopts the language of their enemies. And this can be seen in the rest of the countries that were part of the Roman Empire. Exclamation point. It's... Uh, it's pretty impressive. Oh, a little bit, a little bit on. Oh, yeah, we read about about the about Ovid. Um. Therefore, it's just it's so amazing these conclusions. There is already a Romanian movement trying to raise awareness on why it is more plausible for Latin to come from Romanian rather than Romanian from Latin. So, what you have to do to make any of this work is you presuppose a language that is. Of, because so according to her, vulgar Latin never existed, doesn't exist. Period. Therefore, there was another language not come from the city of Rome, or from the region of Latium, which occupied the Rom the Romania, the whole territory of the Roman Empire, um, before Roman Empire got there. Okay, um, a language which is which Iberian is a variant. Her version, her understanding of what Iberian is. Um, and that Latin is descended from it. She has discovered the Western branch of Indo-European, <laughs> if that's her notion, and then the Italic language group. 
um, as a notion. But I mean, again, that's such a contorted, difficult, ultimately impossible thing to uh, to reason. It just doesn't work ultimately because you get <laughs> you just um, because it, all of it is based on the notion that since you can't, of course, learn language from anyone but your parents, that's impossible. Can't it's got to be learned from your parents. And uh, the other factor that um, yeah, you could only learn from your parents. <laughs> All right. And you can only learn. Um, uh, you can, you, you're not going to learn language of your conquerors and language can't change that fast. It's, it's a whole bunch of things which are false, easily falsified, especially in summation. And it's very easy to make the determination with, you know, and I don't, I'm definitely don't think you should just believe in authority, for example, um, without doing the research uh, on your own. Not at all. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm definitely don't do that. You know, there's a lot of great YouTube videos out there to, besides, you know, this, this one for sure, which go into detail of all, all of these subjects and a lot of books that we've referenced. And you can disagree. You could disagree with some of the conclusions that maybe Roger Wright comes to. You can just, you know, absolutely, you can see, like, well, then there's other these other people who say these things and these bits of evidence. You can come to your own conclusions. And that's fine. And that's why, in principle, in the spirit of what Carme um, Jimenez Huertas, Huertas is doing, which is to challenge a kind of theory, that's good. Yeah, challenge it. Everything, that's the Socratic method, isn't it? You get an idea, you think, oh, that. This is what everybody's telling me is true. Is it really? Okay, well, test it insofar as you can, as much as is reasonable to test it, um, which is why, you know, we can all test our experience of the curvature of the earth and come to a satisfactory def um, determination that the earth is in fact round. You know, you can do that. You don't need to endlessly question or create these circular reasoning of um, conspiracy theories and NASA photoshopping everything in order to make something up, which is, you know, because it becomes beyond uh, ridiculous and totally untenable. Um, it's good to question all these things. Like, is the world's round? Really, can I test it? Well, what if you were to repeat the experiment done by, someone help me out, the Greek uh, who uh, determined the diameter uh, and the circumference of the earth by looking at a well in Egypt and a, a post in Greece, I forget where, and by at the same time of day on the same day and uh, was able to make a measurement which determined the curvature of the earth fantastic you, know, you can do that someone could you could actually do that and in, instead of um coming to a conclusion like say again can, it's easy you know comparing this to flat earth is easy because that's such an easy one to to knock down and people all most most people obviously recognize um flat earth theory to be utter complete nonsense and beyond pseudoscience just to be in, not insane, you know, these people are, a lot of them do really believe it. Some are charlatans who just want to scam. Um, oh, thank you. It's uh, um, Aristosthenes. Thank you very much. Um, was the uh, the guy who did that. So it's, um, you absolutely can um, make, make these determinations for yourselves. You should, you know, challenge, like, you know, come to your own conclusion to a certain um, satisfactory degree for um for you you know because and as we go because we can accept things uh you know accept i don't know that you know all kinds of like Dick, uh, cartesian philosophy like what it is what is it to be a human being was it to be, to be a person is it my hands no if i if these were amputated i'd still be me um you know if you like how much of the physical can be removed and his conclusion was i think my thinking is still my existence and um is a sutra who came after who uh, then determined that no, it's not thinking; it's actually consciousness. You know those kinds of things that determine. You know you could and those questions we can ask ourselves continuously all the time about anything and everything. And I, that's the investigative nature of our humanity, I think. And I think that's that's good to do. So in principle, the desire to challenge the status quo of any theory um, for yourself, and then do the research and then say, oh, okay, yeah, I see what what um, what's going on, or you could then make a terms. Oh no, I, I, I'm not. You know, I'm not fully convinced. Maybe this isn't right. Um, for example, plate tectonic theory, which I think a lot of people are comfortable with as an idea. Right, the continents have been moving around. There was a Pangaea at one point, another supercontinents, and breaking apart and moving. That wasn't even accepted until after the moon landing as a theory in geology. It had been come up with with people that ah, it's a crackpot theory. But um, the 
the data that was collected by World War II submarines of uh, the uh, changes in the uh, magnetic field that was preserved in the solidified volcanic rock at the um, under the ocean, especially in the Atlantic and the Pacific, demonstrated that there was some kind of change of the of the polarity of the Earth. You know, they did all these these fantastic things to realize, like, oh wow, it really must have been this way. Um, you know, so there's, um, but until fully, you know, a complete accepted theory, it was after we, I think, in fact, yeah, we determined the age of the Earth Moon system at about 4.6 billion years based on the oldest um, so called Genesis rocks that they were looking for on the moon on Apollo 14, 15. I don't remember, help me out there, somebody. Um, and to because Earth's uh, rocks on the Earth are eroded and uh, deteriorated, so they don't. Um, carry you know, off there are very few really old rocks on on the earth so we came up we, we so we knew that something you know which is so arcane and difficult to determine like the age of the earth instead of relatively short hundred million year time scale changes of the organization of the continents which now everybody's like oh but so it's um this is good you know this is how science happens is through the the questioning of these things this is not how science happens <laughs> in the sense that there's so we you know we got through a third of um about, about close to half of of the book and it doesn't improve um these and as you know i did i did i did read, read more of, of this on and just looking through and just like what and making all kinds of conclusions that, like you're you're missing the the obvious and the only reason that she is um missing what we you know raf and i today talked about as being the obvious is that the world view, right? And this cat first represented me, and now it's a, another cat's rep. I love this little cat. Where'd he go? There you go. I have so I have so many cat memes I didn't use. Um, <laughs> the uh, this, this world view that it has to be a, a certain way is not. Uh, um, it's not. It's it's not necessary that it has to be. Um, uh, you know, because that's the, the idea. She constructs this, this thing based off of theories, which are, are wrong already. Again, that you acquire language from your parents only your mother. She says, no, <laughs> you get it mostly from your peers as children from, from school. And it's, which is, and where are the children? Where do they get their language? Well, if you're, if you talk about like hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago before TV and so forth, they're getting essentially from their parents. Where do the parents come from? Is this an isolated society? Is this uh, a society with a lot of mixing going around, like in say colonial America, wherever, you know, you have all kinds of different factors, which determine that. So that's where the res research says. So you'd have to, what she doesn't do, which is what's worth criticizing here, is not the investigation of doctrinal ideas, which is always good to investigate and to understand more deeply and to challenge personally. Um, and you can challenge it openly, but I mean, if you challenge it like this in interviews on the internet and with books, you get some cat memes, you know? Because that's because like I mean I think because it's like really you know you because if you you'd have to then take all this other evidence which is saying the opposite of what you're saying and then knock it down systematically. Um, you if you know me you've seen my channel I have my own ways of uh, interacting with Latin and ancient Greek in practical ways especially when it comes to pronunciation. I don't have really revolutionary things I don't think that I I go about I'm really just. I see other people's ideas and maybe I promote them or I put them together. I have my own spin on them and so forth. That's the, um, so that's that, but I, you know, I, I of course I'm going to talk about other people's work and say, okay, this, I of course agree with, because this, I don't fully agree with when I talk about say Sydney Allen communities to see ideas, especially when you have better data, which happens inevitably to then go back and, uh, and, and look at it. So yes, indeed. Cassie, thank you. Thank you so much for uh, moderating again, by the way. Uh, I do. I can I can communicate pretty well just with cat memes. Um, I'll wrap up in, in the next few minutes here. What other questions do you have that I might uh, uh, answer for you today? Um, better than a Greek. I don't know if you're speaking to me, but uh, no, I, 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 Greeks probably know quite a, a lot about their own own history, although I'm very interested in, in the linguistic history. Um, let's, uh, hold on. Let's, let me get something else here. Yeah. So what other, uh, 
little question might you have? So we, yeah, we should be, we should be curious. We should be inquisitive. Um, we should, um, you know, uh, look and uh, about all, all these things and and uh, look at them in in more detail. Uh, let's see. Someone's talking about being Greek. That's great. Uh, Elinika, fantastic, beautiful language, modern and ancient, and everything in between. Uh, let's see. It looks like you're all discussing with each other, which is fabulous. Glad you all had a nice uh, discussion today. Seeing if you had any other uh, comments I might have uh, missed or uh, questions. Um, yeah, as far as her motivations, I don't know. I don't know. I haven't really looked uh, too deeply at um, her videos. Again, especially because she said in some of them, oh, you should read my book. Well, the book doesn't do um, do a lot to help, I don't think. Um, speak to, I think you can speak. Is this, I don't know if you're addressing me, Larry. Um, I have been tested at C2 in Italian in the past, but I know my Italian has deteriorated. And my Italian friends, some of whom are present can attest to my um, slight deterioration. There is deterioration of my Italian skills since I speak Latin far more often and have gotten a lot of interference with the Latin lately. Um, let's see. Uh, would she, would Carme, would prefer, and she's not a professor of anything to my knowledge. If, if she is, I don't think she described herself that way in the book, but I thought I read, um, just kind of, I don't, I'm not sure what she does, but um, I don't think so. I've essentially, along with Raphael's wonderful help, completely delegitimized everything she has to say. Um, it's worth, what now this is worthwhile to investigate the ancient pre-romance, um, in pre-Latin, you know, languages of the substrate that existed the iberian languages it's uh it's called absolutely we should look into that into uh great uh detail but no otherwise it's utter nonsense you know it's not co consistent with even itself um oh question from ali uh greetings uh, oi uh big fan thank you big fan of brazil myself um when we talked about this a little bit earlier but um it was gradual it was the slow coalescence of the of the different case endings in certain situations as they phonologically became more similar. For example, the loss of a final S, the loss of final M, the change of the final U to O, the unstressed U to O, which happened in the Central and West Romance, but not in Eastern Romance. So not in Romanian, for example, it didn't happen over there with the back vowel change. So when those um, when they start to fall together, it's very slow. But like Raphael was telling us, you can f you see Romance, older versions of Romance languages, which still retain cases. Even modern Romanian still has uh, a functional case system: dative, genitive, contrasted with nominative, accusative. Um, I did study Italian. Then. Uh, university at uh, l'Università degli Studi di Firenze. Uh, what pronunciation would apply to Ausonius's Mosella? When was Ausonius again? Hold on, Ausonius. Look at Ausonius. Let's spell his name. Ausonius. No, Ausonius. Ausonius. Oh, right. Uh, fourth, late fourth century. Yeah, Ausonius. Probably. I mean, you could talk about. It's, Oh, I just forgot to look where he was from, but I do have an example of base based on on this. I have a couple of videos, and if you see my video on Scorpio Martianus, which is called um, what is it called? It has a super long title in Latin. It's, I should probably title it better. Hold on, let me find the uh, go to the YouTube. Wait, why is this not work? Oh, right, because if we do that, there you go. So on um, the uh, Scorpio Martianus, I ha did a talk um, almost a year ago. At the uh, let's see, so, so Scorpio Martianus. I just searched for L L I N Y C, Living Latin in New York, because that's where I gave the talk. And it's called Latin and Greek Pronunciation Chronology. Um, let me just get the link here, and I'll put it in the description. And uh, it's uh, subtitled in English, though I speak in Latin. If you wanna, uh, so that could be one Ausonius. That's one possible interpretation, but there isn't really a lot of study or attempt to do it practically, because as Latin speakers. 
and as ancient Greek speakers, you know, what what pronunciation should we use? Um, it's an interesting, uh, you know, uh, kind of study, in my opinion. Um, do you have any cats? Not now, but I grew up with cats, and next time I might get a, a cat, my childhood cat, up here. But I, I live vicariously through other people's cats. Um, mm -hmm. uh, sure. Um, let's see. Uh, what? Uh, am I L1? And oh, L1 would be native speaking. There are a few kids that are being raised bilingually now in Latin. But again, that's really difficult. Like Raph and I were talking about raising children bilingually as a choice when the kids aren't growing up in a bilingual environment. It's a lot of work um, to do that. So the kids that are growing up with um, uh, being taught Latin at an early age, if they accept it, they will. If they reject it, they might reject it. That happens sometimes. Um, let's see. Linguistic. Oh, yeah. Controversial theories. That's yeah. Well, this is a lot of people were asking me to do this one. A lot of people were actually telling me, did you know that Spanish didn't come from Latin? And I'm like, oh, God, you're talking about that. Um, let's see. What is looking for Hellenic Republic seeing? Uh, OK, if any of you have any um, other questions or or comments that uh, I didn't address that you like me or Raphael to take a look at, um, would um uh would would love little little kidder here he just is just oh so interesting but yeah that's that's good for today right <laughs> thank you cassie thank you so much i'm glad you had a good time i certainly did um and uh yeah interesting a lot of stuff we could talk about come come next time for for more i certainly love doing this and also check my other channel scorpio martianos where i'm going to continue to do live streams in latin as i did on uh christmas eve and new year's eve go check those out at together how long is it going christmas for it's a, it's a couple hours right i don't even remember <laughs> uh but i think there's at least 12 hours there of just those two streams together of um uh, or the of just latin um just Latin, uh, spoken Latin, uh, with a lot of cool people too. Remember, don't chew the cactus. That's always important. And most important advice of the day, as always, feles non est cucurbita. Gracias, Bobis. Gracias a tutti. Muchísimas gracias. Obrigado. And mulsumesc. And um, merci. Good, I got the most of them. And I think it's muts, muts gracias in Catalan. And I deeply apologize, Catalan speakers, if I didn't get that one. Love Catalan. I'll have to study it more. So thanks, um, everyone out there uh, so much. We will see you next time. Bye.